Translator's Introduction Venerable Atsariya Manpurita Tatera is a towering figure in contemporary Thai Buddhism. He was widely revered and respected during his lifetime for the extraordinary courage and determination he displayed in practicing the ascetic way of life and for his uncompromising strictness in teaching his many disciples. During the fifty years since his death, he has assumed an exalted status in Buddhist circles and thus remains an overshadowing presence whose life and teachings have become synonymous with the Buddha's noble quest for self-transformation. Although Atsariya Man left no written record of his own, this biography, compiled by one of his close disciples some twenty years after his death, is largely responsible for introducing his life, his achievements, and his teachings to a broad section of Buddhist society. Through the widespread popularity of this book, many Thai Buddhists have been given fresh hope that the spiritual liberation which the Buddha proclaimed to the world over 2,500 years ago, and which has been attained by so many aspirants over the succeeding centuries, is still accessible in today's modern age. Many Thais have expressed the view that they had lost confidence that Magga, Palla, and Nibbana were still relevant today, but by reading Atsariya Man's biography, they realized that accounts of these exalted attainments are not mere fragments of ancient history, dead and dry, but a living, luminous legacy of self-transcendence, accessible to any individual who is willing and able to put forth the effort needed to achieve them. They have come to understand that Buddhist monks, with their distinctive robes and monastic vocation, are not merely clerical figures representing the Buddha, Tamma, and Sangha. Some of them are indeed living proof of the truth presented in the Buddha's teaching. The noble aim of spiritual liberation must be accomplished by the appropriate means, the middle way, as taught by the Lord Buddha. Although the Buddha forbade the use of self-mortification as a means to gain enlightenment, he nevertheless authorized and encouraged those specialized ascetic practices, known as tutangas, that harmonize effectively with this noble effort. The true middle way is not the smooth path of least resistance negotiated with easy compromises and happy mediums, but rather it is that path of practice which most effectively counters the mental defilements that impede progress by resisting the aspirant every step of the way. The spiritual path is often arduous, being full of hardship and discomfort, while the inner forces opposed to success are formidable and even intimidating. Thus the work of the spiritual warrior requires potent countermeasures to subvert the inertial powers of laziness, craving, pride, and self-importance. So the Buddha encouraged monks who were truly keen on extricating their hearts from the subtlest manifestations of these insidious defilements to practice the Dutangas. Such ascetic observances are specifically designed to promote simplicity, humility, self-restraint, vigilance, and introspection in a monk's everyday life, and the Buddha was known to praise those monks who undertook their practice. For this reason, the lifestyle of a Buddhist monk is founded on the ideal of life as a homeless wanderer, who, having renounced the world and gone forth from the household, dresses in robes made from discarded cloth, depends on alms for a living, and takes the forest as his dwelling place. This ideal of the wandering forest monk intent on the Buddha's traditional spiritual quest is epitomized by the Dutanga Gammatana way of life. Like Dutanga, Gammatana is a term designating a specific orientation shared by Buddhist monks who are dedicated to maintaining an austere meditative lifestyle. Gammatana, literally the basis of work, denotes an approach to meditation practice that is directed toward uprooting every aspect of greed, hatred, and delusion from the heart, and thus demolishing all bridges linking the mind to the cycle of repeated birth and death. Gammatana, with its emphasis on meditative development, and Dutanga, with its emphasis on the ascetic way of life conducive to intensive meditation, complement each other perfectly in the noble effort to transcend the cycle of rebirth. They, along with the code of monastic discipline, are the cornerstones on which the edifice of a monk's practice is erected. Both the letter and the spirit of this ascetic life of meditation can be found embodied in the life and teaching of Atsariya Man. From the day he first ordained until the day he passed away, his entire way of life, and the example he set for his disciples, were modeled on the principles incorporated in these practices. 
He is credited with reviving, revitalizing, and eventually popularizing the Dutanga Gambatana tradition in Thailand. Through his lifelong efforts, Dutanga monks, or Gambatana monks, the two are used interchangeably, and the mode of practice they espouse became, and still remain, a prominent feature of the Buddhist landscape there. Atariyaman was especially gifted as a motivator and teacher. Many of the monks who trained directly under his tutelage have distinguished themselves by their spiritual achievements, becoming well-known teachers in their own right. They have passed on his distinctive teaching methods to their disciples in a spiritual lineage that extends to the present day. As a result, the Dutanga Gammatana mode of practice gradually spread throughout the country, along with Atsariyaman's exalted reputation. This nationwide acclaim began to escalate during the last years of his life, and continued to grow after his death until he came to be considered a national saint by almost unanimous consent. In recent decades, he has gained recognition beyond the confines of his native land as one of the 20th century's truly great religious figures. Atsariyaman's life epitomized the Buddhist ideal of the wandering monk, intent on renunciation and solitude, walking alone through forests and mountains, in search of secluded places that offer body and mind a calm, quiet environment in which to practice meditation for the purpose of transcending all suffering. His was a life lived entirely out of doors, at the mercy of the elements and the vagaries of weather. In such an environment, a Tutanga monk developed a deep appreciation of nature. His daily life was full of forests and mountains, rivers and streams, caves, overhanging cliffs, wild creatures, large and small. He moved from place to place by hiking along lonely wilderness trails in remote frontier regions, where the population was sparse and village communities far apart. Since his livelihood depended on the alms food he collected from those small settlements, a Tutanga mug never knew where his next meal would come from, or whether he would get any food at all. Despite the hardships and the uncertainties, the forest was a home to the wandering monk. It was his school, his training ground, and his sanctuary, and life there was safe, provided that he remained vigilant and faithful to the principles of the Buddha's teaching, living and practicing in the relatively uncultivated, undomesticated rural backwater that comprised most of Thailand at the turn of the twentieth century. A Dudunga monk like Atsariya Mun found himself wandering through a centuries-old setting, little changed from the time of the Buddha twenty-five hundred years ago. It is helpful to understand the temporal and cultural background to Atsariyaman's wandering lifestyle. Thailand in the late 19th and early 20th centuries was a loose confederation of principalities that were largely inaccessible to the central authority because most of the land was densely forested and paved roads were almost non-existent. During that period, 80% of Thailand's landmass was blanketed with pristine forests of mostly deciduous hardwoods and thick subtropical undergrowth. The lives of people in the hinterland areas were sustained by subsistence farming and the hunting of wild animals. Teeming with tigers and elephants, the vast forests were seen as being dangerous and frightening places, so the inhabitants banded together in village communities for the safety and companionship they provided. In the more remote frontier regions, such settlements were often a day's walk from one another, following trails that made their way through uninterrupted woodland. Forests and the rhythms of nature were defining features of the folklore and culture of those hardy people. To the villagers living together in isolated communities, the vast tracts of wilderness were forbidding, inhospitable territory, where wild animals roamed freely and malevolent spirits were said to hold sway. The huge Bengal tigers indigenous to that part of the world were especially fearsome. Such creatures ruled not only the forests, but the fears and fantasies of local people and monks alike popular fear of those impenetrable forest areas turned them into places of isolation and solitude where no one dared to venture alone. It was in this remote wilderness environment that Atariyaman and his Dutanga monks lived and wandered, practicing the ascetic way of life. Their meditation practice and the mental fortitude it instilled in them were their only defense against the hardships and potential dangers they faced every day. Forests and mountains were proven training grounds for such monks, who saw themselves as spiritual warriors battling their own mental defilements for the sake of ultimate victory. The story of Atsariyaman's life is a vivid portrait of a consummate spiritual warrior unrivaled in modern times, 
who practiced the Buddha's path to freedom with such perfection that he left those who knew and revered him in no doubt that he truly was a noble disciple. A beautiful story from beginning to end, his life is reminiscent of those famed accounts of the Buddha's great disciples chronicled in the ancient texts. Like theirs, his life shows us that the spiritual ideals taught by the Buddha are achieved by real human beings struggling against the same fundamental hindrances that we find within ourselves. Thus we are made to feel that the Buddha's ancient path to spiritual liberation is as wholly relevant today as it was 2,500 years ago. To this end, this biography of Atariyaman is less concerned with the precise account of events as they unfolded in Atariyaman's life and career than it is with providing a source of inspiration and edification for those devoted to Buddhist ideals. The author's perspective is that of an affirmative witness, an advocate, rather than an impartial observer chronicling events. Being a spiritual biography, it is intended to give us an insight into a model spiritual life. As such, this book should be viewed above all as an exercise in contemplation. One aspect of Atariyaman's teaching career deserves special mention, as it surfaces time and again in the course of his biography. Atariyaman possessed a unique ability to communicate directly with non-human beings from many different realms of existence. He was continually in contact with beings in the higher and lower celestial realms, spirits of the terrestrial realms, nagas, yakkas, ghosts of many sorts, and even the denizens of the hell realms, all of whom are invisible to the human eye and inaudible to the human ear, but clearly known by the inner psychic faculties of divine sight and divine hearing. The comprehensive worldview underlying Buddhist cosmology differs significantly from the view of the gross physical universe presented to us by contemporary science. In the traditional Buddhist worldview, the universe is inhabited not only by the gross physical beings that comprise the human and animal worlds, but also by various classes of non-physical divine beings called devas that exist in a hierarchy of increasing subtlety and refinement, and by numerous classes of lower beings living in the subhuman realms of existence. Only the human and animal worlds are discernible to normal human sense faculties. The others dwell in a spiritual dimension that exists outside the range of human concepts of space and time, and therefore beyond the sphere of the material universe as we perceive it. It was Atsariyaman's remarkable, inherent capacity for communicating with many classes of living beings that made him a teacher of truly universal significance. Knowing that living beings throughout the sentient universe share a common heritage of repeated existence and a common desire to avoid suffering and gain happiness, a great teacher realizes their common need to understand the way of Tamma in order to fulfill their spiritual potential and attain enduring happiness. Having the eye of wisdom, he made no fundamental distinction between the hearts of people and the hearts of devas, but tailored his teaching to fit their specific circumstances and levels of understanding. Although the message was essentially the same, the medium of communication was different. He communicated with human beings through the medium of verbal expression, while he used non-verbal, telepathic communication with all classes of non-human beings. To appreciate Atsariyaman's extraordinary abilities, we must be prepared to accept that the world we perceive through our senses constitutes only a small portion of experiential reality, that there exists this spiritual universe of devas and brahmas which is beyond the range of our limited sense faculties. For, in truth, the universe of the wise is much more vast than the one perceived by the average person. The wise can know and understand dimensions of reality that others do not even suspect exist, and their knowledge of the principles underlying all existence gives them an insight into the phenomenal world that defies conventional limits. Atsariya Man's finely tuned powers of perception contacted an immense variety of external phenomena, and in the best Buddhist tradition he spent a considerable amount of time and energy engaged in teaching them Tamma. Such beings were as much a part of his personal world experience as the wild animals in the forest and the monks he trained so tirelessly. By virtue of his unparalleled expertise in these matters, he always felt a special obligation toward their spiritual welfare. Such phenomena are what Atsariyaman called mysteries of the heart, for they are conscious living beings dwelling in spiritual dimensions that are just as real as the one we inhabit, even though those spheres lie outside the realm of human existential concepts. The words heart and mind are used interchangeably in Thai vernacular. 
Heart is often the preferred term, as mind tends to exclude the emotional and spiritual dimensions associated with the heart. The heart is the essential knowing nature that forms the basic foundation of the entire sentient universe. It is the fundamental awareness underlying all conscious existence, and the very basis of all mental and emotional processes. The heart forms the core within the bodies of all living beings. It is the center, the substance, the primary essence within the body. Constantly emphasizing its paramount significance, Atsariyaman always claimed that the heart is the most important thing in the world. For this reason, the story of Atsariyaman's life and teachings is a story of the heart's struggle for spiritual transcendence, and a revelation of the ineffable mystery of the heart's pure essence. The Bali term chitta is a word that Atsariyaman often used when referring to this essential knowing nature, commonly known as heart and mind. Like so many words in the Buddhist lexicon, it is essentially a technical term used specifically in the science of Buddhist theory and practice. Since such terms represent salient aspects of the subject matter of this book, some of them have been kept in their original form. Generally, in cases where a suitably accurate English translation exists, that word has been substituted, with the Bali term in question being annotated in an explanatory note. There are, however, certain terms for which Due to the complex and comprehensive nature of the truths they represent, no truly adequate English word exists. Those specialized terms have largely been left in the original Bali. They may be found explained in the notes and glossary sections at the back of the book, and the reader is encouraged to take full advantage of these reference materials. About the Author Venerable Atsariya Mahabua Jnana Sampano is himself an outstanding and distinguished figure in contemporary Thai Buddhism. He is well known and respected by people from all walks of life for his impeccable wisdom and his brilliant expository skills. By aptitude and temperament, he is the ideal person to record for posterity Atsariya Man's life and teachings. Spiritually, he is one of Atsariya Man's exceptionally gifted disciples. Didactically, he is one of the Dutanga tradition's truly masterful spokesmen. His no-nonsense, resolute character, his extraordinary charisma, and his rhetorical skills have established him as Atsariya Man's natural successor. Born in 1913 in the northeastern province of Udon Thani, Atsariya Mahabua was ordained as a Buddhist monk in 1934. Having spent the first seven years of his monastic career studying the Buddhist canonical texts, for which he earned a degree in Bali studies and the title Maha, he adopted the wandering lifestyle of a Tutanga monk and set out to search for Atariyaman. Finally meeting up with him in 1942, he was accepted as a disciple and remained living under his tutelage until his death in 1949. In the period following Atariyaman's death, Atariya Mahabua, by then fully accomplished himself, soon became a central figure in efforts to maintain continuity within the Dutanga Gammertana fraternity, and so preserve Atsariya Man's unique mode of practice for future generations. He helped to spearhead a concerted attempt to present Atsariya Man's life and teachings to an increasingly wide audience of Buddhist faithful. Eventually, in 1971, he authored this biography to showcase the principles and ideals that underpin Dutanga Gammertana training methods and inform their proper practice. By 1960, the world outside the forest came to exert a significant impact on the Dutanga tradition. The rapid deforestation of that period caused Dutanga monks to modify and eventually curtail their wandering lifestyle. As the geographic environment changed, teachers like Atsariya Mahabua began establishing permanent monastic communities where Dutanga monks could conveniently carry on Atsariya Man's lineage, striving to maintain the virtues of renunciation, strict discipline, and intensive meditation. Practicing monks gravitated to these forest monasteries in large numbers and transformed them into great centers of Buddhist practice. At Wat Ba Bantad, Atsariya Mahabua's forest monastery in Udon Thani, a religious center arose spontaneously, created by the students themselves, who came for purely spiritual motives in hopes of receiving instruction from a genuine master. In the years that followed, the many Western monks who came to Atsariya Mahabua were able to share wholeheartedly in this unique religious experience. Some have lived there practicing under his tutelage ever since, helping to spawn an international following which today spans the globe. Highly revered at home and abroad, Atsariya Mahabua remains to this day actively engaged in teaching both monks and laity, 
elucidating for them the fundamental principles of Buddhism and encouraging them to practice those bold and incisive techniques that Atariyaman used so effectively. Like Atariyaman, he stresses a mode of practice in which wisdom remains a priority at all times. Although ultimately pointing to the ineffable mysteries of the mind's pure essence, the teaching he presents for us is a system of instruction that is full of down-to-earth practical methods suitable for everyone desiring to succeed at meditation. Studied carefully, it may well offer direction to persons who otherwise have no idea where their practice is taking them. Author's Preface The life story that you are about to read of Acharyaman Purita Tatera, his way of practice and his moral goodness, is the result of extensive research which I conducted in consultation with many Acharyas of his discipleship, who lived with him throughout various periods of his monastic life. I sought out these Acharyas, recorded their memories of him, and compiled their recollections to write this biography. This account is not as completely accurate as I wished, because it was virtually impossible for the monks to remember all the many experiences that Acharya Man conveyed to them about his life as a wandering forest monk. But, if I were to wait for every detail to be recalled before writing this biography, it would only be a matter of time before all information is forgotten and forever lost. All hope of recording his story for the edification of interested readers would then be surely lost as well. With great difficulty, I composed this biography, and, although it is incomplete, my hope is that it will prove to be of some benefit to the reader. I shall attempt to depict the many aspects of Atariyaman's daily conduct, as well as the knowledge and insights he attained and elucidated to his disciples. I intend to illustrate his noble life in the style of the venerable Acharyas of antiquity, who transcribe the essence of the lives of the Buddha's Arahant disciples into ancient texts, ensuring that all future generations will have some understanding of the results that are possible when the Tamma is practiced sincerely. May the reader forgive me if my presentation of Atariyaman's life appears inappropriate in any way. Yet the truth is that it is a factual account, representing the memories of Atariyaman Purita Tatera's life as he himself conveyed them to us. Although I am not wholly comfortable with the book, I have decided to publish it anyway, because I feel that readers interested in Tamma may gain some valuable insight. Chapter 1 The Early Years The Venerable Aatsarya Manpuri Tatatera was a Vipassana meditation master of the highest caliber of this present age, one who is truly worthy of the eminent praise and admiration accorded to him by his close disciples. He taught the profound nature of Tamma with such authority and persuasion that he left no doubts among his students about the exalted level of his spiritual attainment. His devoted followers consist of numerous monks and laity from virtually every region of Thailand. Besides these, he has many more devotees in Laos, where both monks and lay people feel a deep reverence for him. His story is truly a magnificent one throughout. From his early years in lay life through his long endeavor as a Buddhist monk to the day he finally passed away. Nowadays, a life of such unblemished excellence is harder to come by than a load of precious gemstones. Atsariyaman was born into a traditional Buddhist family on Thursday, January 20, 1870, the year of the goat. His birthplace was the village of Ban Kambong in the Kungjiam district of Ubon Rachatani province. His father's name was Kamduang his mother's Jun, and his family surname Gan Gao. He was the eldest child of eight siblings, though only two of them were still alive when he passed away. A child of small stature with a fair complexion, he was naturally quick, energetic, intelligent, and resourceful. At the age of fifteen, he ordained as a novice in his village monastery, where he developed an enthusiasm for the study of Tamma, memorizing the texts with exceptional speed. A young novice of affable character, he never caused his teachers or fellows any trouble. Two years into his new way of life, his father requested him to give up the robes, and he was required to return to lay life in order to help out at home. However, his fondness for the monk's life was so pronounced that he was certain he would ordain again some day. His good memories of life in a monk's robes never faded. Thus he resolved to enter the monkhood again as soon as possible. This strong sense of purpose was due, no doubt, to the power of that indomitable faith known as Sadta, which was such an integral part of his character. When he reached age twenty-two, he felt an urge to ordain as a monk. So, for that purpose, he took leave of his parents. 
Not wanting to discourage his aspirations, and having also kept the hope that their son would ordain again some day, they gave their permission. To this end, they provided him with a complete set of a monk's basic requisites for his ordination. On June 12, 1893, he received his bhikkhu ordination at Watliap Monastery in the provincial town of Ubon Rajatani. His upataya was the venerable Aryagawi, his gammavatsarya was Praku Sita, and his anusasanatsarya was Praku Prajuku Bonkun. He was given the monastic name Puritatta. After his ordination, he took residence at Watliap in Atsarya Sao's Vipassana Meditation Center. When Atsarya Man first began practicing Vipassana at Atsarya Sao Center, he meditated constantly, internally repeating the word Bhutto, the recollection of the Buddha, as he preferred this preparatory Tamma theme above all others. In the beginning, he failed to experience the degree of calm and happiness that he expected, which caused him to doubt whether he was practicing correctly. Despite his doubt, he didn't flag in his persistent use of the word Bhutto, and eventually his heart developed a certain measure of calm. One night, he had a dream. He walked out of a village and entered a large, dense jungle, overgrown with tangled undergrowth. He could hardly find a way to penetrate it. He struggled to find his way through this vast thicket until he finally emerged safe at the other end. When he came out, he found himself at the edge of an immense field that stretched as far as the eye could see. He set out resolutely, walking across this field until he happened to come across a huge fallen jati tree. Felled long ago, its trunk was partially embedded in the ground, and most of its bark and sapwood had already rotted away. He climbed upon this giant jati log and walked along its full length. As he walked, he reflected inwardly. He realized that this tree would never sprout and grow again. He compared this with his own life, which would certainly not rise again in any future existence. He identified the dead jati tree with his own life in samsara. Seeing that the tree had rotted away, never to root and spring to life again, he reckoned that, by keeping up his diligent practice, he would surely find a way to reach a definite conclusion to his own life in this very existence. The vast expanse of open field symbolized the nature of the never-ending cycle of birth and death. As he stood on the log contemplating this, a broad white stallion trotted up and stood next to the fallen jati tree. As it stood there, Atsarya Man felt an urge to ride it. So he mounted the mysterious horse, which immediately raced off at full gallop. He had no idea where he was being taken or why. The horse just continued galloping at full speed without showing any obvious sign of direction or purpose. The distance it traveled across the vast field seemed immeasurable. As they strode along... Atsarya Man saw a beautiful Tepetika cabinet in the distance, adorned with exquisite silver trim. Without guidance, the horse led him directly to the enclosed bookcase and came to a halt right in front of it. The moment Atsarya Man dismounted with the aim of opening the cabinet, the white stallion vanished without a trace. As he stepped towards the bookcase, he noticed that it was standing at the very edge of the field, with nothing in the background but more of the dense jungle, entangled and smothered with undergrowth. He saw no way of penetrating it. When he came to the Tepertika cabinet, he reached out to open it, but before he had a chance to discover the contents inside, he woke up. This was a dream nimitta, an omen confirming his belief that if he persevered in his efforts, he would undoubtedly discover a path for attaining what he sought. From then on, with renewed determination, Atsariyaman meditated intensively, unrelenting in his efforts to constantly repeat Bhutto as he conducted all his daily affairs. At the same time, he very carefully observed the austere Tutanga practices which he undertook at the time of his ordination and continued to practice for the rest of his life. The Tutangas he voluntarily undertook were wearing only robes made from discarded cloth, not accepting robes directly offered by lay supporters, going on alms round every day without fail, except those days when he decided to fast, accepting and eating only food received in his alms bowl, never receiving food offered after his alms round, eating only one meal a day, never eating food after the one meal, eating only out of the alms bowl, never eating food that was not inside the one vessel, living in the forest, which means wandering through forested terrain, living and sleeping in the wilds, in the mountains or in the valleys, sometimes spent living under a canopy of trees, in a cave, or under an overhanging cliff, and wearing only his three principal robes, 
the outer robe, the upper robe, and the lower robe, with the addition of a bathing cloth, which is necessary to have nowadays. Atsariyaman also observed the remainder of the thirteen Tutanga practices when circumstances were convenient, but he upheld the above seven routinely until they became integrated into his character. They became so much a part of him that it would be difficult to find one who is his equal these days. On his own accord, he showed earnestness in finding meaning in everything he did. He never approached his duties half-heartedly. His sincere aim, always, was to transcend the world. Everything he did was directed toward the noble effort of destroying the Gileses within himself. Due to this sense of purpose, he allowed no hiding room in his heart for arrogance and conceit, despite being exposed to the same defiling influences as was everyone else. In one respect, he differed markedly from the average person. Instead of allowing his mind free rein for the Gileses to trample all over, he always put up a fight, attacking them at every opportunity. Later, when he felt confident that he had developed a sufficiently solid foundation in his meditation, he investigated the dream nimitta. Turning his attention to the dream, he analyzed it until he gradually comprehended its full meaning. He saw that ordaining as a monk and practicing the tamma properly was equivalent to raising the level of the chitta beyond the poisons of the world, the dense and tangled jungle where dangers of every kind await to ambush, was the analogy for the chitta a repository of pain and misery. The chitta must be lifted until it reaches the vast, wide, open expanse, a sphere of ultimate happiness and freedom from all fear and concern. The majestic white stallion symbolized the path of practicing tamma. He rode the horse as the means of transport to the realm of complete contentment, where he encountered the beautiful Tepertika cabinet with an exquisite design. Able only to look upon it, he lacked the spiritual perfection necessary to secure the cabinet's opening and admire its library to his heart's content. A feat accomplished only by one who has acquired Chatupati Sambhita Nyarna. A person endowed with this fourfold knowledge is renowned throughout the three worlds for his brilliant wisdom and his comprehensive knowledge of teaching methods extensive as the sea and sky. Such a one is never at a loss when teaching devas and humans. Because Atariyaman lacked a sufficiently high level of spiritual perfection, he was denied the opportunity to open the cabinet, and had to be content with simply admiring its beauty. Consequently, he would attain only the level of Patisambhita Nusasana, meaning that he had sufficient wisdom and expository skills to elucidate to others the basic path of Buddhist practice, but not its entire breadth and depth. Although he humbly stated that his teaching was merely sufficient to show the way, those who witnessed his practice and heard the profound tamma that he taught throughout his life were so deeply impressed that no words can describe it. It would certainly be difficult to witness or hear anything comparable in this day and age, an age much in need of such a noble person. The Sign At one point, during his meditation training at Wat Liap, Atsariyaman's chitta converged into a state of calm and a vision arose spontaneously. The mental image was of a dead body laid out before him, bloated, oozing pus, and seeping with bodily fluids. Vultures and dogs were fighting over the corpse, tearing into the rotting flesh and flinging it around until what remained was all scattered about. The whole scene was unimaginably disgusting, and he was appalled. From then on, Atsariyaman constantly used this image as a mental object to contemplate at all times whether sitting in samadhi, walking in meditation, or engaging in other daily activities. He continued in this manner until, one day, the image of the corpse changed into a translucent disk that appeared suspended before him. The more he focused intensely on the disk, the more it changed its appearance without pause. The more he tried to follow, the more it altered its form, so that he found it impossible to tell where the series of images would end. The more he investigated the visions, the more they continued to change in character ad infinitum. For example, the disk became a tall mountain range where Atsariyaman found himself walking, brandishing a sharp sword and wearing shoes. Then, a massive wall with a gate appeared. He opened the gate to look inside and saw a monastery where several monks were sitting in meditation. Near the wall, he saw a steep cliff with a cave where a hermit was living. He noticed a conveyance shaped like a cradle and hanging down the face of the cliff by a rope. Climbing into the cradle-like conveyance, he was drawn up to the mountain peak. At the summit, he found a large Chinese junk with a square table inside, 
and a hanging lantern that cast a luminescent glow upon the whole mountain terrain. He found himself eating a meal on the mountain peak, and so on, and so forth, until it was impossible to see an end to it all. Atsari Amun said that all the images he experienced in this manner were far too numerous to recall. For a full three months, Atsari Amun continued to meditate in this way. Each time when he dropped into Samati, he withdrew from it to continue his investigation of the translucent disk, which just kept giving him a seemingly endless series of images. However, he did not receive enough beneficial results from this to be convinced that this was the correct method. For after practicing in this manner, he was oversensitive to the common sights and sounds around him. Pleased by this and disappointed by that, he liked some things and hated others. It seemed that he could never find a stable sense of balance. Because of this sensitivity, he came to believe that the samadhi which he practiced was definitely the wrong path to follow. If it were really correct, why did he fail to experience peace and calm consistently in his practice? On the contrary, his mind felt distracted and unsettled, influenced by many sense objects that it encountered, much like a person who had never undergone any meditation training at all. Perhaps the practice of directing his attention outwards towards external phenomena violated the fundamental principles of meditation. Maybe this was the reason he failed to gain the promised benefits of inner peace and happiness. Thus, Atsariyaman came to a new understanding about himself. Instead of focusing his mind on external matters, he brought his chitta back inside, within the confines of his own physical body. From then on, his investigations were centered only on his own body. Keeping a sharp mindfulness, he examined the body from top to bottom, side to side, inside out and throughout, every body part and every aspect. In the beginning, he preferred to conduct his examinations while walking in meditation, pacing back and forth in deep thought. Sometimes he needed to rest his body from these exertions. So he sat in samadhi for a while, though he absolutely refused to let his chitta converge into its habitual state of calm. Rather, he forced it to stay put within the body's domain. The chitta had no other choice but to travel around the many parts of the body and probe into them. When it was time for him to lie down, the investigation continued inside his mind until he fell asleep. He meditated like this for several days until he felt ready to sit in samadhi and try to attain a state of calm with his newly discovered method. He challenged himself to find out what state of calm the chitta could attain. Deprived of peace for many days now, and having begun the intense training associated with body contemplation, his chitta converged rapidly into a calm state with unprecedented ease. He knew with certainty that he had the correct method, for when his chitta converged this time, his body appeared to be separated from himself. It seemed to split into two at that moment. Mindfulness was in force during the entire time, right to the moment that the chitta dropped into samadhi. It didn't wander and waver about as it had previously. Thus, Atsariyaman was convinced that his newfound method was the right one for the preliminary work of meditation practice. From then on, he continued to religiously practice body contemplation until he could attain a state of calm whenever he wanted. With persistence, he gradually became more and more skilled in this method until the chitta was firmly anchored in samadhi. He had wasted three whole months chasing the disk and its illusions, but now his mindfulness no longer abandoned him, and therefore he was no longer adversely affected by the influences around him. This whole episode clearly shows the disadvantages of not having a wise teacher to guide one. Misjudgments occur without timely advice and direction in meditation. Atsariyaman was a perfect example of this. Having no teacher can lead to costly mistakes that can easily harm the meditator, or, at the very least, delay his progress. During Atsariyaman's early years as a wandering monk, people showed little interest in the practice of Kamakana meditation. Many regarded it as something strange, even alien to Buddhism, having no legitimate place in the life of a monk. Back then, a Dutanga monk, walking in the distance on the far side of a field, was enough to send country folk into a panic. Being fearful, those still close to the village quickly ran home. Those walking near the forest ran into the thick foliage to hide, being too scared to stand their ground to greet the monks. Thus, Dutanga monks, wandering in unfamiliar regions during their travels, seldom had a chance to ask the locals for much-needed directions. Women from the countryside often took their small children on excursions into the surrounding hills to pick wild herbs and edible plants, or to fish in outlying ponds. 
Suddenly spotting a party of Dutunga monks walking toward them, they would yell to each other in alarm, Tumma monks! Tumma monks are coming! With that, they threw their baskets and other gear to the ground with a thud and frantically rushed to find a safe hiding place. Their discarded belongings could have been damaged or broken when flung to the ground, but they took no notice. Everyone simply fled into the nearby forest, or, if close by, to their village homes. Meanwhile, the children, who had no idea what was happening, started crying and pleading for help when they saw their mothers scream and run away. Too slow to keep pace with the adults, the little ones raced around in confusion. Stranded, they ran back and forth in the open field while their mothers remained in the forest, too frightened to emerge and retrieve them. An amusing scene of needless panic, but at the same time pitiful, to see innocent children so frightened running in circles, desperately crying in search of their mothers. Obviously, the situation didn't look good, so the Dutunga monks hurried past, lest their prolonged presence provoke even more hysteria. Had they made any attempt to approach the children, the incident might have gotten out of control, with terrified kids frantically scattering in all directions, their shrill screams ringing through the forest. In the meantime, their anxious mothers huddled, trembling behind the trees, afraid of the Tumma monks, and at the same time afraid that their children might flee in all directions. They watched nervously until the monks were out of sight. When the monks finally disappeared, a big commotion erupted as mothers and children dashed excitedly about trying to find one another. By the time the whole group was safely reunited, it seemed as though the entire village had disbanded for a while. The reunion was accompanied by a hubbub of chatter, everybody laughing about the sudden appearance of the Tumma monks and the chaos that followed. Such occurrences were common in those early years. Women and children were terrified because they had never before seen Dutunga Gamatana monks. Ordinarily, people knew nothing about them and showed little interest, except to flee at their sight. There are several possible reasons for this. Firstly, their appearance was rather austere and reserved. They were unlikely to show much familiarity with anyone they hadn't personally known for a long time, someone who knew their habits well. Also, their robes and other requisites were an ochre color from dye made from the heartwood of the jackfruit tree, a color that was striking, but had a tendency to inspire more fear than devotion. These jackfruit-colored robes were worn by Dutunga monks as they wandered from place to place, practicing the ascetic way of life. They carried their umbrella tents, which were considerably larger than ordinary umbrellas, slung over one shoulder. Over the other shoulder they carried their alms bowls. Walking in single file, and dressed in their yellowish-brown robes, they were an eye-catching sight to those as yet unfamiliar with their mode of practice. Finding a quiet spot conducive to meditation, Dutunga monks settled for a while in the outlying forests of rural communities, allowing the locals a chance to get better acquainted with them. By listening to their teachings, questioning them, and receiving their advice, people's lives benefited in so many ways. Gradually, over time, their hearts grew to accept the reasonable explanations they heard, and faith issued naturally on its own. With a belief in Tamma thus instilled in their hearts, Old suspicions died away to be replaced by a reverence for the monks whose teachings made such an impression. Then, to those well acquainted with their peaceful temperament and exemplary conduct, the mere sight of monks walking across the countryside inspired devotion. During that early period, such enlightening experiences were shared by country people all over Thailand. Traveling far and wide, and determined to practice correctly for the sake of Tamma, Dutanga monks always managed to impress people and do them great service. They didn't depend on publicity to get out their message. They relied instead on their exemplary behavior as a natural means of gaining public interest. A Tutanga monk who is concentrated on Tamma considers wandering in search of seclusion to be an indispensable part of his personal practice. Secluded places offer his mind and body a calm, quiet environment. So it was with Atsariyaman. Each year at the end of the rainy season retreat, he started traveling, hiking through forests and mountains in search of locales where he found just enough small villages to support his daily alms round. More than any other part of the country, he enjoyed wandering in Thailand's northeast region. Among his favorites were the vast forests and mountain ranges in the province of Nakhon Panom, Sakon Nakhon, Udon Thani, Nong Kai, Loe, and Lom Sak, or on the Laotian side of the Mekong River, in such places as Ta Kek, Vien Tien, and Luang Prabang. Those locations with their huge tracts of forest and mountainous terrain were ideally suited to practicing the ascetic way of life. Wherever he was, whatever the time of day, Atsariyaman's primary focus remained the same, 
working tirelessly to improve his meditation practice. He knew that this was his most important task in life. By nature, he disliked involvement in monastic building projects. He preferred to concentrate exclusively on the inner work of meditative development. He avoided socializing with fellow monks and remained aloof from civil society, much preferring life alone, a style of living that allowed him the freedom to focus all his attention and energy on one main task, transcending dukkha. Earnestness and sincerity characterized everything he did. Never deceiving himself, he never misled others. The incredible energy, endurance, and circumspection that he put into his practice were truly amazing. Qualities such as these helped to ensure that samadhi and wisdom steadily progressed, never showing any signs of decline. Since the day he first discovered body contemplation to be the right method for the preliminary work of meditation, he kept that contemplation always in mind. Assiduously maintaining that method, repeatedly investigating his body over and over again, he became very skilled at mentally dissecting the various body parts, large and small, and then breaking them apart with wisdom. Eventually he could dissect his entire body at will, and then reduce the whole lot to its constituent elements. Through perseverance, Atsariyaman steadily and increasingly attained more peaceful and calmer states of mind. He wandered through forests and over mountains, stopping at suitable locations to intensify his practice, but never did he relax the persistent effort he put into all his activities. Whether walking for alms, sweeping the grounds, washing a spittoon, sewing or dyeing his robes, eating a meal, or simply stretching his legs, he was aware of striving to perfect himself at every waking moment and in all activities, without exception. Only when the time came to sleep did he relent. Even then he resolved to get up immediately, without hesitation, as soon as he awoke. He made sure that this habit became ingrained in his character. The moment he was conscious of being awake, he rose quickly, washed his face, and resumed his meditation practice. If he still felt sleepy, he refused to sit in meditation right away, for fear of nodding off to sleep again. Instead, he practiced walking meditation, striding back and forth to dispel the drowsiness that threatened to overtake him at the slightest lapse in vigilance. If walking slowly proved ineffective, he sought to invigorate himself by quickening his pace, only when all drowsiness disappeared and he began to feel tired did he leave his meditation track to sit down to continue meditating until dawn. Shortly after dawn, he prepared to go on his alms round. Wearing his lower robe, placing his under and upper robes together and wrapped about him, his alms bowl hanging from his shoulder by a strap, he walked to the nearest village in a self-composed manner, careful to maintain mindfulness the entire way. Considering his hike to and from the village a form of walking meditation, he focused his attention inward every step of the way, ensuring that his mind did not venture out to become involved with any emotionally charged sense object along the route. Returning to his campsite, or the monastery where he resided, he arranged the food he had received in his alms bowl. As a matter of principle, he ate only the food he was offered in the village, refusing to accept any food brought to him afterward. Only much later, in his very old age, did he relax his practice somewhat, agreeing to accept food that the faithful offered him in the monastery. During his early years, he ate only the food he had received in his alms bowl. With everything to be eaten placed in the bowl, he sat contemplating the true purpose of the food he was about to eat as a means of dousing the inner fires of hell, that is to say, any craving for food that might arise due to hunger. Otherwise... The mind might succumb to the power of craving and indulge in the fine taste of food, when, in fact, it should be reflecting on food's essential qualities, how all food, being simply a composition of gross elements, is inherently disgusting by its very nature. With this thought firmly fixed in his mind, he chewed his food mindfully, to deny any opening to craving until he had finished the meal. Afterwards, he washed the bowl, wiped it dry, exposed it to direct sunlight for a few minutes, then replaced it in its cloth covering and put it neatly away in its proper place. Then it was time once again to resume the task of battling the Gilesas with the aim of destroying them gradually until they were thoroughly defeated and unable ever again to trouble his mind. It must be understood, however, that the business of destroying Gilesas is an inexpressibly difficult task to accomplish. 
For though we may be determined to burn the chilesis to ashes, what invariably tends to happen is that the chilesis turn around and burn us, causing us so much hardship that we quickly abandon those same virtuous qualities that we meant to develop. We clearly see this negative impact and want to get rid of the chilesis. But then we undermine our noble purpose by failing to act decisively against them, fearing that the difficulties of such action will prove too painful. Unopposed, the chilesis become lord masters of our hearts, pushing their way in and claiming our hearts as their exclusive domain. Sadly, very few people in this world possess the knowledge and understanding to counteract these defilements. Hence, living beings throughout the three worlds of existence are forever surrendering to their dominance. Only the Lord Buddha discovered the way to completely cleanse his heart of them. Never again did they defeat him. After achieving that comprehensive victory, the Lord Buddha compassionately turned his attention to teaching the way, proclaiming the Tamma to his disciples and inspiring them to resolutely follow the same noble path that he had taken. Practicing thus, they were able to emulate his supreme achievement, reaching the very end of the noble path, the highest attainment, Nibbana. Dealing the all-powerful Gilees as a fatal blow, these noble individuals eradicated them from their hearts forever. Having extinguished their kilesas, they became those Arahant disciples that people the world over have worshipped with such devotion ever since. Atsariyaman was another noble individual following in the footsteps of the Lord Buddha. He truly possessed unshakable faith and uncompromising resolve. He didn't merely talk about them. When the morning meal was over, he immediately entered the forest to begin walking meditation in those peaceful surroundings that were so conducive to calm and inner happiness. First walking, later sitting, he pursued his meditation until he felt the time was right to take a short rest. His strength renewed, he resumed his attack on the Kilesas, creators of the endless cycle of existence. With such determination and steadfast application to the task, the Kilesas were never given reason to scoff at Hatsariyaman's efforts. While practicing samadhi intensively, he also worked tirelessly to develop insight, his wisdom revolving relentlessly around whatever object he was investigating. In that way, Samadhi and Vipassana were developed in tandem, neither one lagging behind the other, and his heart remained peaceful and contented in his practice. Still, periods of slow progress were inevitable, for he had no one to advise him when he got stuck. Often he spent many days working his way through a specific problem, painstakingly figuring out the solution for himself. He was obliged to exhaustively investigate these stumbling blocks in his practice, examining every facet carefully, because they were a hindrance to his progress and also potentially dangerous. In such situations, the advice of a good teacher can be invaluable, helping the meditator to advance quickly and confidently without wasting time. For this reason, it's very important that meditators have a Kalyana Mitta. Atsariyaman personally experienced the drawbacks of not having such a wise friend to give him timely advice insisting that it was a definite disadvantage. Acharya Saukandasilo In his early years of practice, Acharya Man often wandered to Tanga in the company of Acharya Sau, comforted in the knowledge that he had a good, experienced teacher to lend him support. But when he asked his teacher to advise him on specific problems arising in his meditation, Acharya Sau invariably replied, My experiences in meditation are quite different from yours. Your chitta is so adventurous, tending always towards extremes. One moment it soars into the sky, only to plunge deep into the earth the next. Then, after diving to the ocean floor, it again soars up to walk meditation high in the sky. Who could possibly keep up with your chitta long enough to find a solution? I advise you to investigate these matters for yourself, and find your own solutions. Acharya Sao never gave him concrete advice to really help him so Atsari Aman was forced to solve his own problems. Sometimes he nearly died before discovering a way past some of the more intractable problems he faced. Atsari Aman described his teacher as someone with a smooth, serene temperament who inspired deep devotion. A rather strange feature of Atsari Asao's practice was his tendency to levitate while in Samadhi, his body hovering quite noticeably above the floor. At first, doubtful that his body was indeed floating, he opened his eyes to see for himself. As soon as his eyes opened, concern about the condition of his body caused his chitta to withdraw from samadhi. He promptly fell back to the floor, landing hard on his buttocks, which were sore and bruised for many days. In truth, his body did float about three feet above the floor. 
but by opening his eyes to check, he lost the mindfulness needed to maintain his chitta and samadhi. Withdrawing suddenly from samadhi caused him to come crashing to the floor like any other object dropped from a height. Practicing samadhi later and feeling his body levitate again, he kept mindfulness firmly focused within that state of samadhi and then carefully opened his eyes to look at himself. It was obvious to him then that he did levitate. This time, however, he didn't fall back to the floor, for mindfulness was present to maintain total concentration. This experience taught Atarya a valuable lesson about himself. Yet being an exceptionally careful, meticulous person, he wasn't entirely convinced. So he took a small object, inserted it into the underside of the thatched roof in his hut, and continued to meditate. When he felt his body beginning to float again, he firmly focused his chitta in samadhi, and was able to float upward until he reached that small object in the thatch. Drawing level with it, he slowly reached out and very mindfully took it in his hand so that he could bring it back down by means of samadhi. This meant that once he had it in his grasp, he gradually withdrew from samadhi to the point where his body could slowly and safely descend to the floor, a point still short of complete withdrawal from samadhi. Experimenting like this, he became convinced of his ability to levitate, though this did not occur every time he entered samadhi. From the beginning of his practice to the end of his life, Atsarya Sao's chitta tended to have this smooth, imperturbable quality, in sharp contrast to the wholly adventurous nature that characterized Atsarya Man's chitta. Unlike him, Atsarya Sao was not so motivated to live dangerously seeking adventure, nor did he tend to perceive the variety of unusual phenomena that Atsarya Man invariably did. Atsarya Man told us that once, in ages past, Atsarya Sao had resolved to become a Pacheka Buddha. Intensifying his efforts at meditation caused him to recollect his long-time resolution, and his lingering attachment to that goal made him reluctant to strive for Nibbana in the present. It soon became apparent that this vow would block any attempt to realize Nibbana in his lifetime. Therefore, he immediately decided to renounce the old vow. In its place, he resolved to attain Nibbana as soon as possible. He became determined to reach this goal within his present lifetime in order to avoid the misery of being reborn in the future. Having forsaken his original vow, and thus unhindered by previous commitments, his meditation practice progressed smoothly until one day he finally reached the land of ultimate happiness that he had been aiming for. However, his teaching skill was very limited, probably due to a natural predisposition toward becoming a Pacheka Buddha someone who has no inclination to teach others, although he is able to fully enlighten himself. Furthermore, the fact that he could so easily give up his original resolve and then achieve his new goal meant that his previous vow had not yet matured to the stage of being irreversible. Atsariyaman related that in ages past he had made a similar resolution, in his case a solemn vow to become a Buddha. As with Atsariyasau, intensifying his efforts at meditation caused Atsariyaman to recollect this long-standing intention, and this underlying attachment made him reluctant to strive for the attainment of Nibbana in his present life. Atsariya Man renounced his vow to be a Buddha only after he began practicing Tutanga Gammartana, for he then realized that its fulfillment would take far too long. It required aeons of traversing the round of samsara, being born, growing old, becoming ill, and dying over and over again, enduring misery and pain indefinitely. Renouncing the original vow relieved Atsariya Man of this concern opening the way for his meditation to progress smoothly. The fact that he could so easily abandon the original vow indicates that it was not yet so firmly fixed in his conscious being that he couldn't detach himself from it. Acharya Man often accompanied Atsariya Sauna's excursions wandering to Tanga across the provinces of the northeast region. Due to differences in personality, their meditation experiences varied in some respects, but each very much enjoyed the other's company. By nature, Atsariya Sao preferred to say very little. He was a reluctant teacher, especially of the laity. Occasionally obliged to give instruction to lay supporters, he was always very frugal with words. The little he did say could be summed up like this. You should renounce evil and cultivate goodness. Being fortunate enough to be born human, don't waste this good opportunity now. Our status as human beings is a very noble one. So, avoid all animal-like behavior. Otherwise, you'll sink below the animals and be much more wretched as well. When you eventually fall into hell, your torturous existence there will be far more grievous than that of any animal. 
so don't do evil. That said, he left his seat and returned to his hut, taking no further interest in anyone. He always spoke very sparingly. In an entire day, he might only say a few sentences. On the other hand, he could endure many hours of sitting and walking in meditation. He had a remarkably dignified, noble appearance that inspired respect and devotion. Just a glimpse of his serene, peaceful countenance made a lasting impression. He was greatly revered by monks and laity alike, and like Atsariyaman, he had many devoted disciples. It was well known that these two Atsariyas shared immense love and respect for each other. In the early years, they enjoyed traveling in each other's company. They spent most of the year living together, both during and after the annual rainy season retreat. In the middle years, they normally spent these retreats in separate locations, but close enough to each other to make visiting easy. Very seldom, then, did they spend a retreat together, for each had an increasingly large following of disciples, making it difficult to find enough space to accommodate them all at one location. Living separately eliminated the burden of having to arrange living quarters for so many monks. Even when living apart, they often thought of each other with genuine concern. On occasions when Atariya Sao's disciples visited Atariya Man, the first question he asked concerned the health and well-being of Atariya Sao, who in turn invariably reciprocated by inquiring about Atariya Man's well-being when one of his disciples paid a visit. Through such messengers, each then conveyed his respectful greeting to the other, maintaining contact in this way at every opportunity. Each of these great Atsariyas had enormous respect for the other's spiritual achievements. Both used words full of praise and admiration when speaking to their disciples about each other. Their comments never contained a hint of criticism. Atsariya Man wholeheartedly agreed with Atsariya Sao's comment about his chitta being adventurous and tending to go to extremes. Soaring high in the sky one moment, then plunging into the earth before diving to the ocean floor. His chitta truly did have such mercurial characteristics. Dropping into samadhi in the early stages of his practice, his chitta tended to focus outward then, perceiving all manner of unusual phenomena, things he had never dreamed of seeing. For example, he saw a bloated corpse laid out before him. As I have mentioned before, when he concentrated his attention on this image, it soon changed into a translucent disk, which in turn altered its form, creating an endless series of images. Even after discovering the correct method of practice, when his chitta converged into calm, it was still inclined to focus outward, perceiving countless types of phenomena. Sometimes he felt his body soaring high into the sky where he traveled around for many hours, looking at celestial mansions before coming back down. At other times, he burrowed deep beneath the earth to visit various regions in hell. There he felt profound pity for its unfortunate inhabitants, all experiencing the grievous consequences of their previous actions. Watching these events unfold, he often lost all perspective of the passage of time. In those days, he was still uncertain whether these scenes were real or imaginary. He said that it was only later on, when his spiritual faculties were more mature, that he was able to investigate these matters and understand clearly the definite moral and psychological causes underlying them. Any lapse in concentration, as his chitta converged into calm, created an opening through which it could again focus outward to perceive such phenomena. His newfound proficiency notwithstanding, if his attention turned outward, his chitta would be off in a flash. Atariyaman told us that early on, due to inexperience with the mercurial nature of his own mind, when focusing his chitta to examine the lower half of his body, instead of following the various parts down to the soles of his feet, it would shoot out through his lower torso and penetrate deep into the earth, just as Atariya Sao had so astutely remarked. No sooner had he hurriedly withdrawn the chitta back into his body than it would fly through the top of his head, soaring high into the sky, where it paced back and forth contentedly, showing no interest in returning to his body. Concentrating with intense mindfulness, he had to force the chitta to re-enter the body and perform the work he wanted it to do. In those early days, his mind developed a tendency to drop so speedily into a state of calm, like falling from a cliff or down a well, that his mindfulness couldn't keep up with it, resting only briefly in complete stillness before withdrawing slightly to the level of Upatsara Samadhi, his chitta tended to venture out so often and experience such a variety of strange things that he became very frustrated. He tried to force it to remain inside the confines of his body, but often to no avail. 
His chitta was far too fleeting for mindfulness and wisdom to keep pace. Still too inexperienced to work out an effective solution, he felt uneasy about the direction of his meditation. Yet, being a strictly internal matter, he couldn't mention his predicament to anyone else. So, with an intense degree of mindfulness and wisdom to guide his efforts, he experimented with many different techniques, suffering considerable mental strain, before finding a viable means of controlling his adventuresome chitta. Once he clearly understood the correct method of taming his dynamic mind, he found that it was versatile, energetic, and extremely quick in all circumstance. Eventually working in unison, mindfulness and wisdom blended so well with the chitta that they merged to become one with it. Thus strengthened, the chitta functioned like a magic crystal ball, and he was fully capable of keeping pace with all the myriad phenomena arising within it. Atsariyaman possessed a bold, fearless character. He was also extremely intelligent. Because his rigorous training methods differed significantly from ones practiced by other monks, his style of practice was unique, and incredibly difficult to imitate. From my own observations I can unequivocally state he was a truly noble character with a quick, adventurous mind who trained himself with uncompromising resolve. His harsh training methods were often quite unique. He had an ingenious way of mixing coercive pressure and gentle persuasion to tame a dynamic mind that, at the least lapse of concentration, ventured out to find things that could easily cause him problems. Struggling desperately on his own to find ways to control his unruly mind, practicing without a dependable guide and enduring difficulties, Atsariyaman sometimes felt that he was beating his head against a mountain. Unlike so many others, he had to manage without the aid of a wise teacher's proven meditation methods a disadvantage he often warned others against later on. To his own students, he always emphasized his readiness to clarify any problems they experienced in meditation, thus saving them the difficulty of having to waste time as he had in his early years. Shortly after his ordination, Atsariyaman began wandering to Tanga in Nakhon Panom province, and eventually crossed the Mekong River to enter Laos, where he contentedly practiced the ascetic way of life in the mountainous district of Takek. This area of Laos abounded in large, ferocious tigers, huge beasts that were considered far more vicious than tigers on the Thai side of the river. Repeatedly they attacked and killed the local inhabitants, and then feasted on their flesh. Despite such brutality, those people, mostly of Vietnamese descent, weren't nearly as afraid of tigers as were their Lao and Thai neighbors. Time and again they watched these terrible beasts attack and kill friends and relatives, yet they seemed indifferent to the carnage. Having seen a friend killed right in front of them, the flesh torn from the body by a hungry tiger, the people would casually venture back into that same tiger-infested forest the next day, as though nothing had happened. The Lao and Thai communities would have been extremely upset, but the Vietnamese seemed strangely unmoved by such occurrences. Perhaps they were so accustomed to seeing such things that it no longer affected them. The Vietnamese had another strange habit. When they saw a man-eating tiger suddenly leap out to attack one of their companions, no one in the group made any effort to save their friend's life. They simply abandoned their friend to his fate and ran for their lives. Suppose a group were sleeping in the forest overnight. If a huge tiger leaped into the campsite and dragged one of them away, the others, awakened by the noise, would jump up and run away, and then calmly find another place close by to sleep. Like children, they acted without much rhyme or reason in these matters. They behaved as though those huge beasts, which had already shown themselves to be so adept at devouring human flesh, were somehow too stupid to do the same to them. I am also familiar with people who have no proper fear of tigers. When coming to live in our country, they like to settle in dense, overgrown jungle areas, abounding in tigers and other wild animals. Venturing deep into the forest in search of timber, they then spend the night there, far from the village, showing no signs of fear at all. Even alone, these people can sleep deep in the forest without fear. If they wish to return to the village late at night, they have no qualms about walking alone through the dense undergrowth, and back if necessary. If asked why they aren't afraid of tigers, their response is that, while the huge tigers in their own country have a taste for human flesh, Thai tigers don't, and that they're even scared of people. Conditions can be so dangerous in their homeland that people staying overnight in the forest must build an enclosure to sleep in that resembles a pigsty, otherwise they might never return home. Even within the precincts of some village communities, prowling tigers can be so fierce that no one dares leave home after dark, fearing an attack by a tiger leaping out of the shadows. 
The Vietnamese even chide the Thais for being such cowardly people, always entering the forest in groups, never daring to venture out alone. For these reasons, Atsariam claimed that the Vietnamese lacked an instinctive fear of tigers. When Atsariaman crossed into their country, however, the tigers there never bothered him. Camped in the forest, he often saw their tracks and heard their roars echoing through the trees at night. However, he never felt personally threatened by such things. They were simply natural aspects of forest life. In any case, Atsariaman wasn't worried about tigers so much as he was worried about the possibility that he might not transcend Dukkha and realize the supreme happiness of Nibbana in his lifetime. When speaking of his excursions crossing the Mekong River, he never mentioned being afraid. He obviously considered such dangers to be a normal part of trekking through the wilds. If I had been faced with those same dangers instead of Atsariaman, surely the local villagers would have had to form a posse to rescue this cowardly Tutanga monk. When I'm walking in meditation in the forest at night, just the occasional roar of a tiger so unsettles me that I can barely manage to keep walking to the other end of the track. I fear coming face to face with one of those beasts and losing my wits. You see, since becoming old enough to understand such things, I always heard my parents and their neighbors vociferously proclaim that tigers are very fierce animals and extremely dangerous. This notion has stuck with me ever since, making it impossible not to be terrified of tigers. I must confess that I've never found a way to counteract this tendency. Atsari Aman spent most of the earlier years of his monastic career traveling at length through the various provinces of Thailand's northeast region. Later, as he developed enough inner stability to withstand both external distractions and those mercurial mental traits that were so much a part of his character, he walked down into the central provinces, wandering contentedly across the Central Plains region, living the Dutanga lifestyle until eventually he reached the capital, Bangkok. Arriving shortly before the rainy season, he went to Wat Patumwan Monastery and entered the retreat there. During the rains retreat, he made a point of regularly going to seek advice from Chao Kuo Nupali Kunu Pamatsariya at Wat Puramani Wat Monastery to gain more extensive techniques for developing wisdom. Atsariya Man left Bangkok following the rains retreat, hiking to Lopburi province to stay a while at Pai Kwang Cave in the Prangam mountain range before moving on to Singdo Cave. Life in such favorable locations gave him an excellent, uninterrupted opportunity to fully intensify his spiritual practice. In doing so, he developed a fearless attitude toward his mind and the things with which it came into contact. By then, his samadhi was rock solid. Using it as the firm basis for his practice, he examined everything from the perspective of tamma, continually uncovering new techniques for developing wisdom. After a suitable interval, he returned to Bangkok, once again visiting Chao Kuo Nupali at Wat Boromaniwat. He informed his mentor of developments in his meditation practice, questioning him about doubts he still had concerning the practice of wisdom. Satisfied that the new investigative techniques he had learned were sufficient to further his progress, he finally took leave of Chao Kuo Nupali and left to seek seclusion at Sarika Cave in the Khao Yai Mountains of Nakua Nayok Province. Sarika Cave Atsariaman spent three years living and practicing in Sarika Cave. His entire stay there was filled with the most unusual experiences, making it a memorable episode in his life. To the best of my recollection, he first arrived at Ban Gloai village, the village nearest the cave and thus close enough to be convenient for alms round. Unfamiliar with the area, he asked the villagers to take him to Sarika cave. Straight away they warned him that it was a very special cave, possessing numerous supernatural powers, insisting that no monk could possibly live there unless his virtue was pure. Other monks who had tried to live there quickly fell ill with a variety of painful symptoms. Many had even died before they could be brought down for treatment. They told him that the cave was the domain of a spirit of immense size, possessing many magical powers. It also had a very foul temper. This giant spirit guarded the cave from all intruders, monks being no exception. Unexpected occurrences awaited all intruders into the cave, many of whom ended up dead. The spirit delighted in testing any monk who came bragging about his mastery of magic spells for warding off spirits. Invariably, the monk would suddenly fall ill and die a premature death. Fearing that Atsariaman might die likewise, the villagers pleaded with him not to go. Curious about the talk of a huge malevolent spirit with supernatural powers, 
Atsariyaman asked and was told that a trespasser usually saw some sign of those powers on the very first night. An ominous dream often accompanied fitful sleep. An enormous black spirit towering overhead threatened to drag the dreamer to his death, shouting that it had long been the cave's guardian, exercising absolute authority over the whole area and would allow no one to trespass. So any trespasser was immediately chased away, for it accepted no authority greater than its own, except that of a person of impeccable virtue and a loving, compassionate heart, who extended these noble qualities to all living beings. A person of such nobility was allowed to live in the cave. The spirit would even protect him and pay him homage, but it did not tolerate narrow-minded, selfish, ill-behaved intruders. Finding life in the cave a very uncomfortable experience, most monks refused to remain for long, and fearing death they made a hurried departure. Generally, no one managed a long stay. Only one or two days at most, and they were quickly on their way. Trembling and almost out of their minds with fear as they climbed back down, they blurted out something about a fierce demonic spirit. Scared and chastened, they fled, never to return. Worse still, some who went up to the cave never came down again. Thus the villagers worried about the fate that awaited Atsariyaman, not wanting him to become the next victim. Atsariyaman asked what they meant by saying that some monks went up there never to return. Why hadn't they come down again? He was told that, having died there, they couldn't possibly come back down. They recounted a story of four seemingly competent monks who had died in the cave not long before. Prior to entering the cave, one of them had assured the villagers that he was impervious to fear, for he knew a potent spell that protected him against ghosts and other spirits, plus many other potent spells as well. He was convinced no spirit could threaten him. Warning him repeatedly about the dangers, the villagers tried to discourage his intentions, but he reiterated that he had no fear and insisted on being taken to the cave. The villagers were left with no other choice, so they showed him the way. Once there, he came down with a variety of afflictions, including high fevers, pounding headaches, and terrible stomach pains. Sleeping fitfully, he dreamt that he was being taken away to his death. Over the years, many different monks had tried to live there, but their experiences were strikingly similar. Some died, others quickly fled. The four most recent monks died within a relatively short period. The villagers couldn't guarantee that their deaths were caused by a malevolent spirit, Perhaps there was another reason, but they had always noticed a powerful presence connected with the cave. Local people weren't so bold as to challenge its power, for they were wary of it, and envisioned themselves being carried back down in critical condition, or as corpses. Atsariyaman questioned them further to satisfy himself that they were telling the truth. They assured him that such things happened so often it frightened them to think about it. For this reason, they warned any monk or lay people who came to search the cave for magical objects or sacred amulets. Whether the cave actually contained such things is another matter, but the fact that some people liked to claim their existence meant that those with a penchant for sacred objects inevitably went there to search for them. The villagers themselves had never seen such objects in the cave, nor had they seen those seeking them encounter anything but death, or narrow escapes from death. Thus, fearing for Atsariyaman's safety, they begged him not to go. Atsariyaman gave the villagers a sympathetic hearing, but in the end he was still curious to see the cave. Live or die, he wanted to put himself to the test, and so discover the truth of those stories. The scary tales he heard didn't frighten him in the least. In truth, he saw this adventure as a means to arouse mindfulness, an opportunity to acquire many new ideas for contemplation. He possessed the courage to face whatever was to happen, as befits someone genuinely interested in seeking the truth. So, in his own unassuming way, he informed the villagers that, although the stories were very frightening, he would still like to spend some time in the cave. Assuring them that he would hurry back down at the first sign of trouble, he asked to be escorted to the cave, which they obligingly did. For several days, Atsariyaman's physical condition remained normal his heart calm and serene. The environment around the cave was secluded and very quiet, disturbed only by the natural sounds of wild animals foraging for food in the forest. He passed the first few nights contentedly, but on subsequent nights he began to suffer stomach pains. Although such pains were nothing new, 
This time, the condition grew steadily worse, eventually becoming so severe that he sometimes passed blood in his stool. Before long, his stomach refused to digest food properly. It simply passed straight through. This made him reflect on what the villagers had said about four monks dying there recently. If his condition didn't improve, perhaps he would be the fifth. When lay people came to see him at the cave one morning, he sent them to look in the forest for certain medicinal plants that he had previously found beneficial. They gathered various roots and wood essences, which he boiled into a potion and drank, or else ground into powder, drinking it dissolved in water. He tried several different combinations of herbs, but none relieved his symptoms. They worsened with each passing day. His body was extremely weak, and though his mental resolve was not greatly affected, it was clearly weaker than normal. As he sat drinking the medicine one day, a thought arose which prompting a self-critical examination reinforced his resolve. I have been taking this medicine now for many days. If it really is an effective stomach cure, then I should see some positive results by now, but every day my condition worsens. Why isn't this medicine having the desired effect? Perhaps it's not helping at all. Instead, it may be aggravating the symptoms and so causing the steady deterioration. If so, why continue taking it? Once he became fully aware of his predicament, he made an emphatic decision. From that day on, he would treat his stomach disorder using only the therapeutic properties of tamma. If he lived, so much the better. If he died, then so be it. Conventional types of treatment proving ineffective, he determined to stop taking all medicines until he was cured by Tumma's therapeutic powers, or else died there in the cave. With this firm resolution in mind, he reminded himself, I'm a Buddhist monk. I've certainly practiced meditation long enough to recognize the correct path leading to Magga, Pala, and Nibbana. By now, my practice should be firmly anchored in this conviction. So why am I so weak and cowardly when faced with a small degree of pain? It's only a slight pain, after all, yet I can't seem to come to grips with it. Becoming weak all of a sudden, I now feel defeated. Later, when life reaches a critical juncture at the moment of death as the body begins to break up and disintegrate, the onslaught of pain will then crush down mercilessly on body and mind. Where shall I find the strength to fight it so I can transcend this world and avoid being outdone in death's struggle? With this solemn determination, he stopped taking all medicines and began earnestly focusing on meditation as the sole remedy for all spiritual and bodily ailments. Discarding concern for his life, he let his body follow its own natural course, turning his attention to probing the citta, that essential knowing nature which never dies, yet has death as its constant companion. He set to work examining the citta, using the full powers of mindfulness, wisdom, faith, and perseverance that he had been developing within himself for so long. The seriousness of his physical conditions ceased to interest him. Concerns about death no longer arose. He directed mindfulness and wisdom to investigate the painful feelings he experienced, making them separate the body into its constituent elements and then thoroughly analyzing each one. He examined the physical components of the body and the feelings of pain within it. He analyzed the function of memory which presumes that one or another part of the body is in pain and he analyzed the thought processes which conceive the body as being in pain. All such vital aspects were targeted in the investigation conducted by mindfulness and wisdom as they continued to probe into the body, the pain, and the chitta, relentlessly exploring their connections from dusk until midnight. Through this process, he succeeded in fully disengaging the body from the severe pain caused by his stomach disorder until he understood with absolute clarity just how they are interrelated. At that moment of realization, his chitta converged into complete calm, a moment that saw his spiritual resolve immeasurably strengthened and his bodily illness totally vanish. The illness, the pain, the mind's preoccupations all disappeared simultaneously. Remaining only briefly in complete stillness, his chitta withdrew slightly, reaching the level of upatsara samadhi. This luminous chitta then left the confines of his body and immediately encountered an enormous black man standing fully thirty feet tall. The towering figure carried a huge metal club, twelve feet long and thick as a man's leg. Walking up to Atsariyaman, he announced in a menacing voice that he was about to pound him right into the ground. 
He warned Atariyaman to flee that very instant if he wished to remain alive. The metal club resting on his shoulder was so huge that a single blow from it would have been enough to pound a large bull elephant into the earth. Atsariyaman focused his chitta on the giant spirit, asking why he wanted to club to death someone who had done nothing to warrant such brutal treatment. He reminded the giant that he had harmed no one while living there, that he had caused no trouble deserving of such deadly punishment. The giant replied by saying that he had long been the sole authority guarding that mountain, and would never allow anyone to usurp that authority. He felt compelled to take decisive action against all intruders. Atsariyaman's response was reproachful. I did not come here to usurp anyone's authority. I came to carry on the noble work of spiritual development, for I aim to usurp the authority that the Kilesas exercise over my heart. Harming a virtuous monk in any way is an absolutely despicable act. I am a disciple of the Lord Buddha, that supremely pure individual whose all-powerful loving compassion encompasses the whole of the sentient universe. Does the great authority you boast give you power to override the authority of Tamma and of Gamma, those immutable laws that govern the existence of all living beings? The creature replied, No, sir. Atsariyaman then said, the Lord Buddha possessed the skill and the courage to destroy those insidious mental defilements that like boasting of power and authority. Thus he banished from his heart all thoughts of beating or killing other people. You think you're so smart. Have you ever given any thought to taking decisive action against the Kilesas in your heart? The creature admitted, Not yet, sir. In that case, such overbearing authority will just make you a cruel, savage individual, resulting in very grave consequences for you. You don't possess the authority needed to rid yourself of evil, so you use the fires of magic against others, unaware that you're actually burning yourself. You are creating very grave gamma indeed. As though that weren't bad enough, you want to attack and kill someone who represents the virtues of tamma, which are central to the world's well-being. How can you ever hope to lay claim to laudable virtues when you insist on engaging in evil behavior of such unparalleled brutality. I am a man of virtue. I have come here with the purest intentions, to practice tamma for my own spiritual benefit and the benefit of others. Despite that, you threaten to pound me into the ground, giving no thought to the consequences of such an evil deed. Don't you realize that it will drag you into hell where you will reap the terrible misery you have sown? Rather than feel concerned for myself, I feel very sorry for you. You've become so obsessed with your own authority that it's now burning you alive. Can your potent powers withstand the effect of the grave act you are about to commit? You say you exercise sovereign authority over this mountain, but can your magic powers override Tamma and the laws of Gamma? If your powers really are superior to Tamma, then go ahead, pound me to death. I am not afraid to die. Even if I don't die today, my death remains inevitable. For the world is a place where all those who are born must die. Even you, blinded as you are by your own self-importance. You are not above death, or the laws of Gamma that govern all living beings. The mysterious being stood listening, rigid as a statue, the deadly metal club resting on his shoulder as Atsariyaman admonished him by means of samadhi meditation. He stood so completely still that if he were a human being, we would say that he was so frightened and ashamed he could scarcely breathe. But this was a special non-human being, so he didn't in fact breathe. Yet his whole manner clearly showed him to be so ashamed and fearful of Atsariyaman that he could barely restrain his emotions, which he still managed to do quite admirably. Atsariyaman had finished speaking. Suddenly, the contrite spirit flung the metal club down from his shoulder and spontaneously transformed his appearance from a huge black creature into a devout Buddhist gentleman with a mild, courteous demeanor. Approaching Atsariyaman with heartfelt respect, the gentleman then asked his forgiveness, expressing deep remorse. Here is the gist of what he said. I was surprised and felt somewhat frightened the first moment I saw you. I immediately noticed a strange and amazing radiance extending out all around you, a brilliance unlike anything I had ever seen. 
It created such a profound impact that in your presence I felt weak and numb. I couldn't do anything, so captivated was I by that radiant glow. Still, I didn't know what it was, for I had never before experienced anything like it. My threats to kill you a moment ago didn't come from my heart's true feelings. Rather, they stemmed from a long-held belief that I possess unrivaled authority over non-human beings, as well as humans with evil intent who lack moral principles. Such authority can be imposed on anyone at any time, and that person will be powerless to resist. This arrogant sense of self-importance led me to confront you. Feeling vulnerable, I didn't want to lose face. Even as I threatened you, I felt nervous and hesitant, unable to act on my threat. It was merely the stance of someone accustomed to wielding power over others. Please be compassionate enough to forgive my rude, distasteful behavior today. I don't wish to suffer the consequences of evil any more. As it is now, I suffer enough. Any more, and I won't have the strength to bear it. Acharya Mun was curious about this. You are a prominent individual with enormous power and prestige. You have a non-physical body, so you needn't experience the human hardships of hunger and fatigue. You aren't burdened having to make a living as people here on Earth are, so why do you complain about suffering? If a celestial existence isn't happiness, then which type of existence is? The spirit replied, On a superficial level, perhaps, celestial beings with their ethereal bodies do actually experience more happiness than humans whose bodies are so much grosser. But speaking strictly in spiritual terms, a celestial being's ethereal body still suffers a degree of discomfort proportionate to the refined nature of that state of existence. This discussion between spirit and monk was far too profound and complex for me to capture its every detail here, so I hope the reader will forgive me for this shortcoming. As a result of the discussion, the mysterious celestial being, showing great respect for the tamma he heard, affirmed his devotion to the three refuges, Buddha, Tamma, and Sankha. He let it be known that he considered Atsariyaman to be one of his refuges as well, asking Atsariyaman to bear witness to his faith. At the same time, he offered Atsariyaman his full protection, inviting him to remain in the cave indefinitely. Had his wish been granted, Atsariyaman would have spent the rest of his life there. This being cherished the opportunity to take care of him. He wanted to ensure that nothing whatsoever disturbed Atsariyaman's meditation. In truth, he was not some mysterious being with a huge black body. That was merely a guise. He was the chief leader of all the terrestrial devas living in that region. His large entourage lived in an area that centered in the mountains of Nakhon Nayok and extended over many of the surrounding provinces as well. Acharya Man's chitta had converged into calm at midnight, after which he met the terrestrial dewa, communicating by means of samadhi meditation until 4 a.m., when his chitta withdrew to normal consciousness. The stomach disorder that was troubling him so much when he sat down at dusk had completely disappeared by that time. The therapeutic power of tamma, administered by means of meditation, was the only remedy he needed to effect a decisive cure, an experience that Atsariya Man found incredibly amazing. Foregoing sleep, he continued striving in his practice until dawn. Instead of feeling tired after a night of exertion, his body was more energetic than ever. He had passed a night full of many amazing experiences. He witnessed Tamma's powerful ability to tame an unruly spirit, transforming arrogance into faith. His chitta remained in a serenely calm state for many hours, savoring that wonderful sense of happiness. A chronic illness was completely cured, his digestion returning to normal. He was satisfied that his mind had acquired a solid spiritual basis, one he could trust, thus dispelling many of his lingering doubts. He realized many unusual insights he had never before attained, both those that removed defilements and those that enhanced the special understanding which formed an intrinsic part of his character. During the months that followed, his meditation practice progressed smoothly, accompanied always by indescribable peace and tranquility. With his health back to normal, physical discomforts no longer troubled him. Sometimes, late at night, he met with gatherings of terrestrial dewas who came from various places to visit him. Devas from the surrounding area had all heard of Atsariyaman, for the mysterious dewa who had engaged him in a war of words was now announcing his presence to others and escorting groups of them to meet him. On nights when no visitors came, he enjoyed himself practicing meditation. One afternoon he left his meditation seat to sit in the open air 
not far from the cave, reflecting on the tamma that the Lord Buddha had so compassionately given to mankind. He felt this tamma to be so very profound that he understood how difficult it was going to be to practice it to perfection and to fully realize its essential truths. He felt a sense of satisfaction, thinking how fortunate he was to be able to practice tamma and realize its many insights and truths. An amazing feeling. Even though he had yet to reach the ultimate realization, a dream he'd long desired to fulfill, still the spiritual contentment he experienced was very rewarding. He was sure now that, unless death intervened, his hopes would surely be realized one day. Savoring his contentment, he reflected on the path he took to practice tamma and the results he hoped to achieve, proceeding step by step until he reached a complete cessation of dukkha, eliminating all traces of discontent still existing within his heart. Just then, a large group of monkeys came foraging for food in front of the cave. The leader of the troop arrived first, a good distance in front of the rest. Reaching the area in front of the cave, it spotted Atsariyaman, who sat very still with eyes open, glancing silently at the approaching monkey. The monkey immediately became suspicious of his presence. Nervous, worried about the safety of its troop, it ran back and forth along the branch of a tree, looking warily at him. Acharyaman understood its anxiety and sympathized with it, sending out benevolent thoughts of loving-kindness. I've come here to practice tamma, not to mistreat or harm anyone, so there's no need to fear me. Keep searching for food as you please. You can come foraging around here every day if you like. In a flash, the lead monkey ran back to its troop, which Acharyaman could see approaching in the distance. He watched what happened next with a sense of great amusement, combined with sincere compassion. As soon as the leader reached the others, it quickly called out, Kok! Hey, not so fast. There's something over there. It may be dangerous. Hearing this, all the other monkeys began asking at once, Kok! Kok! Where? Where? And simultaneously, the leader turned his head toward Acharyaman's direction as if to say, Sitting over there. Can you see? Or something like that. But in the language of animals, which is an unfathomable mystery to most human beings, Acharyaman, however, understood every word they spoke. Once it had signaled Atsariyaman's presence to the group, the head monkey warned them to proceed slowly and cautiously until they could determine exactly what was up ahead. It then hurried off ahead of the group, warily approaching the front of the cave where Atsariyaman was seated. Being concerned for the safety of those following behind, it was apprehensive, but also curious to find out what was there. It cautiously snuck up close to Atsariyaman, jumping up and jumping down from branch to branch, as monkeys tend to do, for they are quite restless, as everybody knows. The lead monkey watched Acharyaman constantly, until it was sure that he posed no danger. Then it ran back and informed its friends, Kok, we can go. Kok, there's no danger. During this time, Acharyaman sat perfectly still, constantly gauging the lead monkey's inner feelings to judge its reaction to him. The way it ran back to speak to its friends was quite comic, yet, knowing exactly what they said, Acharyaman couldn't help feeling sorry for them. For those of us who don't understand their language, the calls they send back and forth to one another are merely sounds in the forest, much like the bird calls we hear every day. But when the lead monkey ran back, calling out to its troop, Acharyaman understood the meaning of what was said as clearly as if they had been conversing in human language. In the beginning, when the lead monkey first spotted him, it hurried back to its troop, warning its friends to take care and pay careful attention to what it had to say. Although it communicated this message in the gok gok sounds that monkeys make, the essential meaning was clear to the others. Hey, stop! Not so fast! There's danger up ahead! Hearing the warning, the others began wondering what danger there was. First one asked, Gok, what is it? Then another asked, Gok, what's the matter? The lead monkey answered, Gok gak! There's something up there. It may be dangerous. The others asked, Kok, where is it? The leader replied, Kok, right over there. The sounds made by this large troop of monkeys, as they questioned and answered one another, reverberated through the whole forest. First, one called out in alarm, then another, until monkeys, large and small, ran frantically back and forth, seeking answers about their situation. Fearful of the possible danger they all faced, they yelled excitedly to one another in a state of general confusion, just as we people tend to do when confronted with an emergency. Their leader was obliged to speak up and to try to clarify the situation, cautioning them, Kok, 
Everyone wait here while first I go back and check to make sure. With these parting instructions, it hurried back to look again. Approaching Acharyaman, who was seated in front of the cave, it looked warily at him while scurrying to and fro through the branches of the trees. Its eyes examined him with intense interest, until it was satisfied that Acharyaman wasn't an adversary. Then it hurriedly returned to its troop and announced, Kokak, we can go now. It's not dangerous. There's no need to be afraid. So the whole troop moved forward until it reached the spot where Acharyaman was seated, all of them cautiously peering at him in a way that signaled their continuing mistrust. As monkeys tend to do when their curiosity is aroused, the troop was jumping about through the trees. The gokgok sounds of their queries echoed through the forest. What is it? What's it doing here? The sounds of their replies reverberated in the agitated tone of animals needing to find out what's going on. The narration has a repetitive quality, for this is the narrative style that Atsariyaman himself used when telling the story. He wanted to emphasize the points of interest for his audience, and thus clearly indicate their significance. He said that wild monkeys tend to panic when sensing danger because, for ages, human beings have used various brutal methods to kill these animals in countless numbers, so monkeys are instinctively very distrustful of people. The flow of an animal's consciousness infuses the different sounds it makes with the appropriate meaning, just as human verbal expressions are determined by the flow of human consciousness. So, it is just as easy for monkeys to understand the meaning of their common sounds as it is for people to understand the same language. Each sound that issues from an animal's flow of consciousness is attuned to a specific meaning and purpose. These sounds communicate a clear message, and those who are listening invariably comprehend their precise meaning. So, even though it has no discernible meaning for human beings, when monkeys emit a sound like gok, they all understand its intended meaning, since this is the language monkeys use to communicate. Much the same applies to people of different nationalities, each speaking their own native language. Just as most nations around the world have their own specific language, so too each species of animal has its own distinct means of communication. Whether animals and humans can comprehend each other's language ceases to be an issue when we accept that each group has the prerogative to decide on the parameters of its speech and the manner in which it is conducted. Finally overcoming their fears, the monkeys roamed freely in the area around the cave, foraging for food as they pleased. No longer were they on guard, wary of the threat of danger. From that day on, they felt right at home there, showing no interest in Atsariyaman, and he paid no special attention to them, as he and they both went about their daily lives. Atsariyaman said that all the animals foraging for food in the area where he lived did so contentedly, without fear. Ordinarily, animals of all kinds feel comfortable living in places where monks have taken up residence, for animals are quite similar to human beings in emotion. They simply lack the same predominant authority and intelligence that humans possess. Their level of intelligence extends only to the tasks of searching for food and finding a place to hide in order to survive from day to day. One evening, Acharyaman felt so moved by a profound sense of sadness that tears came to his eyes. Seated in meditation, focusing on body contemplation, his chitta converged into a state of such total calm that it appeared completely empty. At that moment, he felt as though the whole universe had ceased to exist. Only emptiness remained, the emptiness of his chitta. Emerging from this profound state, he contemplated the teaching of the Lord Buddha, which prescribed the means for removing the defiling pollutants that exist in the hearts of all living beings a knowledge arising from the incisive genius of the Lord Putta's wisdom. The more he contemplated this matter, the more he understood the amazing sagacity of the Buddha, and the more profoundly saddened he was by his own ignorance. He realized the paramount importance of proper training and instruction. Even such common bodily functions as eating food and relieving ourselves must be taught to us. We learn to perform them properly by undergoing training and instruction washing and dressing ourselves, in fact all of our daily activities, must be learned through education, otherwise they will never be done correctly. Worse than doing them incorrectly, we may end up doing something seriously wrong, which could have grievous moral consequences. Just as it's necessary to receive training in how to take care of our bodies, so it is essential to receive proper guidance in how to take care of our minds. If our minds don't undergo the appropriate training, then we're bound to make serious mistakes, regardless of our age, gender, or position in society. The average person in this world resembles a young child who needs adult guidance and constant attention to safely grow to maturity. Most of us tend to grow up only in appearance, 
Our titles, our status, and our self-importance tend to increase ever more, but the knowledge and wisdom of the right way to achieve peace and happiness for ourselves and others don't grow to maturity with them, nor do we show an interest in developing these. Consequently, we always experience difficulties wherever we go. These were the thoughts that moved Atsari Amman to such a profound sense of sadness that evening. At the foot of the mountain, where the path to the Sarika cave began, stood a Vipassana meditation center, the residence of an elderly monk who was ordained late in life, after having had a wife and family. Thinking of this monk one evening, Acharya Man wondered what he was doing, and so he sent out his flow of consciousness to take a look. At that moment, the old monk's mind was completely distracted by thoughts of the past concerning the affairs of his home and family. Again, sending out his flow of consciousness to observe him later that same night, Acharya Man encountered the same situation. Just before dawn, he focused his chitta once again, only to find the old monk still busy making plans for his children and grandchildren. Each time he sent out the flow of his chitta to check, he found the monk thinking incessantly about matters concerned with building a worldly life now and untold rounds of existence in the future. On the way back from his alms round that morning, he stopped to visit the elderly monk and immediately put him on the spot. How's it going, old fellow? Building a new house and getting married to your wife all over again? You couldn't sleep at all last night. I suppose everything is all arranged now so you can relax in the evenings without having to get so worked up planning what you'll say to your children and grandchildren. I suspect you were so distracted by all that business last night you hardly slept a wink. Am I right? Embarrassed, the elderly monk asked with a sheepish smile, You knew about last night? You're incredible, Acharya Man. Acharya Man smiled in reply and added, I'm sure you know yourself much better than I do, so why ask me? I'm convinced you were thinking about those things quite deliberately. So preoccupied with your thoughts, you neglected to lie down and sleep all night. Even now, you continue to shamelessly enjoy thinking about such matters, and you don't have the mindfulness to stop yourself. You're still determined to act upon those thoughts, aren't you? As he finished, Atsariya Man noticed the elderly monk looking very pale as though about to faint from shock or embarrassment. He mumbled something incoherent in a faltering, ghostly-sounding voice bordering on madness. Seeing his condition, Atsariyaman instinctively knew that any further discussion would have serious consequences, so he found an excuse to change the subject, talking about other matters for a while to calm him down, and then he returned to the cave. Three days later, one of the old monk's lay supporters came to the cave, so Atsariyaman asked him about the monk. The layman said that he had abruptly left the previous morning, with no intention of returning. The layman had asked him why he was in such a hurry to leave, and he replied, How can I stay here any longer? The other morning, Atsariyaman stopped by, and lectured me so poignantly that I almost fainted right there in front of him. Had he continued lecturing me like that much longer, I'd surely have passed out and died there on the spot. As it was... He stopped and changed the subject, so I managed to survive somehow. How can you expect me to remain here now after that? I'm leaving today. The layman asked him, Did Atsuriyaman scold you harshly? Is that why you nearly died and now feel you can no longer stay here? He didn't scold me at all, but his astute questions were far worse than a tongue lashing. He asked you some questions, is that it? Can you tell me what they were? Perhaps I can learn a lesson from them. Please don't ask me to tell you what he said. I'm embarrassed to death as it is. Should anyone ever know, I'd sink into the ground. Without getting specific, I can tell you this much. He knows everything we're thinking. No scolding could possibly be as bad as that. It's quite natural for people to think both good thoughts and bad thoughts. Who can control them? But when I discover that Acharya Man knows all about my private thoughts, that's too much. I know I can't stay on here. Better to go off and die somewhere else than to stay here and disturb him with my wayward thinking. I mustn't stay here, further disgracing myself. Last night I couldn't sleep at all. I just can't get this matter out of my mind. But the layman begged to differ. Why should Acharya Man be disturbed by what you think? He's not the one at fault. The person at fault is the one who should be disturbed by what he's done, and then make a sincere effort to rectify it. That Acharya Man would certainly appreciate. So please, stay on here for a while. In that way, when those thoughts arise, you can benefit from Atsariyaman's advice. 
Then you can develop the mindfulness needed to solve this problem, which is much better than running away from it. What do you say to that? I can't stay. The prospect of my developing mindfulness to improve myself can't begin to rival my fear of Acharya Man. It's like pitting a cat against an elephant. Just thinking that he knows all about me is enough to make me shiver. So how could I possibly maintain any degree of mindfulness? I am leaving today. If I remain here any longer, I'll die for sure. Please believe me. The layman told Acharya Man that he felt very sorry for that old monk, but he didn't know what to say to prevent him leaving. His face was so pale it was obvious he was frightened, so I had to let him go. Before he left, I asked him where he'd be going. He said he didn't know for sure, but that if he didn't die first, we'd probably meet again some day. Then he left. I had a boy send him off. When the boy returned, I asked him, but he didn't know, for the elderly monk hadn't told him where he was going. I feel really sorry for him. An old man like that, he shouldn't have taken it so personally. Acharya Man was deeply dismayed to see his benevolent intentions producing such negative results, his compassion being the cause of such unfortunate consequences. In truth, seeing the elderly monk's stunned reaction that very first day, he had suspected that this might happen. After that day, he was disinclined to send out the flow of his chitta to investigate, fearing he might again meet with the same situation. In the end, his suspicions were confirmed. He told the layman that he'd spoken with the old monk in the familiar way that friends normally do, playful one minute, serious the next. He never imagined it becoming such a big issue that the elderly monk would feel compelled to abandon his monastery and flee like that. This incident became an important lesson determining how Acharya Man behaved toward all the many people he met throughout his life. He was concerned that such an incident might be repeated should he fail to make a point of carefully considering the circumstances before speaking. From that day on, he never cautioned people directly about the specific content of their thoughts. He merely alluded indirectly to certain types of thinking as a means of helping people become aware of the nature of their thoughts, but without upsetting their feelings. People's minds are like small children tottering uncertainly as they learn to walk. An adult's job is merely to watch them carefully so they come to no harm. There's no need to be overly protective all the time. The same applies to people's minds. They should be allowed to learn by their own experiences. Sometimes their thinking will be right, sometimes wrong, sometimes good, sometimes bad. This is only natural. It's unreasonable to expect them to be perfectly good and correct every time. The years Atsariya Man spent living in Sarika Cave were fruitful. He gained many enlightening ideas to deepen his understanding of the exclusively internal aspects of his meditation practice and many unusual insights concerning the great variety of external phenomena he encountered in his meditation. He became so pleasantly absorbed in his practice that he forgot about time. He hardly noticed the days, the months, or the years as they passed. Intuitive insights arose in his mind continuously, like water gently flowing along in the rainy season. On afternoons when the weather was clear, he walked through the forest, admiring the trees and the mountains, meditating as he went, absorbed in the natural scenery all around him. As evening fell, he gradually made his way back to the cave. The cave's surrounding area abounded in countless species of wild animals, the abundant variety of wild plants and fruits being a rich, natural source of sustenance. Animals such as monkeys, languars, flying squirrels, and gibbons, which depend on wild fruits, came and went contentedly. Preoccupied with their own affairs, they showed no fear in Acharyaman's presence, as he watched them foraging for food, he became engrossed in their playful antics. He felt a genuine spirit of camaraderie with those creatures, considering them his companions in birth, aging, sickness, and death. In this respect, animals are on an equal footing with people. For though animals and people differ in the extent of their accumulated merit and goodness, animals nonetheless possess these wholesome qualities in some measure as well. In fact, Degrees of accumulated merit may vary significantly among individual members of both groups. Moreover, many animals may actually possess greater stores of merit than do certain people, but having been unfortunate enough to be reborn into an animal existence, they must endure the consequences for the time being. Human beings face the same dilemma, for although human existence is considered a higher birth than that of an animal, a person falling on hard times and into poverty must endure that misfortune until it passes, or until the results of that unfortunate gamma are exhausted. 
Only then can a better state arise in its place. In this way, the effects of gamma continue to unfold indefinitely. For precisely this reason, Atsari Aman always insisted that we should never be contemptuous of another being's lowly status or state of birth. He always taught us that the good and the bad gamma created by each living being are that being's only true inheritance. Each afternoon, Atsari Aman swept the area clean in front of the cave. Then, for the rest of the evening, he concentrated on his meditation practice, alternating between walking and sitting meditation. His samadhi practice steadily progressed, infusing his heart with tranquility. At the same time, he intensified the development of wisdom by mentally dissecting the different parts of the body while analyzing them in terms of the three universal characteristics of existence. That is to say, all are impermanent, bound up with suffering, and void of any self. In this manner, his confidence grew with each passing day. The Savaka Arahants Living in Sarika Cave, Atsariman was occasionally visited by Savaka Arahants, who appeared to him by means of Samati Nimitta. Each Savaka Arahant delivered for his benefit a discourse on Tamma, elucidating the traditional practices of the Noble Ones. Here is the substance of what was expressed. Walking meditation must be practiced in a calm, self-composed manner. Use mindfulness to focus your attention directly on the task you have set for yourself. If you're investigating the nature of the kantas or the conditions of the body, or simply concentrating on a specific tamma theme, then make sure mindfulness is firmly fixed on that object. Don't allow your attention to drift elsewhere. Such negligence is characteristic of one having no solid spiritual basis to anchor him, and thus lacking a reliable inner refuge. Mindful awareness should attend each and every movement in all your daily activities. Don't perform these actions as though you are so sound asleep that you have no mindful awareness of how your body tosses about or how prolifically your sleeping mind dreams. Going on your morning alms round, eating your food, and relieving yourself, in all such basic duties you should adhere strictly to the traditional practices of the Lord Putta's noble disciples. Never behave as though you lack proper training in the teaching and the discipline. Always conduct yourself in the manner of a true samana, with the calm, peaceful demeanor expected of one who ordains as a disciple of the Lord Putta. This means maintaining mindfulness and wisdom in every posture, as a way of eliminating the poisons buried deep within your heart. Thoroughly investigate all the food you eat. Don't allow those foods that taste good to add poison to your mind. Even though the body may be strengthened by food that's eaten without proper investigation, the mind will be weakened by its damaging effects. By nourishing your body with food that is eaten unmindfully, you will, in effect, be destroying yourself with nourishment that depletes your mental vitality. A samana must never endanger his own well-being or the well-being of others by shamefully accumulating kilesas, for not only do they harm him, but they can easily mushroom and spread harm to others as well. In the view of the Buddha's noble disciples, all mental defilements are to be greatly feared, Utmost care should be taken to ensure that the mind does not neglect to check any outflow of the kilesas, for each one acts like a sheet of fire destroying everything in its path. The noble tamma, practiced by all of the Lord Putta's noble disciples, emphasizes scrupulous self-discipline at all times and under all conditions, whether walking, standing, sitting, lying down, eating, or relieving oneself, and in all of one's conversations and social interactions. Inattentive, undisciplined behavior is a habit of the kilesas, leading to unwholesome thoughts and thus perpetuating the cycle of birth and death. Those wishing to escape from the cycle of rebirth should avoid such deplorable habits. They merely lead deeper into the abyss, eventually causing one to become that most undesirable of persons, a wretched summoner. No one wishes to partake of wretched food, no one wishes to reside in a wretched house, and no one wishes to dress in wretched clothes or even look at them. Generally, people detest and shun wretched things. How much more so a wretched person with a wretched mind? But the most abhorrent thing in the world is a wretched samana who is ordained as a Buddhist monk. His wretchedness pierces the hearts of good and bad people alike. It pierces the hearts of all devas and pramas without exception. For this reason, one should strive to be a true samana, exercising extreme care to remain mindful and self-disciplined at all times. Of all the many things that people value and care for in the world, a person's mind is the most precious. In fact, the mind is the foremost treasure in the whole world, so be sure to look after it well. 
To realize the mind's true nature is to realize tamma. Understanding the mind is the same as understanding tamma. Once the mind is known, then tamma in its entirety is known. Arriving at the truth about one's mind is the attainment of nibbana. Clearly, the mind is a priceless possession that should never be overlooked. Those who neglect to nurture the special status that the mind has within their bodies will always be born flawed, no matter how many hundreds or thousands of times they are reborn. Once we realize the precious nature of our own minds, we should not be remiss, knowing full well that we are certain to regret it later. Such remorse being avoidable, we should never allow it to occur. Human beings are the most intelligent form of life on earth. As such, they should not wallow in ignorance. Otherwise, they will live an insufferably wretched existence, never finding any measure of happiness. The manner in which a true summoner conducts all his affairs, both temporal and spiritual, sets a trustworthy example to be followed by the rest of the world. He engages in work that is pure and blameless. His actions are both righteous and dispassionate. So endeavor to cultivate within yourself the exemplary work of a summoner, making it flourish steadily so that wherever you go, your practice will always prosper accordingly. A samana who cherishes moral virtue, cherishes concentration, cherishes mindfulness, cherishes wisdom, and cherishes diligent effort, is sure to achieve that exalted status of a full-fledged samana now, and to maintain it in the future. The teaching that I give you is the dispensation of a man of diligence and perseverance, a spiritual warrior who emerged victorious, a preeminent individual who completely transcended dukkha, freeing himself of all fetters. He attained absolute freedom, becoming the Lord Buddha, the supreme guide and teacher of the three worlds of existence. If you can understand the special value this teaching holds for you, before long you too will have rid yourself of kilesas. I entrust this Tamma teaching to you, in the hope that you will give it the most careful consideration. In that way, you will experience incredible wonders arising within your mind, which by its very nature is a superb and wonderful thing. Asavaka Arahant, having delivered such a discourse and departed, Atsaryaman humbly received that Tamma teaching. He carefully contemplated every aspect of it, isolating each individual point, and then thoroughly analyzed them all, one by one. As more and more Savaka Arahants came to teach him in this way, he gained many new insights into the practice just by listening to their expositions. Hearing their wonderful discourses increased his enthusiasm for meditation, thus greatly enhancing his understanding of Tamma. Atsaryaman said that listening to a discourse delivered by one of the Buddha's Arahant disciples made him feel as if he were in the presence of the Lord Buddha himself, though he had no prior recollection of meeting the Buddha. Listening intently, his heart completely full, he became so absorbed in Tamma that the entire physical world, including his own body, ceased to exist for him then. The citta alone existed, its awareness shining brightly with the radiance of Tamma. It was only later, when he withdrew from that state, that he realized the oppressive burden he still carried with him, for he became conscious again of his physical body, the focal point where the other four khandas come together, each one a heavy mass of suffering on its own. During his lengthy sojourn at Sadika Cave, Acharyaman entertained many Savaka Arahants and heeded their words of advice, making this cave unique among all the places where he had ever stayed. While living there, the tamma of unimpeachable certainty arose in his heart. That is, he attained the fruition of Anagami. According to Buddhist scripture, the Anagami has abandoned the five lower fetters that bind living beings to the round of repeated existence. Sakaya Dirti, Vijikicca, Silabhata Paramasa, Gamaraga, and Partika. Someone reaching this level of attainment is assured of never being reborn in the human realm or in any other realm of existence where bodies are composed of the four gross physical elements, earth, water, fire, and air. Should that individual fail to ascend to the level of the Arahant before dying, at the moment of death he will be reborn into one of the five pure abodes of the Brahma world. An Anagami is reborn in the abode of Aviha, Atappa, Sudassa, Sudassi, or Akanirta, depending on the individual's level of advancement along the Arahant path. Atsaryaman revealed that he attained the stage of Anagami in Sarika Cave exclusively to his close disciples, but I have decided to declare it publicly here for the reader's consideration. Should this disclosure be considered in any way inappropriate, I deserve the blame for not being more circumspect. One night, Having continued to practice peacefully for many months, 
Atareman experienced an unusually strong feeling of compassion for his fellow monks. By that time, amazing insights surfaced nightly in his meditation practice. He became keenly aware of many strange, wonderful things, things he had never dreamed of seeing in his life. On the night that he thought about his fellow monks, his meditation had an exceptionally unusual quality to it. His citta had attained an especially ethereal refinement and samadhi, resulting in many extraordinary insights. Fully realizing the harmful effects that his own past ignorance had caused him, he was moved to tears. At the same time, he understood the value of the effort he had struggled so diligently to maintain until he could reap the amazing fruits of that diligence. A deep appreciation for the Lord Putta's supreme importance arose in his heart, for it was he who compassionately proclaimed the Tamma so that others could follow in his footsteps, thus allowing them to understand the complex nature of their own Kamma and that of all other living beings as well. Thus the vital significance of the Tamma verse. All beings are born of their Kamma, and Kamma is their one true possession, which succinctly sums up practically all the Buddha's teachings. Those insights notwithstanding, Acharyaman continued to remind himself that despite their truly amazing character, he had yet to reach the end of the path and the cessation of Dukkha. To accomplish that, he would need to pour all his energy into the practice, with unstinting resolve. In the meantime, he was pleased to see that the chronic stomach ailment which he had suffered so long was now completely cured. More than that, his mind was now firmly anchored to a solid spiritual basis. Although he had yet to totally eradicate his kilesas, he was sure of being on the right path. His meditation practice, now progressing smoothly, had none of the fluctuations he had experienced earlier. Unlike in the past, when he was groping in the dark, feeling his way along, he now felt certain of the path leading to the highest tamma. He was absolutely convinced that one day he would transcend Dukkha. His mindfulness and wisdom had reached a stage where they worked ceaselessly in perfect concert. He never needed to urge them into action. Day and night, knowledge and understanding arose continuously, both internal spiritual insights and awareness of countless external phenomena. The more his mind delighted in such amazing tamma, the more compassion he felt for his fellow monks. He was eager to share with them these wondrous insights. In the end, this profound feeling of compassion precipitated his departure from that auspicious cave. With some reluctance, he eventually left to search out the Tutunga monks he had known previously when he was living in the northeast. Several days prior to his departure from Sarika Cave, a group of terrestrial Dewas, led by the mysterious being he first encountered there, came to hear a discourse on Tamma. After finishing his discourse, Acharyaman informed them of his decision saying he would soon take leave of them. Unwilling to see him depart, the large company of Dewas who were gathered there beseeched him to stay on for the sake of their long-term happiness and prosperity. Atsariman explained that, just as he had come to that cave for a reason, so too he had a reason for moving on. He didn't come and go slavishly, following his desires. Asking for their understanding, he cautioned them against feeling disappointed. He promised that, if the opportunity presented itself in the future, he would return. The day was expressed their sincere regrets, showing the genuine affection and respect for him they'd always felt. At about 10 p.m. on the night before his departure, Atariyaman thought of Jao Kunupali at Wat Buramaniwat Monastery, wondering what was on his mind. So he focused his chitta and sent the flow of his consciousness out to observe him. He found that Chao Kunupali was at that moment contemplating Avicca in relation to Paricca Samupada. Acharyaman took note of the time and the date. When eventually he arrived in Bangkok, he asked Chao Kunupali about what he'd observed. With a hearty laugh, Chao Kunupali immediately acknowledged it to be true, saying this in praise of Acharyaman. You are truly masterful. I myself am a respected teacher, yet I'm inept compared to you, and I feel embarrassed. You truly are a master. This is exactly how a genuine disciple of the Lord Putta follows in the footsteps of the Supreme Teacher. We can't all be incompetent in the practice of the Lord Putta's teaching. Somebody has to maintain this exalted tamma in the spirit that it was originally taught. By not allowing the modern age we live in to foster a lazy, defeatist attitude toward the highest attainments, you have demonstrated the timeless quality of the Putta's teaching. Otherwise, the true tamma will no longer arise in the world despite the fact that the Buddha proclaimed it for the benefit of all mankind. The special knowledge you have just displayed to me is most admirable. 
This is the way the Lord's teaching should be developed and put into practice. Atsariyaman stated that Chao Kunupali had the utmost admiration and respect for him. There were certain occasions when he sent for Atsariyaman to help him solve certain problems he was unable to resolve to his own satisfaction. Eventually, when the time was right, Atsariyaman left Bangkok and returned directly to the northeast. In the years prior to his sojourn at Sarika Cave, Atsariyaman travelled into the neighbouring country of Burma, later returning by way of the northern Thai province of Chiang Mai. Continuing on into Laos, he practiced the ascetic way of life for some time in the area around Luang Prabang, eventually returning to Thailand to spend the rains retreat near the village of Bangkok in Loe province, quite close to Pa Pu Cave. The following rains retreat was spent at Pa Bing Cave, also in Loe province. Back then, these places were all wilderness areas, teeming with wild animals, where village communities were located far and few between. One could walk all day without coming across a single settlement. One could walk all day without coming across a single settlement. A person losing his way in that vast wilderness could find himself in the precarious situation of having to sleep overnight in an inhospitable environment at the mercy of tigers and other wild beasts. On one occasion, Achariyaman crossed the Mekong River and settled in a large tract of mountainous forest on the Laotian side. While he camped there, a huge Bengal tiger often wandered into his living area. Always coming at night, it stood some distance away, watching him pace back and forth in meditation. It never displayed threatening behavior, but it did roar occasionally as it wandered freely around the area. Being well accustomed to living in close proximity to wild animals, Atsariyaman paid little attention to the tiger. During that excursion, he was accompanied by another monk, Acharya Sita, who had been ordained slightly longer than he had. A contemporary of Acharya Man, Acharya Sita excelled in the practice of meditation. He liked the type of seclusion that the wilderness offered, preferring to live in the mountains stretching along the Laotian side of the Mekong River. Only occasionally did he cross the river into Thailand, and then never for very long. On that occasion, Acharya Man and Acharya Sita were camped some distance apart, each depending on a separate village for his daily alms food. One night, while walking in meditation, Acharya Sita was visited by a huge Bengal tiger. The tiger crept in and quietly crouched forward to about six feet from his meditation track, right in between the lighted candles at each end of the track that allowed him to see as he paced back and forth in the dark. Facing the meditation track while remaining motionless, it sat there calmly like a house pet, watching Acharya Sita intently as he paced back and forth. Reaching that place on the track opposite which the tiger was crouched, Acharya Sita sensed something out of place. At once he became suspicious, for normally nothing was at the side of his track. Glancing over, he saw the huge Bengal tiger crouched there, staring back at him, since when he couldn't tell. Still, he felt no fear. He merely watched the tiger as it sat motionless, looking back at him like an enormous stuffed animal. After a moment, he continued pacing back and forth, passing each time in front of the tiger, but thoughts of fear never crossed his mind. He noticed, though, that it remained crouched there for an unusually long time. Feeling sorry for it, he directed this train of thought at the tiger. Why not go off and find something to eat? Why just sit there watching me? No sooner had this thought arisen than the tiger let out a deafening roar that resounded through the whole forest. The sound of its roar left Atsari Sita in no doubt that it intended to stay, so he quickly changed tack, thinking, I thought that only because I felt sorry for you. I was afraid you might get hungry sitting there so long. After all, you have a mouth and a stomach to fill, just like all other creatures. But if you don't feel hungry and want to sit there watching over me, that's fine. I don't mind. The tiger showed no reaction to Acharya Sitta's change of heart. It just crouched by the path and continued to watch him. He then resumed his meditation, taking no further interest in it. Some time later, he left the meditation track and walked to a small bamboo platform situated close by to take a rest. He chanted suttas there for a while, then sat peacefully in meditation until time to go to sleep, which he did lying on the bamboo platform. During that entire time, the tiger remained crouched in its original position, not far away. But when he awoke at 3 a.m. to resume his walking meditation, he saw no sign of the tiger anywhere. He had no idea where it had gone. As it happened, he saw it only that once. From then on until he left that place, it never appeared again. This incident intrigued Acharya Sita, 
So when he met with Acharyaman, he described to him how the tiger had crouched there watching him. He told Acharyaman the tiger had roared at the precise moment the thought arose wishing it to go away. He recounted how, although he wasn't conscious of any fear, his hair stood on end and his scalp went numb, as if he were wearing a cap. But soon he again felt quite normal, resuming his walking meditation as though nothing had happened. Actually, there probably was a subtle measure of fear buried deep inside that he was incapable of perceiving at the time. Although the tiger never returned to his campsite, he often heard the sounds of its roars echoing through the nearby forest. Still, Atsare Sitta's mind remained resolute, and he continued to practice contentedly, as he always had. Chapter 2 The Middle Years In the early years when Atsare Amun first began wandering to Tanga, he started in the northeastern province of Nakon Banom. From there, he traveled across the provinces of Zakon Nakon and Udon Thani, finally reaching Burma, where he stayed for a while before returning to Thailand by way of the northern province of Chiang Mai. Staying briefly there, he then traveled into Laos, practicing the ascetic way of life in Luang Prabang and later Vientiane, before eventually returning to Loe province. From this northeastern locale, he wandered by stages down to Bangkok, spending a rains retreat at Wat Patumwan Monastery. Following that retreat period, he took up residence in Sarika Cave, remaining there for several years. Only upon leaving Sarika Cave did he return to the northeast province. During all those years of extensive wandering, he almost always traveled alone. On only a few occasions was he accompanied by another monk, and even then they soon parted company. Atsariyaman always practiced with a single-minded resolve, which kept him aloof from his fellow monks. He invariably felt it more convenient to wander to Tanga alone, practicing the ascetic way of life on his own. Only after his heart had been sufficiently strengthened by higher spiritual attainment did the compassion arise which made teaching his fellow monks a priority. Such compassionate considerations were the reason why he left the peace and tranquility of Sarika Cave to journey back to the northeast. Previously, his early years of wandering to Tanga in the northeastern provinces had given him an opportunity to instruct some of the Gummerkana monks he met there. In those days, he had found a large number of Dutanga monks practicing in various locations throughout the northeast. In making this return trip, Atsariya Man was determined to teach the monks and laity who trusted his guidance, putting all his energy into the task. Returning to the same provinces he had once wandered through, he found that monks and lay people everywhere soon gained faith in him. Many of them, inspired by his teaching, ordained as monks to practice the way he did. Even some senior acharyas, teachers in their own right, discarded their pride and renounced their obligations to practice under his tutelage, their minds eventually becoming so firmly established in meditation that they were fully confident of their ability to teach others. Monks among the first generation of Atsarya Mun's disciples included Atsarya Suwan, the former abbot of Wat Aranyakawat Monastery in the Thabo district of Nongkai province, Atsarya Singh Kantayakamo, the former abbot of Wat Basalawan Monastery in the Khon Rachasima, and Atsarya Mahapin Panyapalo, the former abbot of Wat Saddaram Monastery in the Khon Rachasima. All three of these venerable Atsaryas came originally from the province of Ubon Rachatani. All have now passed away. They were influential disciples whose teaching careers helped to perpetuate Atsarya Man's legacy for the benefit of future generations. Atsarya Singh and Atsarya Mahapin were brothers. Before taking up the way of practice, they thoroughly studied the Buddhist canonical texts. They were two of the senior Atsaryas who gained faith in Atsarya Man, discarding their pride and renouncing their obligations in order to follow the practice as he taught it. Eventually, through their teaching efforts, they were able to assist many people from all walks of life. Next in order of seniority was Atariya Tete Serangsi, who presently resides at Wat Hin Makbeng Monastery in the Sri Chiang Mai district of Nongkai province. He is a senior disciple of Atariya Man, whose exemplary mode of practice is so inspiring that he is highly revered by monks and laity in almost all parts of the country. His manner is always simple and down-to-earth, as one would expect with his exceptionally gentle, gracious, unassuming character. He conducts himself with perfect dignity, while people from all levels of society are captivated by his eloquent discourse. When it comes to temperament, or personal behavior, senior acharyas differ in their natural qualities of mind and character. 
There are acharyas whose personal behavior is an excellent example for everyone to emulate. Those emulating them are bound to behave in a pleasing, amicable manner that's in no way offensive to other people. The personal behavior of some other acharyas, however, is pleasing and appropriate only when practiced by them personally. Should others adopt the same style of behavior, it's bound to appear false, immediately offending anyone exposed to it. So it is inadvisable for most people to imitate the idiosyncratic behavior of these acharyas. The personal conduct of Acharya Tet, however, is unimpeachable in this regard. Following his sterling example, one is bound to develop the kind of pleasing, amicable demeanor appreciated by people everywhere. He has such a gentle, kindly disposition that it can be easily emulated without the risk of offending others. His example is especially appropriate for Buddhist monks, whose personal behavior should always reflect a truly calm and peaceful frame of mind. Atsariya Tet is one of Atsariya Man's senior disciples, who I believe deserves the highest respect. For as long as I have known him, I have always considered him to be an eminent teacher. Next in line is Atsariya Fan Lataro, who now resides at Watu Domsampon, near the village of Nahua Tsang, in the Pannan Nikom district of Sakon Nakon province. He is widely known and lauded throughout the country for his excellent spiritual practice and his virtuous conduct. His mind excels in noble qualities, the most prominent being his immense loving-kindness for people of all classes. He is a monk truly worthy of the enthusiastic devotion he receives from people of every region of our country. He genuinely puts his heart into helping people in any way he can, whether materially or spiritually, like one whose benevolence knows no bounds. The next senior disciple I shall mention is Acharya Kao Analio, who presently resides at Wat Tham Glong Pen Monastery in the Nong Bua Lampur district of Udon Thani province. As he is one of the foremost meditation masters of our time, it's very likely that the reader is already familiar with his outstanding reputation. Both his mode of practice and his level of spiritual attainment are worthy of the utmost respect. He is always preferred to practice in remote, secluded locations, with such single-minded resolve that his diligence in this respect is unrivaled among his peers in the circle of Tutanga monks. Even today, at the age of 82, he still refuses to allow his declining health to curtail his customary zeal. Some people have asked me, out of concern for his failing health, why he continues to put such strenuous effort into practice when, in truth, he has nothing further to accomplish. They can't figure out why he remains so active and energetic. I try to explain to them that someone who has completely eliminated the contentious factors that exploit every weakness to sap energy and hinder progress has no debilitating lethargy left to entrap his mind in a web of delusion. Meanwhile, the rest of us have amassed such a debilitating mountain of laziness that it virtually obscures us from view. As soon as we get started on some worthwhile endeavor, we become apprehensive lest the fruits of our efforts overload our capacity to store them. We worry ahead of time about how exhausted we'll be when the work becomes difficult. In the end, having failed to gather those wholesome fruits, we are left with an empty basket, that is, an empty, joyless heart, drifting aimlessly with no hard-earned store of merit to fall back on. Instead, we fill our empty hearts with complaints about all the difficulties we face. So laziness, this blight in our hearts, keeps throwing up obstacles to block our way. Those who have cleansed this blight from their hearts remain persistent, persevering in times of hardship. They never worry about overloading their capacity to store the fruits of their efforts. Those individuals whose hearts are pure, unblemished tamma, cleared of all worldly defilements, stand out majestically in all situations. Somber, sullen moods never arise in their hearts, making them perfect examples for the world to follow. Each of the above-mentioned disciples of Atsariyaman has certain brilliant qualities buried deep within his heart, shining there like precious gems. People having the good fortune to meet such noble teachers are bound to be rewarded with amazing insights to gladden their hearts, an experience they will cherish forever. Atsariyaman taught several different generations of disciples, many of whom have become important teachers in their own right. Being a meditation master of great stature, rich and noble virtues, he was wonderfully clever in the way he elucidated the path of practice and its fruits. It was as though he had a miniature Dupitaka etched into his heart, as was so accurately prophesied by the initial Samadhi Nimitta he saw when he first began to practice. 
Traveling to many regions of the country during the course of his teaching career, he instructed large numbers of monks and lay supporters, who in turn developed a deep devotion for him and a genuine fondness for the edifying tamma he taught. His spiritual impact was a direct result of having realized within himself the true nature of that tamma. His words thus represented that truth which he had fully comprehended, not mere guesswork or conjecture about what the truth should be or might be. Being absolutely certain about the truth arising in his own heart, he taught this same truth to others. When Atariyaman left Sarika Cave to return to the northeast for the second time, he was fully determined to teach the way to as many monks and laity as possible, both his previous acquaintances who had already undergone some training, as well as those who were just beginning to establish themselves in the practice. The Dutanga Practices Atsariyaman strongly believed that the observance of Dutanga practices truly exemplified the spirit of the ascetic way of life. He strictly adhered to these ascetic practices throughout his life and always urged those monks studying under his tutelage to adopt them in their own practice. Going on alms round every day without fail, excepting only those days when a monk is deliberately abstaining from food. Atsariyaman taught his disciples that, when walking to the village for alms, they should always have mindfulness present and remain properly restrained in body, speech, and mind. A monk should never permit his mind to accidentally become prey to the various tempting sense objects contacting his eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, or mind, while walking to and from the village on alms round. He stressed that mindfulness should bring their every movement, every thought, at every step of the route, under vigilant scrutiny. This should be treated as a sacred duty, requiring reflection of the utmost seriousness each time a monk prepares to go on his morning alms round. Eating only that food which has been accepted in the alms bowl on alms round. A monk should consider the quantity of food he receives in his bowl each day to be sufficient for his needs, as befits one who is content with little, and thus easily satisfied. For him, it's counterproductive to expect extra food by accepting the generous offerings that are made later inside the monastery. Such practices easily encourage the insatiable greed of his kilesas, allowing them to gain the strength to become so domineering that they're almost impossible to counteract. A monk eats whatever food is offered into his bowl, never feeling anxious or upset should it fail to meet his expectations. Anxiety about food is a characteristic of hungry ghosts, beings tormented by the results of their own bad gumma. Never receiving enough food to satisfy their desires, they run madly around, desperately trying to fill their mouths and stomachs, always preferring the prospect of food to the practice of tamma. The ascetic practice of refusing to accept any food offered after alms round is an excellent way of contravening the tendency to be greedy for food. It is also the best method to cut off all expectancy concerning food and the anxiety that it creates. Eating only one meal per day is just right for the meditative lifestyle of a Dutanga monk, since he needn't worry about food at all hours of the day. Otherwise, he could easily become more worried about his stomach than he is about tamma, a most undignified attitude for one sincerely seeking a way to transcend dukkha. Even when eating only once a day, there are times when a monk should reduce his consumption, eating much less than he normally would at that one meal. This practice helps facilitate the work of meditation, for eating too much food can make the mental faculties sluggish and unresponsive. In addition, a monk whose temperament is suited to this practice can be expected to experience results invaluable to his spiritual development. This particular Tutanga observance is a useful tool for eliminating the greedy mentality of practicing monks who tend to be infatuated with food. In this respect, the safeguards of Tamma operate in much the same manner as the safeguards that society has introduced to protect itself. Enemies of society are confronted and subdued wherever they pose a threat to wealth, property, life and limb, or peace of mind. Whether it be fierce animals, such as wild dogs, snakes, elephants and tigers, or pestilent diseases, or simply pugnacious individuals, Societies all over the world possess appropriate corrective measures or medicines to effectively subdue and protect themselves against these threats. A Tutanga monk whose mind displays pugnacious tendencies in its desire for food, or any other unwholesome qualities deemed distasteful, needs to have effective measures for correcting these threatening tendencies. Thus, 
He will always possess the kind of admirable self-restraint which is a blessing for him and a pleasing sight for those with whom he associates. Eating only one meal per day is an excellent way to restrain unwieldy mental states. Eating all food directly from the alms bowl, without using any other utensils, is a practice eminently suited to the lifestyle of a Dutunga monk who strives to be satisfied with little while wandering from place to place. Using just his alms bowl means there's no need to be loaded down with a lot of cumbersome accessories as he travels from one location to another, practicing the ascetic way of life. At the same time, it is an expedient practice for monks wishing to unburden themselves of mental clutter, for each extra item they carry and look after is just one more concern that weighs on their minds. For this reason, Tutanga monks should pay special attention to the practice of eating exclusively from the alms bowl. In truth, it gives rise to many unique benefits. Mixing all types of food together in the bowl is a way of reminding a monk to be attentive to the food he eats and to investigate its true nature using mindfulness and wisdom to gain a clear insight into the truth about food. Acharya Man said that, for him, eating from the bowl was just as important as any other Jutanga practice. He gained numerous insights while contemplating the food he was eating each day. Throughout his life, he strictly observed this ascetic practice. Investigating the true nature of food mixed together in the bowl is an effective means of cutting off strong desire for the taste of food. This investigation is a technique used to remove greed from a monk's mind as he eats his meal. Greed for food is thus replaced by a distinct awareness of the truth concerning that food. Food's only true purpose is to nourish the body, allowing it to remain alive from one day to the next. In this way, neither the pleasant flavor of good foods nor the unpleasant flavor of disagreeable foods will cause any mental disturbance that might prompt the mind to waver. If a monk employs skillful investigative techniques each time he begins to eat, his mind will remain steadfast, dispassionate, and contented, unmoved by excitement or disappointment over the taste of the food he has offered. Consequently, eating directly from the alms bowl is an excellent practice for getting rid of infatuation with the taste of food. Wearing only robes made from discarded cloth is another Jutanga observance that Atariyaman practiced religiously. This ascetic practice is designed to forestall the temptation to give in to the heart's natural inclination to desire nice, attractive-looking robes and other requisites. It entails searching in places like cemeteries for discarded pieces of cloth, collecting them little by little, then stitching the pieces together to make a usable garment, such as an upper robe, a lower robe, an outer robe, a bathing cloth, or any other requisite. There were times, when the dead person's relatives were agreeable, that Atariyaman collected the shroud used to wrap a corpse laid out in a charnel ground. Whenever he found discarded pieces of cloth on the ground while on alms round, he would pick them up and use them for making robes, regardless of the type of cloth or where it came from. Returning to the monastery, he washed them, and then used them to patch a torn robe, or to make a bathing cloth. This he routinely did wherever he stayed. Later, as more and more faithful supporters learned of his practice, they offered him robe material by intentionally discarding pieces of cloth in charnel grounds, or along the route he took for alms round, or around the area where he stayed, or even at the hut where he lived. Thus his original practice of strictly taking only pieces of old discarded cloth was altered somewhat according to circumstances. He was obliged to accept cloth the faithful had placed as offerings in strategic locations. Be that as it may, he continued to wear robes made from discarded cloth until the day he died. Atariyaman insisted that in order to live in comfort, a monk must comport himself like a worthless old rag. If he can rid himself of the conceit that his virtuous calling makes him somebody special, then he will feel at ease in all of his daily activities and personal associations. For genuine virtue does not arise from such assumptions. Genuine virtue arises from the self-effacing humility and forthright integrity of one who is always morally and spiritually conscientious. Such is the nature of genuine virtue. Without hidden, harmful pride, that person is at peace with himself and at peace with the rest of the world wherever he goes. The ascetic practice of wearing only robes made from discarded cloth serves as an exceptionally good antidote to thoughts of pride and self-importance. A practicing monk should understand the relationship between himself and the virtuous qualities he aspires to attain. 
A practicing monk should understand the relationship between himself and the virtuous qualities he aspires to attain. He must never permit pride to grab possession of the moral and spiritual virtues he cultivates within his heart. Otherwise, dangers, fangs, and daggers will spring up in the midst of those virtuous qualities, even though intrinsically they're a source of peace and tranquility. He should train himself to adopt the self-effacing attitude of being a worthless old rag until it becomes habitual, while never allowing conceit about his worthiness to come to the surface. A monk must cultivate this noble quality and ingrain it deeply in his personality, making it an intrinsic character trait as steadfast as the earth. He will thus remain unaffected by words of praise or of criticism. Moreover, a mind totally devoid of conceit is a mind imperturbable in all circumstances. Atariya Mun believed that the practice of wearing robes made from discarded cloth was one sure way to help attenuate feelings of self-importance buried deep within the heart. Living in the Forest Realizing the value of this Tutanga observance from the very beginning, Atsariyaman found forest dwelling conducive to the eerie, secluded feeling associated with genuine solitude. Living and meditating in the natural surroundings of a forest environment awakens the senses and encourages mindfulness for remaining vigilant in all of one's daily activities, mindfulness accompanying every waking moment, every waking thought. The heart feels buoyant and carefree, unconstrained by worldly responsibilities. The mind is constantly on the alert, earnestly focusing on its primary objective, the transcendence of dukkha. Such a sense of urgency becomes especially poignant when living far from the nearest settlement, at locations deep in remote forest areas teeming with all kinds of wild animals. In a constant state of readiness, the mind feels as though it's about to soar up and out of the deep abyss of the Kilesas at any moment, like a bird taking flight. In truth, the Kilesas remain ensconced there in the heart as always. It is the evocative forest atmosphere that tends to inspire this sense of liberation. Sometimes, due to the power of this favorable environment, a monk becomes convinced that his gilesas are diminishing rapidly with each passing day, while those remaining appear to be ever more scarce. This unfettered feeling is a constant source of support for the practice of meditation. A monk living deep in the forest tends to consider the wild animals living around him, both those inherently dangerous and those that are harmless, with compassion rather than with fear or apathy. He realizes that all animals, dangerous and harmless, are his equals in birth, aging, sickness, and death. We human beings are superior to animals merely by virtue of our moral awareness, our ability to understand difference between good and evil. Lacking this basic moral judgment, we are no better than common animals, Unknown to them, we label these creatures animals, even though the human species is itself a type of animal. The human animal is fond of labeling other species, but we have no idea what kind of label other animals have given to us. Who knows? Perhaps they have secretly labeled human beings ogres, since we are so fond of mistreating them, slaughtering them for their meat, or just for sport. It's a terrible shame the way we humans habitually exploit these creatures. Our treatment of them can be quite merciless. Even among our own kind, we humans can't avoid hating and harassing each other, constantly molesting or killing one another. The human world is troubled because people tend to molest and kill each other, while the animal world is troubled because humans tend to do the same to them. Consequently, animals are instinctively wary of human beings. Atsariyaman claimed that life in the forest provides unlimited opportunities for thought and reflection about one's own heart and its relation to many natural phenomena in the external environment. Anyone earnestly desiring to go beyond Dukkha can find plenty of inspiration in the forest, plenty of incentive to intensify his efforts, constantly. At times, groups of wild boars wandered into the area where Atsariyaman was walking in meditation. Instead of running away in panic when they saw him, they continued casually foraging for food in their usual way. He said they seemed to be able to differentiate between him and all the merciless ogres of this world, which is why they kept rooting around for food so casually, instead of running for their lives. Here, I would like to digress from the main story a little to elaborate on this subject. 
You might be tempted to think that wild boars were unafraid of Acharyaman because he was a lone individual living deep in the forest. But when my own monastery, Wat Bantad, was first established, and many monks were living together here, herds of wild boar took refuge inside the monastery, wandering freely through the area where the monks had their living quarters. At night they moved around unafraid, only a few yards from the monks' meditation tracks, so close that they could be heard snorting and thumping as they rooted in the ground. Even the sound of the monks calling to one another to come and see this sight for themselves failed to alarm the wild boars. Continuing to wander freely through the monastery grounds every night, boars and monks soon became thoroughly accustomed to each other. Nowadays, wild boars only infrequently wander into the monastery because ogres, as animals refer to us humans, according to Acharya Man, have since killed and eaten almost all the wild animals in the area. In another few years they probably will have all disappeared. Living in the forest, Atsariyaman met the same situation. Almost every species of animal likes to seek refuge in the areas where monks live. Wherever monks take up residence, there are always a lot of animals present. Even within the monastery compounds of large metropolitan areas, animals, especially dogs, constantly find shelter. Some city monasteries are home to hundreds of dogs, for monks never harm them in any way. This small example is enough to demonstrate the cool, peaceful nature of Tamma, a spirit of harmlessness that's offensive to no living creature in this world, except, perhaps, the most hard-hearted individuals. Atsariyaman's experience of living in the forest convinced him just how supportive that environment is to meditation practice. The forest environment is ideal for those wishing to transcend Dukkha. It is without a doubt the most appropriate battlefield to choose in one's struggle to attain all levels of tamma, as evidenced by the preceptor's first instructions to a newly ordained monk, go look for a suitable forest location in which to do your practice. Acharya Man maintained this ascetic observance to the end of his life, except on infrequent occasions when circumstances mitigated against it. A monk living in the forest is constantly reminded of how isolated and vulnerable he is, he can't afford to be unmindful. As a result of such vigilance, the spiritual benefits of this practice soon become obvious. Dwelling at the foot of a tree is a Dutanga observance that closely resembles living in the forest. Acharya Man said that he was dwelling under the shade of a solitary tree the day his chitta completely transcended the world, an event that will be fully dealt with later on. A lifestyle that depends on the shade of a tree for a roof and the only protection against the elements is a lifestyle conducive to constant introspection. A mind possessing such constant inner focus is always prepared to tackle the kilesas, for its attention is firmly centered on the four foundations of mindfulness, ropa, vedana, chitta, and tamma, and the four noble truths, dukkha, samudaya, nirotha, and magga. Together, these factors constitute the mind's most effective defense protecting it during its all-out assault on the kilesas. In the eerie solitude of living in the forest, the constant fear of danger can motivate the mind to focus undivided attention on the foundations of mindfulness, or the noble truths. In doing so, it acquires a solid basis for achieving victory in its battle with the kilesas. Such is the true path leading to the noble tamma. A monk who wishes to thoroughly understand himself, using a safe and correct method, should find an appropriate meditation subject and a suitable location that are conducive for him to exert a maximum effort. These combined elements will help to expedite his meditation progress immeasurably. Used as an excellent means for destroying kilesa since the Buddha's time, the Tutanga observance of dwelling at the foot of a tree is another practice meriting special attention. Staying in a cemetery is an ascetic practice which reminds monks and lay people alike not to be neglectful while they are still alive, believing that they themselves will never die. The truth of the matter is, we are all in the process of dying, little by little, every moment of every day. The people who died and were relocated to the cemetery, where their numbers are so great there is scarcely any room left to cremate or bury them, are the very same people who were dying little by little before, just as we are now. Who in this world seriously believes himself to be so unique that he can claim immunity from death? We are taught to visit cemeteries so that we won't forget the countless relatives with whom we share birth, aging, sickness, and death, 
so as to constantly remind ourselves that we too live daily in the shadow of birth, aging, sickness, and death. Certainly no one who still wanders aimlessly through the endless round of birth and death would be so uncommonly bold as to presume that he will never be born, grow old, become sick, or die. Since they are predisposed toward the attainment of freedom from this cycle by their very vocation, monks should study the root causes of the continuum of suffering within themselves. They should educate themselves by visiting a cemetery where cremations are performed, and by reflecting inwardly on the crowded cemetery within themselves, where untold numbers of corpses are brought for burial all the time. Such a profusion of old and new corpses are buried within their bodies that it's impossible to count them all. By contemplating the truly grievous nature of life in this world, they use mindfulness and wisdom to diligently probe, explore, and analyze the basic principles underlying the truth of life and death. Everyone who regularly visits a cemetery, be it an outdoor cemetery or the inner cemetery within their bodies, and uses death as the object of contemplation, can greatly reduce their smug sense of pride in being young, in being alive, in being successful. Unlike most people, those who regularly contemplate death don't delight in feeling self-important. Rather, they tend to see their own faults and gradually try to correct them. Instead of merely looking for and criticizing other people's faults, a bad habit that brings unpleasant consequences. This habit resembles a chronic disease that appears to be virtually incurable, or perhaps it could be remedied if people weren't more interested in aggravating the infection than they are in curing it. Or perhaps it could be remedied if people weren't more interested in aggravating the infection than they are in curing it. Cemeteries offer those interested in investigating these matters an opportunity to develop a comprehensive knowledge and understanding of the nature of death, Cemeteries are the great gathering places of the world. All people, without exception, must eventually meet there. Death is no small hurdle to be easily stepped over before a thorough investigation of the issue. Before they finally crossed over, the Lord Buddha and his Arahant disciples had to study in the great academy of birth, aging, sickness, and death until they had mastered the entire curricula. Only then were they able to cross over with ease. They had escaped the snares of Mara, unlike those who, forgetting themselves, disregard death and take no interest in contemplating its inevitability, even as it stares them in the face. Visiting cemeteries to contemplate death is an effective method for completely overcoming the fear of dying, so that when death seems imminent, courage alone arises, despite the fact that death is the most terrifying thing in the world. It would seem an almost impossible feat but it has been accomplished by those who practice meditation, the Lord Buddha and his Arahant disciples being the supreme examples. Having accomplished this feat themselves, they taught others to thoroughly investigate every aspect of birth, aging, sickness, and death, so that people wanting to take responsibility for their own well-being can use this practice to correct their misconceptions before it becomes too late. If they reach that great academy only when their last breath is taken, it will then be too late for remedial action. The only remaining options will be cremation and burial. Observing moral precepts, making merit, and practicing meditation will no longer be possible. Atsariyaman well understood the value of a visit to the cemetery, for a cemetery has always been the kind of place that encourages introspection. He always showed a keen interest in visiting cemeteries, both the external variety and the internal one. One of his disciples, being terrified of ghosts, made a valiant effort to follow his example in this. We don't normally expect monks to be afraid of ghosts, which is equivalent to Tamma being afraid of the world, but this monk was one such case. A Monk's Fear of Ghosts Atsariyaman related the story of a Tutanga monk who inadvertently went to stay in a forest located next to a charnel ground. He arrived on foot at a certain village late one afternoon, and, being unfamiliar with the area, asked the villagers where he could find a wooded area suitable for meditation. They pointed to a tract of forest, claiming it was suitable, but neglected to tell him that it was situated right on the edge of a charnel ground. They then guided him to the forest, where he passed the first night peacefully. On the following day he saw the villagers passing by carrying a corpse, which they soon cremated only a short distance from where he was staying. As he looked on, he could clearly see the burning corpse. He started to grow apprehensive the moment he saw the coffin being carried past, but he assumed that they were on their way to cremate the body somewhere else. Still, 
The mere sight of the coffin caused him considerable consternation as he thought ahead to the coming night. He was worried that the image of the coffin would haunt him after dark, making it impossible for him to sleep. As it turned out, he had camped on the edge of a charnel ground, so he was obliged to watch as the corpse was burned right in front of him. This sight upset him even more, causing him severe discomfort as he contemplated the prospect of having to spend the night there. Feeling very uneasy from the first sight of the corpse passing by, the feeling gradually intensified until he was so terrified that, by nightfall, he could hardly breathe. It's pitiful to think that a monk can be so terrified of ghosts. I am recording this incident here so that those of my readers having a similar fear of ghosts may reflect on the tenacity with which this monk strove to confront his fear head-on, and so take a valuable lesson from the past. Once all the villagers had gone home, leaving him alone, his torment began in earnest. He could not keep his mind focused on meditation, because whenever he closed his eyes to meditate, he saw a long line of ghosts moving toward him. Before long, ghosts hovered around him in groups, an image which frightened him so much that all presence of mind deserted him, throwing him into a panic. His fear began in mid-afternoon, at the first sight of the corpse. By the time darkness fell all around, his fear had become so intense he was just barely able to cope. Since ordaining as a monk, he had never experienced anything like this long struggle with visions of ghosts. At least he was mindful enough to begin reflecting. The fear, the ghosts, all of it may simply be a delusion. It is more likely that these haunting images of ghosts are creations of my own mind. As a Dutunga monk, he was expected to be steadfast and fearless when facing death, ghosts, or any other danger. So he reminded himself, People everywhere praise the fearless courage of Tutunga monks, yet here I am shamelessly afraid of ghosts. I'm acting like a total failure, as though I've ordained just to live in fear of ghosts and goblins without any rhyme or reason. I'm a disgrace to my fellow monks in the Tutunga tradition. I am unworthy of the admiration of people who believe we are noble warriors fearing nothing. How could I let this happen? Having reminded himself of the noble virtues expected of a Tutunga monk, and roundly criticizing himself for failing to live up to these high standards, he resolved that he would force himself to face the fear directly from then on. The corpse that smoldered before him on the funeral pyre being the cause of his fear, he decided to go there immediately. Putting on his robe, he started walking straight for the funeral pyre, which he saw clearly glowing in the darkness. But after a few steps, his legs tensed up and he could hardly move. His heart pounded, and his body began to perspire profusely, as though exposed to the midday sun. Seeing that this was not going to work, he quickly adjusted his tack. Starting with small, deliberate steps, he placed one foot just in front of the other, not allowing his forward motion to stop. By that time, he was relying on sheer strength of will to push his body forward. Frightened to death and shaking uncontrollably, he nevertheless kept his resolve to walk on, as though his life depended on it. Struggling the entire way, he eventually reached the burning corpse. But instead of feeling relieved that he had achieved his objective, he felt so faint he could barely stand. About to go crazy with fear, he forced himself to look at the partially burned corpse. Then, seeing the skull burned white from long exposure to the fire, he got such a fright that he nearly fainted straight away. Bravely suppressing his fear, he sat down to meditate just a short distance from the burning pyre. He focused on the corpse, using it as the object of his meditation, while forcing his terrified heart to mentally recite continuously, I am going to die, just like this corpse. There's no need to be afraid. I'm going to die some day, too. There's no point in being afraid. Sitting there, grappling with his fear of ghosts and forcing his heart to repeat this meditation on death, he heard a strange sound just behind him. The sound of approaching footsteps. The footsteps stopped, then started again, slow and cautious, as if someone was sneaking up to pounce on him from behind, or so he imagined at the time. His fear now reaching its peak, he was poised to jump up and run away, crying, Ghosts! Help! But he managed to control this impulse and waited, listening nervously as the footsteps slowly drew nearer then stopped a few yards away. Poised to run, he heard a strange sound, like someone chewing, loud and crunchy. 
This sent his imagination racing. What's it chewing on around here? Next it'll be chewing on my head. This cruel, heartless ghost is sure to mean the end of me. Unable to stand the suspense any longer, he decided to open his eyes. Should the situation look drastic, he was prepared to run for his life. A far better option than just letting some terrible ghost devour him. Escaping death now, he reasoned, will give me the chance to resume my practice later with renewed diligence, whereas I gain nothing by sacrificing my life to this ghost. With that, he opened his eyes and turned to look in the direction of the chewing, crunching sounds, all set to make a dash for his life. Peering through the darkness to catch a glimpse of the terrible ghost he had imagined, he saw instead a village dog, casually eating the scraps of food left by the villagers as offerings to the spirits as part of the local custom. It had come scrounging for something to fill its stomach, as hungry animals are wont to do, and it wasn't the least bit interested in him sitting there. Suddenly, realizing that it was only a dog, the monk laughed at his own folly. Turning his attention to the dog, which showed no interest in him whatsoever, he thought, So, you're the almighty spectre that nearly drove me crazy. You've taught me the lesson of my life. At the same time, he was deeply dismayed by his own cowardice. Despite my determination to confront my fears like a warrior, I was thrown into a panic as soon as I heard the sound of this dog scrounging for food, a mad Tutunga monk fleeing frantically for his life. It's a good thing I had enough mindfulness to wait that fraction of a second longer to discover the real cause of my fear. Otherwise, it would probably have driven me mad. God, am I really so grossly stupid as that? If so, do I deserve to continue wearing the yellow robes? the emblem of courage, for it denotes a disciple of the Lord Putta, whose superior courage transcends all comparison. Being this useless, should I still walk for alms, and thus desecrate the food that the faithful offer with such respect? What can I do now to redeem myself after such a despicable display of cowardice? Surely no other disciple of the Putta is as pathetic as I am. Just one inept disciple like myself is enough to weigh heavily on the sasana. Should there be any more... The burden would be enormous. How am I going to tackle this fear of ghosts that's just made me look so foolish? Hurry up! Take a stand right this minute. It is better to die now than to postpone this decision any longer. Never again can I allow this fear of ghosts to trample on my heart. This world has no place for a monk who disgraces himself and the religion he represents. With this self-admonition fresh in his mind, the monk made a solemn vow. I will not leave this place until I've overcome my fear of ghosts. If I have to die trying, then so be it. If I can't defeat this fear, then I don't deserve to continue living in such disgrace. Others might follow my bad example, becoming useless people themselves, thus further increasing the burden on the sasana. So he vowed to himself that, from that moment on, he would remain in that cemetery day and night, as a way of dealing sternly with his fear. He focused on the corpse before him, comparing it with his own body, seeing that they were both composed of the same basic elements. As long as consciousness is there in the heart to hold everything together, then that person, or that animal, continues to live. But as soon as consciousness departs, the whole combination of elements begins to disintegrate, and is then referred to as a corpse. It was clear that his notion about the dog being a ghost was shamefully absurd, so he resolved that he would never again lend any credence to thoughts of being haunted by ghosts. As this incident clearly showed, his mind simply haunted itself with ghostly apparitions, and his fear was the outcome of this self-deception. The misery he suffered arose from such faith in this delusion that a mere dog, harmlessly scrounging for food, almost became a matter of life and death. Recalling how deluded he had been for so long, trusting the self-deceptions that his mind constantly churned out, he thought, although they've always been at work, this is the first time they have brought me so close to catastrophe. Tamma teaches us that Sanya is the master of deception, but until now I've never clearly understood what that means. Only now, inhaling the stench of my own living death, do I understand its significance. My fear of ghosts is nothing more than Sanya's deceptive trickery. From now on, Sanya will never again trick me as it has in the past. I must stay put here in this cemetery until the master of deception is dead and buried, so that the specter of ghosts will not continue to haunt me in the future. Only then will I agree to leave here. Now it's my turn to torture to death this cunning, deceitful conjurer, 
Then cremated stinking corpse like that fleshly corpse I've just seen cremated here. Dealing a decisive blow to Sun Ya's insidious trickery, this is the only pressing matter in my life right now. The monk took up this challenge with such earnest resolve that whenever Sun Ya caused him to suspect a ghost was lurking somewhere around him, he immediately went to that spot, exposing the deception. For going sleep, he kept up this vigil throughout the night, until finally Sun Ya no longer had the strength to assert its assumptions. In the early hours of the evening, he had been engaged in a struggle with external ghosts, in the guise of the village dog which had nearly been his undoing. Later, when he understood the situation and became conscious of his error, he turned his attention inward, battling his inner ghosts into submission. Beginning the moment he became aware of his folly, his fear of ghosts subsided and ceased to trouble him for the rest of the night. On subsequent nights, he remained alert, ready to confront any hint of fear using the same uncompromising stance. Eventually, he transformed himself into a monk of incredible courage, in all circumstances. This whole experience had a profound and lasting impact on his spiritual development. His fear of ghosts gave rise to an outstanding lesson in Tamma, thus converting him into a truly authentic monk. I include this story in the biography of Acharya Man, in the hope that the reader will gain some valuable insights from it, just as I trust the story of Acharya Man's life will prove to be of great benefit to people everywhere. As can be seen from the above story, visiting cemeteries has always been an essential Tutanga practice. Wearing only the three principal robes is another Tutanga observance that Acharya Man followed religiously, from the day he first ordained until old age and declining health eventually forced him to relax his strict adherence somewhat. In those days, Dutanga monks rarely settled in one location for very long, except during the three months of the rainy season retreat. They wandered through forests and mountains, traveling by foot the whole way, since there were no automobiles back then. Each monk had to carry his own belongings, he could expect no help from others. For this reason, each monk took with him only as much as he could conveniently manage. Since it was awkward to be loaded down with too many things, only absolute essentials were taken. As time went on, this frugal attitude became an integral part of a monk's character. Should someone give him something extra, he would simply give it away to another monk to avoid accumulating unnecessary possessions. The true beauty of a Dutanga monk lies with the quality of his practice and the simplicity of his life. When he dies, he leaves behind only his eight basic requisites, the only true necessities of his magnificent way of life. While he's alive, he lives majestically in poverty, the poverty of a monk. Upon death, he is well gone with no attachments whatsoever. Human beings and devas alike sing praises to the monk who dies in honorable poverty, free of all worldly attachments. So the ascetic practice of wearing only the three principal robes will always be a badge of honor, complimenting Dutanga monks. Atsariya Man was conscientious in the way he practiced all the Dutanga observances mentioned above. He became so skillful and proficient with them that it would be hard to find anyone of his equal today. He also made a point of training the monks under his tutelage to train themselves using these same ascetic methods. He directed them to live in remote wilderness areas, places that were lonely and frightening, for example, at the foot of a tree, high in the mountains, in caves, under overhanging rocks, and in cemeteries. He took the lead in teaching them to consider their daily alms round a solemn duty, advising them to his chew food offered later. When Saleh devotees in the village became familiar with his strict observance of this practice, they would put all their food offerings into the monks' bowls, making it unnecessary to offer additional food at the monastery. He advised his disciples to eat all food mixed together in their bowls, and to avoid eating from other containers. And he showed them the way by eating only one meal each day until the very last day of his life. Wandering by stages across the northeast, Acharya Man gradually attracted increasing numbers of disciples at every new location along the way. When he stopped to settle in one place for some time, scores of monks gravitated to that area to live with him. Having set up a temporary monastic community in the forest, Sixty to seventy monks would gather there, while many more stayed close by in the surrounding area. Atsaryaman always tried to keep his disciples spread apart, living in separate locations that were not too close to one another, yet close enough to his residence so that they could easily seek his advice when they encountered problems in their meditation. This arrangement was convenient for all, for when too many monks are living in close proximity, 
it can become a hindrance to meditation. On the Uposatha observance days, when the Partimoka was recited, Dutanga monks came from various locations in his vicinity to assemble at his residence. After the recitation of the Partimoka, Atsaryaman addressed the whole assembly with a discourse on Tamma, and then answered the monks' questions, one by one, until their doubts cleared up and everyone was satisfied. Each monk then returned to his own separate location, buoyed by the exposition of Tamma he had just heard, and resumed his meditation practice with renewed enthusiasm. Although he sometimes had large groups of monks trying to train with him, he found them easy to supervise, because they were all prepared to put what he taught into practice for their own spiritual benefit. Monastic life under his tutelage was so orderly and quiet that the monastery often appeared deserted. Excepting meal times and times when the monks assembled for meetings, a visitor coming at any other hour wouldn't have seen the monks. The place would have looked deserted, with each monk having slipped into the dense forest to diligently pursue walking or sitting meditation in his own secluded spot, day and night. Acharyaman often assembled the monks in the evenings at about dusk to give a discourse on Tamma. As the monks sat together quietly listening, Acharyaman's voice was the only sound they heard. The rhythm of his voice articulating the essence of Tamma was at once lyrical and captivating. Carried along by the flow of his teaching, his audience completely forgot themselves, their weariness, and the time that passed. Listening, they were aware only of the flow of Tamma having an impact on their hearts, creating such a pleasant feeling that they could never get enough of it. Each of these meetings lasted many hours. Within the circle of Dutanga monks, listening to a Tamma discourse in this way is considered another form of meditation practice. Dutanga monks have an especially high regard for their teacher and his verbal instructions. He constantly guides and admonishes them to such good effect that they tend to view his teachings as the lifeblood of their meditation practice. Showing the utmost respect and affection for their teacher, they are even willing to sacrifice their lives for him. The Venerable Ananda is an excellent case in point. He had such unwavering affection for the Buddha that he was willing to sacrifice his life by throwing himself into the path of the wild, charging elephant that Devadatta had let loose in an attempt to kill the Buddha. In Acharyaman's case, Dutanga monks listened to his instructions with great reverence, enthusiastically taking them to heart. This was especially evident when he advised one of his monks to go live in a certain cave in order to give his practice new impetus. Monks singled out in this manner never objected, but faithfully followed his recommendations with genuine conviction, refusing to allow fear or concern for their safety become an issue. Instead, they were pleased, feeling that their practice was bound to be strengthened by living in the locations he recommended. This in turn infused them with determination to strive relentlessly both day and night. They were convinced that if Altariyaman suggested a certain location to them, then their efforts there were sure to be rewarded with good results, as though they had received an assurance of success from him in advance. This could be likened to the assurance that the Lord Putta gave to the Venerable Ananda just prior to his Parinibbana, when he told them that in three months' time his heart would be free from all gilesas. He was predicting that the Venerable Ananda was certain to attain enlightenment, becoming an arahant on the opening day of the first Sangha Council. It's obvious that devout obedience to the teacher is vitally important. It engenders an unwavering interest in practice, guards against carelessness and apathy, and so helps to anchor the basic principles of Tamma in the disciple's heart. It facilitates the establishment of a common understanding between teacher and disciple, so that instructions need not be repeated over and over until it becomes annoying and tiresome for both parties. Acharyaman's second trip to the northeast was a cause for much interest and excitement among monks and lay supporters throughout the region. During that period, he traveled extensively, teaching in almost all the northeastern provinces. He passed initially through Nakon Rajasima, then through Sisaket, Ubon Rajatani, Nakon Danom, Zagon Nakon, Udon Tani, Nongkai, Lue, Lomsak, and Pechabun, and occasionally crossed the Mekong River into Laos to visit Vientiane and Ta Kek. He crisscrossed these areas many times in those days, but he preferred to remain longer in provinces that were mountainous and thickly forested because they were especially suitable for meditation. For instance, south and southwest of the town of Zagon Nakon, there were many forest-covered mountain ranges, where he spent the rains retreat near the village of Pon Sawang in the district of Sawang Dandin. The mountainous terrain in this area is so conducive to the ascetic way of life that it is still frequented by Tutunga monks today. Monks wandering in such areas during the dry season usually slept out in the forest on small bamboo platforms. They were made by splitting sections of bamboo lengthwise, spreading them out flat, 
then securing them to a bamboo frame with legs, making a raised sleeping surface of about six feet long, three or four feet wide, and about one and a half feet above the ground. One platform was constructed for each monk and was spaced as far apart from another as the living area of the forest would allow. A large tract of forest allowed spacing of at least 120 feet with the thick foliage in between each platform acting as a natural screen. If the area was relatively small, or a large group of monks lived together in an area, then the spacing might be reduced to 90 feet intervals, though the minimum distance was usually 120 feet. The fewer the number of monks living in a particular area, the farther apart they were individually, being close enough to one another only to hear the distant sound of a cough or a sneeze. Local villagers helped each monk to clear a walking meditation track approximately 60 feet in length, which was located beside his sleeping platform. These tracks were used day and night for practicing meditation in a walking mode. When monks fearful of ghosts or tigers came to train under Atsariyaman, he usually made them stay alone, far from the rest of the monks, a severe training method designed to draw attention to the fear so that the monk could learn to come to grips with it. He was required to remain there until he became accustomed to the wilderness environment and inured to the tigers and ghosts that his mind conjured up to deceive him. The expectation was that, in the end, he would achieve the same good results as others who had trained themselves in this way. Then he wouldn't have to carry such a burden of fear indefinitely. Atariyaman believed this method accomplished better results than simply leaving a monk to his own devices, and to the very real prospect that he might never find the courage to face his fears. Upon arriving in a new location, a Tutanga monk had to first sleep on the ground, collecting various kinds of leaves, or in some places straw, to make a crude mattress. Atariyaman said that the months of December and January were especially difficult due to the prevailing seasonal weather patterns, as the approaching cold weather met and mixed with the outgoing rainy weather. When it did rain during the winter months, a monk inevitably got drenched. Sometimes it rained continuously all night, and the umbrella tent he used as a shelter was no match for the driving rain and high winds. Still, he had no choice but to sit shivering under this makeshift shelter, enduring the dank cold and unable to move, for it was impossible to see in the dark. A downpour during the daylight hours was not quite so bad. A monk still got wet, but at least he could see his surroundings and search for things in the forest to help shelter him from the elements without feeling totally blind. Essential items like his outer robe and his matches had to be kept in his alms bowl with the lid tightly secured. Folding his upper robe in half, he draped it around himself to keep out the cold and damp. The cloth mosquito net that hung from the suspended umbrella down to the ground formed a tent-like shelter that was indispensable for blocking out the windswept rain. Otherwise, everything got soaked and he had to endure the discomfort of having no dry robe to wear in the morning for alms round. The months of February, March, and April saw the weather change again as it began to heat up. Normally, Tutanga monks then moved up into the mountains, seeking out caves or overhanging cliffs to shelter them from the sun and the rain. Had they gone to these mountainous locations in December and January, the ground would still have been saturated from the rainy season, exposing them to the risk of malarial infection. Malarial fever was never easy to cure, Many months could pass before the symptoms finally went away. It could easily develop into a chronic condition, the fever recurring at regular intervals. This kind of chronic malaria was locally referred to as the fever the in-laws despise, for its victims can eat well enough, but they can't do any work because the fever is so debilitating. In such cases, not only the in-laws, but also everyone else became fed up. No effective remedies for malaria existed then, so those who caught it just had to let it run its course. I myself quite often suffered from such chastening fevers, and I too had to let them run their course, as we had no medicines to treat malaria in those days. Acharyaman used to say that most of the Dutanga monks he knew during that period had been infected with malaria, including himself and many of his disciples. Some even died of it. Listening to those accounts, one couldn't help feeling a profound sympathy for him and his monks. He nearly died before gaining the... Un he nearly died before gaining the necessary understanding to teach the way of Tumma to his disciples, so they too could practice following his example. Local Customs and Beliefs Earlier, before Acharya Man and Acharya Sao began wandering through the region to enlighten people about the nature of moral virtue and to explain the consequences of their actions and beliefs, the worship of spirits and ghosts had become endemic in the Northeast and a common aspect of everyday village life, whether it was planting the rice, putting in a garden, building a house, or making a shed, an auspicious day, month, and year had to be determined for the start of every endeavor. 
Before any type of work could begin, propitiatory offerings were routinely made to placate the local spirits. Should those ritual offerings be neglected, then the least untoward thing, a common cold or a sneeze, was attributed to incurring the disfavor of the spirits. A local spirit doctor was then called in to divine the cause and pacify the offended spirit. Doctors in those days were much smarter than they are today. They unhesitatingly declared that this spirit or that ghost had been wronged, claiming that a certain offering or sacrifice would cure everything. Even if the supplicant was hacking and sneezing long after offering the prescribed oblation, it made no difference. Back then, if the doctor declared you cured, you were, and you felt relieved despite the symptoms. This is the reason I can so boldly assert that both the doctors and the patients of that era were very smart. Whatever the doctor declared was final, and the patient accepted it without reservation. It was unnecessary to search for medical cures, since the spirit doctor and his ghosts could cure everything. Later, when Acharya Man and Acharya Sao passed through these areas, reasoning with local inhabitants and explaining the principles of truth, their preoccupation with the power of spirits and the agency of spirit doctors gradually waned. Today, it has virtually disappeared. Even many of the spirit doctors themselves began taking refuge in the Buddha, Tamma, and Sankha in place of the various spirits and ghosts that they had been worshipping. Nowadays, hardly anyone engages in such occult practices. Traveling from village to village in the northeast today, we no longer have to tread our way through offerings laid out for the spirits as we did in the past. Except for the odd group here or there, spirit worship is no longer an issue in people's lives. It's truly a blessing for this region that people no longer have to live their whole lives clinging to these beliefs. The people of the Northeast have long since transferred their faith and allegiance to the Buddha, Tamma, and Sankha, thanks largely to the compassionate efforts of Acharya Man and Acharya Sao, to whom we all owe an immense debt of gratitude. During his time in the region, Acharya Man taught the local people, applying all his strength and ability to render them as decent human beings. He passed through some villages where the local wise men asked him questions. They asked questions such as, Do ghosts really exist? Where do human beings come from? What is it that causes sexual attraction between men and women, since they have never been taught this? Why are male and female animals of the same species attracted to one another? From where did humans and animals learn this mutual attraction? Though I can't recall all the questions he was asked, these I do remember. I accept blame for any inaccuracies in what is recorded here, as my memory has always been somewhat faulty. Even recalling my own words and other personal matters, I cannot avoid making mistakes, so my recollection of Acharya Man's stories is bound to be incomplete. To the question, do ghosts really exist, Acharya Man's reply was, if something truly exists in the world, whether a spirit or anything else, it simply exists as it is. Its existence does not depend on the belief or disbelief of anyone. People may say that something exists or doesn't exist, but whether that thing actually exists or not is dependent entirely on its own nature. Its state does not alter according to what people imagine it to be. The same principle applies to ghosts, which people everywhere are skeptical about. In reality, those ghosts that frighten and torment people are actually creations of their own minds. They've come to believe that here and there dwell ghosts that will harm them. This in turn causes fear and discomfort to arise in them. Ordinarily, if a person doesn't mentally conjure up the idea of ghosts, he doesn't suffer from a fear of them. In a majority of cases, ghosts are just mental images created by those who tend to be afraid of them. As to whether there really are such things as ghosts in the world, even if I were to say they do exist, there is still not enough proof to make skeptics into believers, since people have a natural tendency to deny the truth. Even when a thief is caught red-handed with stolen articles, he will often refuse to admit the truth. More than that, he'll fabricate an alibi to get himself off the hook and deny any wrongdoing. He may be forced to accept punishment due to the weight of the evidence against him, but he will still continue to protest his innocence. When he is imprisoned, and someone asks him what he did wrong to deserve that punishment, he will quickly answer that he was accused of stealing, but insists that he never did it. It is rare for such a person to own up to the truth. Generally speaking, people everywhere have much the same attitude. To the question, where do human beings come from?, Atariyaman's reply was, All human beings have a mother and father who gave birth to them. Even you yourself were not born miraculously from a hollow tree. We all obviously have parents who gave birth to us and raised us, so this question is hardly an appropriate one. Were I to say that human beings are born of ignorance and craving, this would cause more confusion and misunderstanding than if I gave no answer at all. 
People have no knowledge whatsoever of what ignorance and craving are, although they are present there in every one, except, of course, in the Arahants. The trouble is, people are not interested enough to make the necessary effort for understanding these things, so that leaves the obvious answer. We are born of our parents. This, then, opens me up to the criticism that I've answered too briefly, but it is hard to give a reply which goes to the truth of the matter when the one asking the question is not really much interested in the truth to begin with. The Lord Buddha taught that both people and animals are born of avidja potsaya sankara samudayohoti. The ceasing of birth, which is the cessation of all dukkha, stems from avidjaya tolela asesa viraga nirotha sankara nirotho nirothohoti. This condition is inherent within the hearts of each and every person who has gilesas. Once the truth has been accepted, it becomes clear that it's just this which leads to birth as a human being or an animal until the world becomes so crowded one can hardly find a place to live. The primary cause is just this ignorance, an insatiable craving. Though we haven't even died yet, we are already searching for a place to be born into where we can carry on living, an attitude of mind that leads human beings and animals all over the world to birth and constant suffering. Anyone wishing to know the truth should take a look at the chitta that's full of the kind of kilesas which are frantically looking to affirm birth and life at all times. That person will undoubtedly find what he's looking for without having to ask anyone else. Such questions merely display a level of ignorance that indicates the inquirer is still spiritually inadequate. The chitta tends to be the most unruly, conceited thing in the world. If no interest is taken in reining it in, we will never become aware of how really stubborn it is, and all our noble hopes and aspirations will come to nothing. What is it that causes sexual attraction between men and women and animals of the same species, since they've never been taught this? Atsariyaman replied, Ragatanha is not to be found in any book, nor is it learned in school from a teacher. Rather, Ragatanha is a stubbornly shameless condition that arises and exists in the hearts of men and women, causing those who have this vulgar condition to come under its spell and become vulgar themselves, without ever realizing what's happening. Ragatanha makes no distinction between man, woman, or animal, nationality, social status, or age group. If it is strong, it can easily cause disaster in the world. If there is insufficient presence of mind to restrain it and keep it within acceptable limits, sexual craving will become like runaway flood water, overflowing the banks of the heart and spreading out to flood towns and cities, leaving ruin everywhere in its wake. Such a condition has always been able to thrive within the hearts of all living beings precisely because it receives constant nourishment and support, things which give it the strength to assert its suffocating influence continuously, sowing havoc and causing misery throughout the world. We hear only about floods occurring in towns and cities and how they cause destruction to people and their belongings. No one is interested in noticing the flood of Ragatanha engulfing the hearts of people who are quite content to let themselves and their belongings be ravaged by those surging floodwaters all year round. Consequently, no one understands the real reason for the ongoing deterioration of world affairs, because each and every person is contributing to and encouraging this situation by failing to recognize that Ragatanha is directly responsible for the worsening situation. If we do not focus our attention on the real cause, it will be impossible for us to find any genuine sense of contentment. The original question asked only about that aspect of Ragatanha concerning the attraction between people, completely ignoring the destruction instigated by Ragatanha through hatred and anger. But in his explanation, Acharya Man touched on the full range of detrimental results stemming from Ragatanha. He said that it is Ragatanha which dictates the passionate urges of men, women, and all the animals, facilitating the pleasure they find in each other's company. This is a principle of nature. Nothing other than this gives rise to mutual affection and mutual animosity. When Ragatanha uses its deceptive tricks for passionate ends, people fall in love. When it uses its deceptive tricks to bring forth hatred and anger, they inevitably hate, get angry, and harm each other. Should it wish to control people using love as a means, then people become so attracted to one another that there's no separating them. Should it wish those same people to fall under the influence of hatred and anger, then they'll feel an irresistible urge to do just that. Acharyaman asked the lay people present, Haven't you ever quarreled among yourselves? You husbands and wives who have been in love since before you were married? 
You asked me about it, but you should know a lot more about this matter than a monk does. To this they replied, Yes, we've quarreled until we are sick of it and never want to again, but still we have another argument. Atsariyaman then continued, You see, this is the very nature of the world. One moment there's affection, another moment there's friction, anger, and hatred. Even though you know it to be wrong, it's hard to correct. Have you ever seriously tried to correct this problem? If so, it shouldn't happen very often. Even a minimum effort should be enough to keep it under control. Otherwise, it's like eating three meals a day. In the morning you quarrel, in the afternoon you quarrel, and in the evening you quarrel, regularly around the clock. Some people even end up in divorce, allowing their children to be caught up in the conflagration as well. They are innocent, yet they too must bear the burden of that bad gamma. Everyone is affected by this blazing fire. Friends and acquaintances keep their distance due to the shame of it all. Assuming both parties are interested in settling the issue, they should be aware that an argument is a bad thing, stop as soon as it starts, and make an effort to correct it at that point. The matter can then sort itself out, so that in the future such problems don't recur. So that in the future such problems don't recur. For instance, when anger or aversion arises, first, think of the past you have shared together, and then, think of the future you will share living together for the rest of your lives. Now compare this to the malice that's just arisen. That should be enough to lay the matter to rest. Mostly, people who go astray do so because they insist on having their own way. Without considering whether they're right or wrong, they want to personally dominate everybody else in the family, something which just isn't possible to achieve. Such arrogance spreads and rages, singeing others until everyone is scarred. Even worse, they want to exert their influence over everyone else in the world, which is as impossible as trying to hold back the ocean with your hands. Such thoughts and actions should be strictly avoided. If you persist in them, they will bring your own downfall. People living together must adhere to and be guided by equitable standards of behavior when dealing with their husbands, wives, children, servants, or co-workers. This means interacting with them in a reasonable, harmonious way. Should others not accept the truth, it is they who are at fault for being so unreasonable, and it is they who will pay the price, not those who adhere firmly to guiding principles. On those occasions when Acharya Man had to teach large numbers of lay supporters, as well as the monks living with him, he would allot separate times for giving instruction. He instructed the laity from 4 to 5 p.m. He taught the monks and novices from 7 p.m. onwards, at the end of which they returned to their huts to practice meditation. He tended to follow this routine on his first and second tours of the northeast. On his third and final trip, after returning from Chiang Mai to Duan Thani, he changed this routine considerably. Rather than disrupt the sequence of events, I shall explain the adjustments he made later. Atsaryaman's chief concern was teaching monks and novices. He took a special interest in those students experiencing various insights in their meditation by calling them in for a personal interview. It's quite normal for those practicing meditation to have varying characters and temperaments, so the types of insights arising from their practice will vary accordingly, although the resulting cool, calm sense of happiness will be the same. Differences occur in the practical methods they employ and in the nature of insights that arise during meditation. Some meditators are inclined to know only things existing exclusively within their own minds. Others tend to know things of a more external nature, such as visions of ghosts or devas, or visions of people and animals dying right in front of them. They may see a corpse carried along and then dumped right in front of them, or they may have a vision of their own body lying dead before them. All such experiences are beyond the capability of beginning meditators to handle correctly with any certainty, since the beginner is unable to distinguish between what is real and what is not. People who are not inclined to analyze their experiences carefully may come to a wrong understanding, believing what they see to be genuine. This could increase the likelihood of psychological damage in the future. The type of person whose chitta tends to go out to perceive external phenomena when it converges into a state of calm is quite rare. At most, about one in twenty people. But there will always be someone in whom this occurs. It is crucial that they receive advice from a meditation master with expertise in these matters. Listening to Tutanga monks as they relate their meditation results to Acharya Man, and hearing him give advice on ways to deal with their experiences, was so moving and inspirational that everyone present became thoroughly absorbed in it. In explaining the proper method for dealing with visions, Acharyaman categorized different types of nimittas and explained in great detail how each type should be handled. The monks who listened were delighted by the tamma he presented, and so gained confidence, resolving to develop themselves even further. 
Even those who did not experience external visions were encouraged by what they heard. Sometimes the monks told Acharya Man how they had achieved a state of serene happiness when their hearts converged into a state of calm, explaining the methods they had used. Even those who were as yet unable to attain such levels became motivated to try, or to even surpass them. Hearing these discussions was a joyous experience, both for those who were already well developed and those who were still struggling in their practice. When the chitta converged into calm, some monks traveled psychically to the heavenly realms, touring celestial mansions until dawn, and only then did the chitta return to the physical body and regain normal consciousness. Others traveled to the realms of hell and were dismayed by the pitiful condition of the beings they saw, enduring the results of their kamma. Some visited both the heavenly abodes and the hells to observe the great differences between them. One realm was blessed with joy and bliss, while the other was in the depths of despair, the beings there tormented by a punishment that seemed to have no end. Some monks received visits from ethereal beings from various planes of existence, the heavens, for instance, or the terrestrial devas. Others simply experienced the varying degrees of calm and happiness coming from the attainment of samadhi. Some investigated, using wisdom to divide the body into different sections, dissecting each section to bits, piece by piece, then reducing the whole lot to its original elemental state. There were those who were just beginning their training, struggling as a child does when it first learns to walk. Some could not make the chitta attain the concentrated state of calm they desired, and wept at their own incompetence. And some wept from deep joy and wonder upon hearing Acharya Man discuss states of tamma they themselves had experienced. There were also those who were simply like a ladle in a pot of stew. Although submerged there, it doesn't know the taste of the stew, and even manages to get in the cook's way. This is quite normal when many different people are living together. Inevitably, both the good and the bad are mixed in together. A person having effective mindfulness and wisdom will choose to keep only those lessons which are deemed to be really useful, lessons essential to skillful practice. I regret that I cannot guarantee my own skillfulness in this matter. In fact, it's a problem we all face occasionally, so let's pass on and not worry about it. On his second trip, Acharya Man remained teaching in the Northeast for many years. Normally, he did not remain in the same place for more than a single rains retreat. When the rainy season was over, he wandered freely in the mountains and forests like a bird burdened only by its wings, contented to fly wherever it wishes. No matter where it lands in its search for food, a tree, a pond, or a marsh, it is satisfied and simply leaves all behind to fly off with no lingering attachment. It doesn't think that the trees, bark, fruit, ponds, or marshes belong to it. Like a bird, the monk who practices tamma, living in the forest, leads a life of contentment. But it's not easy to do, for people are social animals who enjoy living together and are attached to their homes and property. Initially, he feels a lot of resistance going out and living alone, as Acharya Man did all his life. It is sort of like a land animal being dragged into the water. Once his heart has become closely integrated with Tamma, however, the opposite is true. He enjoys traveling by himself and living alone. His daily routine in every posture remains entirely his own, his heart unencumbered by disturbing preoccupations. That leaves Tamma as his preoccupation, and Tamma promotes only contentment. The monk who is occupied solely with Tamma has a heart that's cheerful and wonderfully content. He is free from the kind of hindrances which cause dullness or confusion. He is empty of all defiling preoccupations. He basks in a full-fledged, natural inner peace, never having to worry that it might alter or diminish in any way. This is known as a galika tamma, tamma which exists beyond space and time. It exists in the heart that has completely transcended conventional reality, the source of all deception. Atsarya Man was one well gone, one completely contented in all his activities, Coming and going, sitting, standing, walking, or lying down, he remained completely contented. Although he led his disciples along this path, relatively few of the monks reached a high level of tamma. Yet even this small number is of great benefit to people everywhere. When Acharya Man led his disciples on alms round, he took various animals along the way as objects of contemplation, and combining them with his inner tamma, he skillfully taught the monks who were with him. They clearly heard his every word. This was his way of teaching his disciples to be aware about the laws of Gamma, in that even animals must receive the results of their actions. He would just point out an animal they came across as an example.
Atsariyaman insisted that animals should not be looked down upon for their lowly birth. In truth, animals have reached their time in the perpetual cycle of birth and death, experiencing the results of a past kamma. So it is with human birth as well. In fact, both animal life and human life consist of a mixture of pleasure and pain, each living according to the consequences of their own individual kamma. In one respect, Acharyaman brought up the subject of animals such as chickens, dogs, or cattle, simply out of compassion for their plight. In another respect, he wanted to make others understand the variations in the consequences of kamma, indicating that, just as we have been brought to human birth by certain types of kamma, we too have passed through uncountable previous births of all sorts. Finally, he reflected aloud upon the very mysterious nature of those things that are responsible for birth as an animal, things that are difficult to fathom, despite their presence in everyone. If we are unskillful in solving these problems, they will always be a danger to us, and we will never find a way to go beyond them. On almost every alms round, Atsariya Mun spoke in this manner about the animals or the people whom he encountered along the way. Those who were interested in investigating these themes stimulated their mindfulness and wisdom, gaining useful ideas from him in this way. As to those who were not interested, they did not gain any benefit. Some probably wondered who he was talking about, since the monks had moved on by then, and the animals he spoke about were no longer present. In some of the northeast provinces, Atsariyaman would give Tamma instructions to the monks late at night on special occasions. Visible to Atsariyaman, terrestrial devas gathered at a respectful distance and listened to his talks. Once he became aware of them, he called off the meeting and quickly entered Samati, where he talked privately to the devas. Their reticence on those occasions was due to the profound respect they had for monks. Acharyaman explained that devas of all levels were careful to avoid passing by the monks' dwellings on the way to see him late at night. Upon arriving, they circled around Acharyaman three times before sitting down in an orderly fashion. Then the leader, devas of every plane have a leader whom they obey with great deference, would announce the realm from which they came and the aspect of tamma to which they wished to listen. Atsariyaman would return their greetings, and then focus his chitta on that aspect of tamma requested by the devas. As this tamma arose within, he began the talk. When they had comprehended the tamma that he delivered, they all said sa tu three times, a sound that echoed throughout the spiritual universe. This exclamation was heard by everyone with celestial hearing, but not by those whose ears were like the handles on a pot of soup. When his discourse on tamma ended, the devas again circumambulated him three times, keeping him on their right, and then returned to their realms in an elegant fashion, very different from we humans. Not even Acharyaman and his monks could emulate their graceful movements, for there's a great difference between the grossness of our bodies and the subtle refinement of theirs. As soon as the deva guests retreated to the edge of the monks' area, they floated up into the air like pieces of fluff blown by the wind. On each visit they descended in the same manner, arriving outside the monks' living area, and then walking the remainder of the way. Always very graceful in their movements, they never spoke making a lot of noise the way humans do when going to see an Acharya they revere. This is probably due to the refined nature of their celestial bodies, which restrict them from behaving in such a gross manner. Here is an area in which human beings can be considered superior to devas, talking loudly. Devas are always very composed when listening to Tamma, never fidgeting restlessly or showing any conceit that could disturb the speaking monk. Acharyaman usually knew beforehand when the devas would be arriving. For instance, if they were planning to come at midnight, by early evening he was aware of it. On some occasions he had to cancel a scheduled meeting with the monks for that evening. At the appropriate hour, Acharyaman left his walking meditation path and sat entering Samati until the time approached for the day was to come. He then withdrew his chitta up to the access level, sending out the flow of his chitta to see if they had arrived. If they had yet to arrive, he continued with his samadhi practice before sending his chitta out again to check. Sometimes the devas had already arrived or were just in the process of arriving. At other times he had to wait, continuing his samadhi practice for some time before they came. On rare occasions, when he knew that they would be arriving late, like at one, two, or three a.m., he would practice for a while and then take a rest, getting up to ready himself just before the devas were expected to arrive. Gatherings of devas who came to see Atsariyaman did not happen very often, nor in very large numbers while he lived in the northeast. They came only infrequently, to listen in on his talks to the monks. But when they did, he would dismiss the monks as soon as he became aware of their presence, entering quickly into Samati to expound on Tamma for the devas' benefit. 
After he finished, and the day of us had departed, he would lie down to rest, arising in the morning as usual to continue his normal routine of practice. Acharyaman considered receiving Deva's a special responsibility. Since honoring one's promises is very important to them, he was always careful to be punctual. They were likely to be critical of a monk who missed an appointment unnecessarily. Discussions between Devas and monks are carried on entirely in the universal language of the heart, bypassing the multitude of conventional languages used by human beings and other types of animals. Arising from the citta, the substance of the inquiries turns into questions in the language of the heart, which the inquiring individual clearly understands as if they were words in conventional language. Each word or phrase of the respondent emanates directly from the heart, so the questioner in turn understands the reply perfectly well. In fact, the language of the heart directly conveys the true feelings of the speaker, eliminating the need for explanations to clarify further, as might be required in conventional languages. Verbal communication is also a mechanism of the heart, but its nature is such that spoken words often do not reflect the heart's true feelings, so mistakes are easily made in communicating its true intent. This incongruity will remain, so long as conventional language is used as a surrogate medium for the heart's expression. Since people are unfamiliar with the language of the heart, their hearts cannot avoid using normal speech as a mechanism to facilitate communication, even though it's not very accurate in expressing the heart's true meaning. There is no possible way to solve this common dilemma, unless people learn the heart's own language and expose its mysteries. Acharya Mun was extremely proficient in all matters pertaining to the heart, including the skills needed to train others to become good people. The rest of us, though we are quite capable of thinking of these things for ourselves, insist on going around borrowing from others. That is, we tend to constantly travel from place to place studying under one teacher and then another. Even then, we fail to properly safeguard what we've learned, letting it slip through our grasp by forgetting what the teacher said. Thus we are left virtually empty-handed. The things we do not forget or let drop are our habitual failings, a lack of mindfulness, wisdom, and contemplative skill. Lacking the very qualities of tamma which instill a sense of hope in our lives, we are constantly disappointed in whatever we do in life. Acharyaman's own meditation practice, as well as his teaching duties, continued to progress smoothly, any undue disturbances having long since passed. Wherever he went, he brought a refreshing calm and serenity with him. Monks and novices everywhere respected and revered him. As soon as the laity in an area heard of his arrival, they were delighted and rushed to pay him their respects with heartfelt devotion. A case in point is Bantum village in the district of Ta Kek, where both Acharyaman and Acharya Sao resided at one time or another. Shortly before Acharyaman arrived, the entire village began suffering from smallpox. The villagers were overcome with joy at the sight of Acharyaman's arrival, running out of their homes to welcome him and begging him to remain as their refuge. So, in place of the spirits the whole village had been worshipping, Acharyaman had them take refuge in the Buddha, Tamma, and Sankha. He guided them in the correct way to practice, such as paying daily homage to the Buddha and performing morning and evening chanting, and they gladly followed his instructions. As for Acharyaman, he performed a kind of internal spiritual blessing to help them, and the results were strange and marvelous to witness. Before his arrival, many people died each day from the smallpox, but from his arrival onwards... No one else died, and those who were infected quickly recovered. More than that, no new instances of the disease occurred, which astounded the villagers who had never seen or imagined such a miraculous reversal of circumstances. As a result, the community developed enormous faith in and devotion to Acharyaman, which have persisted undiminished through each generation to the present day. This includes the local monastery's present-day abbot, who has a deep respect for Acharyaman. He always raises his joined palms in homage before beginning to speak about him. Incidents such as this were made possible by the power of Tamma in Acharyaman's heart, which radiated forth to give comfort and happiness to the world. Acharyaman said that he set aside three times each day to extend loving kindness to all living beings. He would do this while sitting in meditation at midday, before retiring in the evening, and after rising in the morning. In addition to that, there were many times during the day when he sent loving-kindness out specifically to certain individuals. When radiating all-encompassing loving-kindness, he did so by focusing his citta exclusively inward, and then directing the flow of his citta to permeate through all the worlds, both above and below, in all directions without interruption. At that time, 
his chitta had the power to extend its aura of brilliance to all worlds, limitless, all-pervasive, and brighter than a thousand suns, for there is nothing brighter than a heart that's entirely pure. The unique properties emanating from a chitta of such purity brighten the world and imbue it with peacefulness in an indescribable and wondrous way. A chitta having absolutely no impurities possesses only the cool, peaceful qualities of tamma. A compassionate, kind-hearted monk with an absolutely pure heart can expect protection and reverential devotion from people and devas wherever he stays, while members of the animal kingdom feel no fear or danger in his presence. His chitta constantly sends forth a gentle compassion to all beings everywhere without bias, much like rain falling evenly over hills and valleys alike. Hardship and Deprivation Upon leaving the province of Ubon Rachatani, Acharyaman spent the next rainy season retreat at the village of Ban Nong Lat, in the Warichabum district of Sokon Nakon province, accompanied by the many monks and novices under his guidance. The laymen and women there reacted as if a truly auspicious person had arrived. They were all very excited, not in a frenzied way, but in an anticipatory way. But in an anticipatory way, at the prospect of doing good and abandoning evil. They abandoned their worship of spirits and ghosts to pay homage to the Buddha, Tamma, and Sangha. At the end of the rains, Acharyaman went wandering again, until he arrived in the province of Udon Thani, where he travelled through the districts of Nong Bua Lampu and Ban Peo. He stayed at the village of Ban Ko for the He stayed at the village of Ban Ko for the rains retreat while spending the following rains in the Tabo district of Nong Kai province. He remained practicing for some time in both these provinces. As mentioned previously, Acharyaman lived mostly in wilderness areas where villages were spaced far apart. Since the countryside was relatively unpopulated then, he could easily put the teaching into practice. Virgin forests abounded, full of great, tall trees which were still uncut. Wild animals were everywhere. As soon as night fell, their myriad calls could be heard echoing through the forest. Listening to such sounds, one is carried away by a sense of camaraderie and friendliness. The natural sounds of wild animals are not a hindrance to meditation practice, for they carry no specific meaning. The same cannot be said for human sounds. Be it chatting, singing, shouting, or laughing, the specific meaning is immediately obvious, and it is this significance that makes human sounds a hindrance to meditation practice. Monks are especially vulnerable to the sounds of the opposite sex. If their samadhi is not strong enough, concentration can easily be destroyed. I must apologize to women everywhere, because my intention here is not to criticize women in any way. It is the unsuccessful meditator that I am addressing here, so that he may arouse mindfulness as an antidote to counter these influences and not merely surrender meekly to them. It's possible that one reason monks prefer to live in mountains and forests is that it allows them to avoid such things, in order to relentlessly pursue the perfection of spiritual qualities until they reach the ultimate goal of the holy life. Acharyaman enjoyed living in forests and mountains right up until the day he passed away, a preference which helped him attain the tamma he has so generously shared with all of us. Acharyaman said that if his meditation practice were compared to an illness, it would be a near fatal one, since the training he undertook resembled physical and mental torture. There was hardly a single day when he could just relax, look around, and enjoy himself, as other monks seemed to do. This was because the Kileses became tangled up with his heart so quickly that he barely had a chance to catch them. Should his mind wander for only a moment, the Kileses immediately gave him trouble. Once they had established a hold on his heart, their grip became ever tighter until he found it difficult to dislodge them. Consequently, he could never let his guard down. He had to remain totally alert, always ready to pounce on the Kileses, so they couldn't gain the strength to bind him into submission. He practiced diligently in this manner until he had gained sufficient contentment to be able to relax somewhat. Only then did he develop the strength of heart and ease of body necessary to teach others. From that time forward, monks, novices, and lay people from all over the northeast sought him out. Acharyaman understood their situation and was very sympathetic toward them all. At certain times, so many people came to see him that there wasn't enough room for them to stay. He also had to consider the safety of others, such as the women and nuns who came to visit him, for in those days many tigers and other wild animals were in the outlying areas, but there were very few people. 
Atsar Yaman once stayed in a cave near Ban Nami Nayung village in the Ban Peo district of Udon Tani province. Since many large tigers frequented the area around the cave, it was definitely not a safe place for visitors to remain overnight. When visitors came, Atsar Yaman had the villagers build a very high bamboo platform, high enough to be beyond the reach of any hungry tiger which might try to pounce upon the sleeping person. Atsar Yaman forbade the visitors to come down to the ground after dark, fearing that a tiger would carry them off and devour them. He told them to carry up containers for their toilet needs during the night. With so many vicious tigers there at night, Atsar Yaman refused to allow visitors to stay long. He sent them away after a few days. These tigers were not afraid of people, especially not of women, and would attack if given the opportunity. On some nights, when Atsar Yaman was walking in meditation by the light of candle lanterns, he saw a large tiger boldly stalk a buffalo herd as it went past his area. The tiger had no fear of Atsar Yaman as he paced back and forth. Sensing the tiger, the buffaloes instinctively headed for the village. Nevertheless, the tiger was still bold enough that it continued to follow them, even while a monk walked close by. Monks who trained under Atsar Yaman had to be prepared for anything, including the possibility of death, for danger was all around the various places where they practiced. They also had to give up any pride in their own self-worth and any sense of superiority regarding their fellow monks, thus allowing for a harmonious living situation as if they were different limbs on the same body. Their hearts then experienced a measure of contentment, and, untroubled by mental hindrances, their samadhi quickly developed. When a monk is constrained by living under certain restrictions, for example, living in a frightening place where the food is limited and the basic requisites are scarce, his mental activity tends to be supervised by mindfulness, which continually restricts the thinking process to the matter at hand. The citta is usually able to attain samadhi faster than would normally be expected. Outside there is danger and hardship. Inside, mindfulness is firmly in control. In such circumstances, the citta might be compared to a prisoner who submits willingly to his fate. In addition to these factors, the teacher is also there to straighten him out should he go astray. The monk who practices while hemmed in by hardship on all sides will see an improvement in his citta that exceeds all expectations. Nighttime in the forest is a frightening time, so a monk forces himself to go out and do walking meditation to fight that fear. Who will win and who will lose? If fear loses, then the citta becomes courageous and converges into a state of calm. If the heart loses, then the only thing that emerges is intense fear. The effect of intense fear in such a situation is the sensation of simultaneously being both hot and cold, of needing to urinate and defecate, of feeling breathless and being on the verge of death. The thing that encourages fear is the sound of a tiger's roar. The sound of roaring may come from anywhere, from the foot of the mountain, from up on the ridge or from out on the plains, but the monk will pay no attention to the direction. He will think only, A tiger is coming here to devour me! Walking all alone in meditation, and so afraid that he's shaking and useless, he is sure that it's coming specifically for him. Not considering the broad terrain, it doesn't occur to him that the tiger has four feet and might just be going somewhere else. His only thought is that the tiger is coming straight for his tiny plot of land, straight for this cowardly monk who is shaken by fear. Having completely forgotten his meditation practice, he has only one thought in mind which he repeats over and over again like a mantra. The tiger's coming here. The tiger's coming here. This negative train of thought merely intensifies his fear. The tumma in his heart is ready to disintegrate, and if, perchance, the tiger really were to wander accidentally into that place, he'd stand there mindlessly scared stiff at best. And at worst, something very unfortunate could happen. It's wrong to establish the citta with such a negative attitude. The ensuing results are bound to be harmful in some way. The correct approach is to focus the citta firmly on some aspect of tamma, either the recollection of death or some other tamma theme. Under such circumstances, one should never allow the mind to focus outward to imagine external threats and then bring those notions back in to deceive oneself. Whatever happens, life or death, one's attention must be kept squarely on the meditation object that one normally uses. A chitta having tamma as its mainstay doesn't lose its balance. Moreover, despite experiencing intense fear, the chitta is clearly strengthened 
becoming courageous in a way that's amazing beyond description. Acharya Man taught his disciples that becoming firmly established in the practice means putting everything on the line, both body and mind. Everything must be sacrificed, except that aspect of tamma which is the fundamental object of attention. Whatever occurs, allow nature to take its course. Everyone who is born must die. Such is the nature of this world. There's no point in trying to resist it. Truth cannot be found by denying the natural order of things. Acharya Man taught that a monk must be resolute and brave in the face of death. He was particularly interested in having his disciples live in isolated wilderness areas infested with wild animals, so that they could discover the virtues of meditation. Such places encourage the development of samadhi and intuitive wisdom. Tigers can definitely help to stimulate tamma in our hearts, especially if we don't stand in awe of the Lord Buddha because we fail to trust his teaching, but we do stand in awe of tigers because we are convinced of how vicious they can be. This conviction is a very effective aid for corralling the mind and focusing it on tamma, using fear as an incentive to meditate until tamma arises within. Consequently, when that inner tamma is finally realized, belief in the Lord Buddha and the tamma he taught will arise naturally. At that critical moment, when one is alone in the wilderness, dormant faculties of samadhi and wisdom will be stirred into action. If there is nothing to put pressure on the citta, it tends to become lazy and emasculates until it can barely function. A tiger can help to remove those kilases which foster such a lazy and easy-going attitude that we forget ourselves in our own mortality. Once those insidious defilements disappear, we feel a sense of genuine relief, whatever we do, for our hearts no longer shoulder that heavy burden. Acharya Man emphasized that monks should go to practice meditation in places that arouse fear, and avoid places that do not. Otherwise, they were unlikely to achieve any strange and marvelous results. More than that, the kilesas might well lead them so far astray that they end up losing sight of the spiritual path, which would be regrettable. He assured his monks that unless they lived in an environment which forced them to focus internally on themselves, they would find it difficult to attain a stable state of calm, and their meditation practice would suffer accordingly. On the other hand, the results were bound to be good in places where they were always alert to the possibility of danger, since mindfulness, the skillful means for directing the effort, was inevitably close at hand. No one who genuinely hopes to transcend dukkha should succumb to the fear of death while living in what are imagined to be frightening places, like remote wilderness areas. When faced with a real crisis situation, the focus of attention should be kept on tamma and not sent outside of the sphere of one's own body and mind, which are the dwelling place of tamma. Then the meditator can expect to experience a pervading sense of security and an inspired mental fortitude that are incontrovertible. In any case, unless that person's gamma dictates that his time is up, he will not die at that time, no matter what he thinks. Acharya Man said that it Acharya Man said that his inspiration for meditation was derived almost exclusively from living in dangerous environments, which is why he liked to teach his disciples to be resolute in threatening situations. Instead of merely relying on something vague like inherent virtuous tendencies, which are usually more a convenient fiction than a reality, in this way they had a chance to realize their aspirations in the shortest possible time. Relying on the rather vague concept of virtuous tendencies from the past is usually a sign of weakness and resignation, an attitude more likely to suppress mindfulness and wisdom than to promote them. To say a monk has confidence that Tamma is the basic guarantor of his life and practice means that he sincerely hopes to live and die by Tamma. It is imperative that he not panic under any circumstance. He must be brave enough to accept death while practicing diligently in fearful places. When a crisis looms, no matter how serious it seems, mindfulness should be in continuous control of his heart so that it stays steadfastly firm and fully integrated with the object of meditation. Suppose an elephant, a tiger, or a snake threatens him. If he sincerely resolves to sacrifice his life for the sake of tamma, those things won't dare to cause him any harm. Having no fear of death, he will experience the courageous feeling that he can walk right up to those animals. Instead of feeling threatened, he will feel deep within his heart a profound friendship toward them, which dispels any sense of danger. 
As human beings, we possess tumma in our hearts, in a way that animals do not. For this reason, our hearts exert a powerful influence over animals of all types. It makes no difference that animals are incapable of knowing this fact. There exists in our hearts a mysterious quality that has a soothing effect on them. This quality is the potent, protective power of tumma, which softens their hearts to the point where they don't dare act threateningly. This mysterious power of the heart is something experienced internally by the individual. Others can be aware of it only if they have special intuitive knowledge. Even though tamma is taught and studied all over the world, it still remains a mystery if the heart has yet to attain any level of understanding in tamma. When the heart and tamma truly become one, all doubts concerning the heart and tamma disappear on their own, because the nature of the heart and the nature of tamma share the same exquisite, subtle qualities. Once that state is reached, it is correct to say that the heart is tamma and tamma is the heart. In other words, all contradictions cease once the kilesas have been eliminated. Normally, the heart has become such an extension of the kilesas that we are unaware of its intrinsic value. This happens because the heart is so thoroughly impregnated with kilesas that the two become indistinguishable. The heart's real value is then obscured from view. If we allow this condition to continue indefinitely because we are indifferent about finding a solution, neither our hearts nor tamma will have any actual value for us. Even were we to be born and die hundreds of times, it would simply be a matter of exchanging one set of dirty clothes for another set of dirty clothes. No matter how many times we change in and out of dirty clothes, we cannot escape the fact that we remain filthy which is certainly very different from someone who takes off his dirty clothes and exchanges them for nice clean ones. Similarly, the interchange between good and evil within the heart is an important problem that each of us should take personal responsibility for and investigate within ourselves. No one else can carry this burden for us and so give us peace of mind. It's extremely important that each and every one of us be aware that, in both the present and the future, we alone are responsible always for our own progress. The only exceptions are those like the Lord Buddha and the Arahant disciples, who carefully developed themselves spiritually until they attained a state of total security. For them, the job is completed, the ultimate goal secure. These are the noble individuals that the rest of us take as our refuge, providing us hope for the future. Even miscreants who still understand the difference between right and wrong will take the Buddha, Tamma, and Sangha as their refuge. They at least have enough sense to feel some remorse. Just as good people and bad people alike feel a natural dependence on their parents, so people of all kinds instinctively look to the Buddha as a dependable refuge. Acharya Man employed many training methods with his monks to ensure that they saw clear results in their practice. Those who practiced with unwavering faith in his instructions were able to achieve such results to their own satisfaction. By following the power of his example, they became knowledgeable, respected teachers themselves. They in turn have passed on these training methods to their own disciples, so that they too can witness for themselves, through their own efforts, that the paths and fruits of the Buddha's teaching are still attainable today, that they have not completely disappeared. When looking at the life he lived, and the methods he employed in training others, it is fair to say that Acharyaman followed a practice of deprivation. He and his disciples lived in conditions of virtual poverty in places where even the basic necessities were lacking. The simple daily requisites they depended on were usually in short supply. Encountering such an uncertain existence, those accustomed to living in carefree abundance would probably be utterly dismayed. There being nothing in this difficult lifestyle to attract them, they would surely find it most disagreeable. But the monks themselves, though they lived like prison inmates, did so voluntarily for the sake of tamma. They lived for tamma, and accepted the inconvenience and hardship associated with its practice. These conditions, which are seen as torture by people who have never submitted to them, were actually a convenient spiritual training ground for the monks who practiced in this way. Due to their determination to endure hardship and poverty, it is appropriate to call this the practice of deprivation, for such living conditions naturally go against the grain. Monks had to literally force themselves to live in this way. During all their normal daily activities, they were required to resist the physical and mental pressure to simply follow their natural inclinations. Sometimes it was necessary to endure days of fasting and hunger for the purpose of accelerating the practice of meditation. These periods, when monks abstain from food altogether despite their hunger, are days of uninterrupted dedication to the practice. 
The physical discomfort at such times is obvious, but the purpose of enduring hunger is to increase mental vigilance. In truth, fasting is a very suitable method for certain temperaments. Some types of people find that if they eat food every day, their bodies tend to be vigorous, but the mental endeavor, meditation, fails to progress. Their minds remain sluggish, dull, and timid, so a solution is needed. One solution is to try either reducing the intake of food each day or going without food altogether. Fasting, sometimes for a few days, sometimes for a longer period, and carefully observing all the while the method that gives the best results. Once it becomes apparent that a certain method is suitable, that method should be pursued intensively. For instance, should a monk discover that fasting for many days at a stretch is suitable to his temperament, then it's imperative that he accept the necessity of following that path. Though it may well be difficult, he must put up with it, because he inevitably wants to gain the appropriate knowledge and skill to go beyond dukkha. A person whose temperament is suited to long-term fasting will notice that the more he fasts, the more prominent and courageous his heart is in confronting the various objects of the senses that were once his enemies. His mental attitude is bold, his focus sharp. While sitting in samadhi, his heart can become so absorbed in tamma that it forgets the time of day. For when the heart contacts tamma, there is no longer any concern with the passage of time or pangs of hunger. At that time, he is aware only of the delight experienced at that level of tamma which he has achieved. In this frame of mind, the conditions are right for catching up with kilesas such as laziness, complacency, and restlessness, since they are inactive enough then for the meditator to get the better of them for the time being. If we hesitate, waiting around for a more auspicious time to tackle them, the kilesas will awaken first and give us more trouble. If we hesitate, waiting around for a more auspicious time to tackle them, the kilesas will awaken first and give us more trouble. It's quite likely we'd be unable to handle them then. We could easily end up being elephants for the kilesas as they mount us, straddle our necks, and beat us, our hearts, into submission. For in truth, our hearts have been the elephants and the kilesas the mahouts for an infinitely long time. A deep-rooted fear of this master makes us so apprehensive that we never really dare to fight back with the best of our abilities. From the Buddha's perspective, the kilesas are the enemies of tamma. Yet from the vantage point of the world, the kilesas are considered our heart's inseparable companions. It is incumbent upon us, who practice the Buddha's teaching, to battle the thoughts and deeds that are known to be our enemies, so that we can survive their onslaught, and thus become free of their insidious control. On the other hand, those who are satisfied to follow the kilesas have no choice but to pamper them, dutifully obeying their every command. The repercussions of such slavery are all too obvious in the mental and emotional agitation affecting those people and everyone around them. Inevitably, the kilesas cause people to suffer in a multitude of harmful ways, making it imperative for someone sincerely caring about his own well-being to fight back diligently using every available means. If this means abstaining from eating food and suffering accordingly, then so be it. One has no regrets. If necessary, even life itself will be sacrificed to honor the Buddha's teaching, and the kilesas will have no share in the triumph. In his teachings, Acharyaman encouraged his monks to be courageous in their efforts to transcend the dukkha oppressing their hearts. He himself had thoroughly investigated the kilesas and tamma, testing both in a most comprehensive fashion before he finally saw the results emerge clearly in his own heart. Only after this attainment did he return to the northeast to teach the incomparable tamma that he then understood so well. One prominent aspect of Acharyaman's teaching, which he stressed continuously during his career, was the tamma of the five powers, faith, diligent effort, mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom. He said the reason for emphasizing these five factors was that a person who possessed them would always have something worthwhile to count on, no matter where he went, and therefore he could always expect to make steady progress in his practice. Atsaryaman separated them according to their specific functions, using them to inspire an indomitable spirit in his disciples. He gave them his own heartfelt interpretation as follows. Sadta is faith in the tamma that the Lord put to present it to the world. There is no doubt that each of us in this world is perfectly capable of receiving the light of tamma, 
provided we practice the way in earnest. We all accept the fact that we will have to die some day. The key issue is, will we die defeated by the cycle of Gilesas and the cycle of Gamma and its results? Or will we overcome them, defeating them all before we die? No one wants to be defeated. Even children who compete at sports are keen on winning. So we should rouse ourselves and not act as if defeated already. The defeated must always endure suffering and anguish, accumulating so much dukkha that they cannot find a way out. When they do seek escape from their misery, the only viable solution seems to be, it's better to die. Death under those conditions is precisely defeat at the hands of one's enemy. It is a result of piling up so much dukkha inside that there's no room for anything else. Positive results cannot be gained from abject defeat. If we are to die victorious, like the Lord Putta and the Arahants, then we must practice with the same faith, effort, and forbearance as they did. We must be mindful in all our bodily and mental activities, as they were. We must take our task very seriously, and not waver uncertainly, like someone facing a crisis without mindfulness to anchor him. We should establish our hearts firmly in those causes that give rise to the satisfactory results that the Buddha himself attained. The sasana is the teaching of a great sage, who taught people that they too can develop wisdom in all its many aspects. So we should reflect on what he taught. We should not wallow in stupidity, living our whole lives in ignorance. No one considers the word stupid to be a compliment. Stupid people are no use. Adults, children, even animals. If they are stupid, they are hardly any use at all. So if we remain stupid, who is going to admire us for it? We should all analyze this matter thoroughly to avoid remaining bogged down in ignorance. Wallowing in ignorance is not the way to overcome dukkha, and it is definitely not becoming for a Dutanga monk who is expected to skillfully analyze everything. This was Acharya Man's own personal interpretation of the five powers. He used it effectively in his own practice and taught it to his disciples as well. It is excellent instruction for inspiring mindfulness and wisdom and an uncompromising attitude toward practice. It is highly suitable for Tutanga monks who are fully prepared to compete for the ultimate victory in the contest between Tamma and the Kilesas. This ultimate attainment is the freedom of Nibbana, the long-wished-for supreme victory. Graduated Teaching Once, a senior disciple of Acharya Man recalled that the many monks and novices living under his guidance tended to behave as though free from Kilesas, Although they lived together in a large group, no one behaved in an unseemly manner. Whether they were on their own, in the company of others performing their duties, or attending a meeting, all were calm and composed. Those who had never heard the monks discuss their levels of meditation with Acharya Man might well suspect from observing them that they were all full-fledged arahants. The truth became apparent only when he advised the monks on how to solve specific problems in their meditation. Each monk was advised according to his level of achievement from basic concentration and wisdom techniques to the higher levels of concentration and insight. Whether addressing the problems of individual disciples or instructing the whole assembly, Acharya Man always displayed the same uncompromising self-assurance. His audience was fully aware that the tamma he expounded was something he had actually realized within himself. He never relied on speculative assessments such as, it could be like this, or it might be like that. Those listening were also fully convinced that the Tamma he taught existed potentially within all of them. Even though they had not achieved it yet, surely they would realize it for themselves one day, provided they did not falter in their efforts. Acharya Man modified his talks according to the character and the level of his listeners' understanding, so that everyone who was present gained some benefit from the assembly. He was careful in explaining the teaching in all its stages ensuring that listeners at different levels of meditation were able to understand and apply it to their individual practice in order to attain satisfactory results. When teaching lay people, he usually emphasized aspects of tamma that were suitable to their situation, such as generosity, moral virtue, and meditative development, as the basis for their practice. He explained that these three tammas are the basic criteria needed for birth in the human world, and so are the foundation of the sasana. Someone born as a human being must necessarily have cultivated these three tammas in the past. At least one of them must have been previously developed to serve as a catalyst for being born fully human. Generosity is a means of demonstrating one's goodwill. 
People who are noble-hearted and considerate toward fellow human beings and animals in need sacrifice and share some of their own good fortune according to their means, whether it's a gift of material goods, a gift of tamma, or a gift of knowledge of any sort. It is a gift freely given to benefit others without expectation of anything in return, except the good result of the act of giving itself. This also includes the generous gesture of forgiving those who behave wrongly or offensively. Those who are benevolent and prone to selfless giving are bound to be gracious people who stand out among their peers, irrespective of their physical appearance. Devas, humans, and animals all revere and cherish them. Wherever they go, there will always be someone willing to help them. They never suffer acute poverty and hardship. Quite clearly, philanthropists in society are never out of fashion and rarely disliked. Even a wealthy but stingy person looks forward to gifts from others, not to mention the hapless poor who have little hope of someone helping them. Due to the power of generosity, those who have developed a habit of giving will never be born into a world where they must live in hardship. Donors and their generosity have always served to maintain balance and prosperity in the world. As long as people still value self-sacrifice and extend a helping hand to one another, life on this earth will always have meaning. Generous people are inevitably hospitable and supportive, which makes the world a better place to live. In this sense, generosity is absolutely essential for us all. Without it, life in this world would be a parched and barren existence. Moral virtue is effectively a barrier that prevents people from abusing or destroying each other's material and spiritual wealth. It's the very basis of those special good qualities that every human being should have and should never let slip away. People who do not have moral virtue to protect and maintain their inner wealth are like a fire raging through human society. Without morality's protective restraint, mistreatment and destruction would run rampant in the world, to the point where there would hardly be an island of security left where a person could rest in peace. As long as people believe that material wealth is more valuable than moral virtue, they will have no real security. In such a case, even if the world economy were to flourish until material wealth was piled as high as the sun, the sun's heat would be no match for the scorching heat of an immoral world. Moral virtue is the true foundation of human perfection that was personified by the Lord Buddha. He uncovered this truth, presenting it as a means by which a world confused and fearful of dukkha might rely on its restraining power to live in the cool, soothing glow of trust. Left to their own devices, people with kilesas will tend to think in ways that make the world oppressively hot. If these thoughts are allowed free reign, powered by the kilesas and untempered by even a hint of moral virtue, they will surely create innumerable poisonous monsters that will spread throughout the world to devour everything in their path. The thoughts of a supremely virtuous person like the Lord Putta, who totally eliminated the kilesas from his heart, produce only welcome peace and happiness in the world. Compare this with the thought patterns instigated by the kilesas that cause us, and everyone else, unimaginable trouble. The difference is obvious enough that we should want to search for a way to resolve this problem and stem the tide of such thoughts before it is too late. Moral virtue is like a medicine that counteracts infectious diseases as well as chronic ones. At the very least, a patient who is sick with the kilesa fever can find some measure of relief and hope of recovery in the practice of moral virtue. More than that, it may just effect a complete cure. Out of his compassion, Acharyaman used to instruct lay people on both the merits of moral virtue and the faults of having no moral standard. These instructions went straight to the heart, and were so impressive that, in hearing his advice to lay people, I found myself thinking that I too would like to keep the five moral precepts, forgetting that, as a monk, I was already observing two hundred and twenty-seven monastic rules. I was overcome with enthusiasm to hear him talk, and lost my mindfulness for a moment. When I finally came to my senses, I was rather embarrassed, and did not mention to anyone for fear that other monks might think me a bit crazy. In fact, I was a little bit crazy at that time, since I forgot my own shaved head and thought about keeping a layman's five precepts. This is a problem we all face. When thinking in ways that are wrong, we end up acting wrongly in that manner as well. Therefore, we should be aware of our thoughts at all times, aware of whether they are good or bad, right or wrong. We must constantly rein in our own thoughts, otherwise they can easily spin out of control. Meditative development means training the mind to be clever and unbiased with respect to basic principles of cause and effect, so that we can effectively come to terms with our own inner processes, and all other related matters as well. 
Instead of abandoning the mind to unbridled exuberance, we rely on meditation to rein in our unruly thoughts and bring them into line with what is reasonable, which is the path to calm and contentment. The mind that has yet to undergo meditation training is similar to an untrained animal that cannot yet properly perform its appointed tasks, and is, therefore, not as useful as it might be. It must be trained to do those jobs in order to gain maximum benefit from its work. Likewise, our minds should undergo training as a means of understanding ourselves as we carry out all our daily tasks, be they mental or physical, significant or trivial, gross or subtle. Those who develop meditation as a solid anchor for the mind enjoy reflecting carefully on whatever they do. They are not likely to take unnecessary chances in a situation they are unsure of, when a mistake could hurt them or someone else who is involved. Meditative development brings definite benefits, both immediately and in the future, but the most significant are those we experience here and now in the present. People who develop an aptitude for meditation will be successful at whatever they put their minds to. Their affairs are not conducted half-heartedly, but are well thought out with an eye to the expected benefits of a job well done. In this way, people can always look back with satisfaction on the fruits of their labor. Since they are firmly grounded in reason, people who meditate have no difficulty controlling themselves. They adhere to truth as the guiding principle for all they do, say, and think. They are mindful not to leave themselves open to the myriad temptations that habitually arise from the kilesa of craving, wanting to go there, wanting to come here, wanting to do this, wanting to say this or think that, which give no guidance whatsoever to right and wrong, good and bad. Craving is a very destructive defilement that tends to lead us repeatedly into misery in countless ways. In truth, we have no one to blame but ourselves, so we are left to accept the consequences as something regrettable, trying to do better the next time. When sufficient mindfulness is maintained, we can reverse this trend. But if we do not have enough mindfulness to reflect prudently on these matters, Everything we do will have adverse effects, sometimes irrevocably so. This is the real crux of the kilesas. They inevitably lead us toward misfortune. Meditation is a good means for making a clean break with the unseemly business of the kilesas. Meditation techniques are arguably somewhat difficult to practice, but that's because they are designed to put pressure on the mind and bring it under control, much like trying to bring a monkey under control in order to tame it. Meditation techniques are actually methods for developing self-awareness. This means observing the mind which is not content to just remain still, but tends instead to jump about like someone who's been scalded with hot water. Observing the mind requires mindfulness to keep us aware of its movement. This is aided by using one of a number of Dhamma themes as an object of attention to keep the mind stable and calm during meditation. A very popular method and one that gives good results is mindfulness of breathing. Other popular themes include the use of a word such as butto, tammo, sankho, or gesa, loma, naka, danda, dacho, in forward and reverse order, or meditation on death, or whatever theme seems most suitable. The mind must be forced to stay exclusively with that object during meditation. Calm and happiness are bound to arise when the mind depends on a particular tamma theme as a good and safe object of attention. What is commonly referred to as a calm chitta, or a chitta integrated in samadhi, is a state of inner stability that is no longer associated with the initial object of attention, which merely prepared the chitta by holding it steady. Once the chitta has entered into samadhi, there exists enough momentum for the chitta to remain in this state of calm, independent of the preparatory object, whose function is temporarily discontinued while the chitta rests peacefully. Later, when the chitta withdraws from samadhi, if time permits, Attention is refocused on the initial tamma theme. When this is practiced consistently with dedication and sustained effort, a mind long steeped in dukkha will gradually awaken to its own potential and abandon its unskillful ways. The struggle to control the mind, which one experiences in the beginning stages of training, will be replaced by a keen interest in the task at hand. The chitta becomes unforgettably calm and peaceful once it enters samadhi. Even if this happens only once, it will be an invigorating and indelible experience. Should it fail to occur again in subsequent attempts at meditation, an indescribable sense of loss and longing will linger in the chitta for a long time. Only with further progress, as one becomes more and more absorbed in increasingly subtler states of calm, will the frustration of losing the initial state of calm be forgotten. When hearing about meditation, you may fret and feel mentally and physically inadequate to the task, and be reluctant to try. You may be tempted to think, Fate has surely conspired against me. I can't possibly manage it. 
My duties and responsibilities both at home and at work make it difficult. There are all the social obligations, raising children and looking after grandchildren. If I waste time sitting with eyes closed in meditation, I'll never be able to keep up and make ends meet, and I'll probably end up starving to death. Thus you become discouraged and miss a good opportunity. This way of thinking is buried deep within everyone's psyche. It may be just the sort of thinking that has prevented you from ridding yourself of Dukkha all along, and it will continue to do so if you don't try to remedy it now. Meditation is actually a way to counteract and alleviate all the mental irritations and difficulties that have plagued us for so long. Meditation is not unlike other methods used in the world to relieve pain and discomfort, like bathing when we feel hot, and putting on warm clothes or lighting a fire when we feel cold. When hungry, we eat and drink. When ill, we take medicine to relieve the symptoms. All these are methods that the world has used to relieve pain and discomfort over the ages, without anyone ever dismissing them as being too burdensome or too difficult to do. People of every ethnic and social group are obliged to look after themselves in this way. Even animals have to take care of themselves by searching for food to alleviate their discomfort and survive from day to day. Similarly, mental development through meditation is a very important means of taking care of ourselves. It is work that we should be especially interested in, because it deals directly with the mind, which is the central coordinator for all our actions. The mind is in the front line when it comes to anything relating to ourselves. In other words, the citta is absolutely essential in everything. It has no choice but to accept the burden of responsibility in all circumstances without discrimination or hesitation. Whatever happens, the mind feels compelled to step in and immediately take charge unfazed by ideas of good and bad or right and wrong. Although some situations are so depressing they're nearly unbearable, the mind still boldly rushes in to shoulder the burden, heedless of the risks and its own inherent limitations. More than that, it recites its litany of thoughts over and over again until eating and sleeping become almost impossible at times. Still, the mind charges ahead, refusing to admit failure. When engaging in physical activity, we know our relative strengths and when the time is right to take a rest, but our mental activities never take a break, except briefly when we fall asleep. Even then, the mind insists on remaining active, subconsciously churning out countless dream images that continue overloading its capacity to cope. So the mind lives with a sense of intolerable dissatisfaction, never realizing that this dissatisfaction arises in direct relationship to its heavy workload and the unbearable mental aggravation it generates. Because it is always embattled, the mind could well be called a warrior. It struggles with what is good, and it struggles with what is bad. Never pausing to reflect, it engages everything that comes along. Whatever preoccupations arise, it insists on confronting them all without exception, unwilling to let anything pass unchallenged. So it's appropriate to call the mind a warrior, since it recklessly confronts everything that comes across its path. If the mind does not come to terms with this dilemma while the body is still alive, it will keep on fighting these battles indefinitely, unable to extricate itself. Should the heart's endless desires be indulged in without Tamma to act as a moderating influence, real happiness will always be out of reach, regardless of how abundant material wealth may be. Material wealth itself is not a true source of happiness, and can readily become a source of discontent for the heart lacking inner Tamma to serve as an oasis of rest. The wise have assured us that Tamma is the power which oversees both material wealth and spiritual well-being. Regardless of how much or how little wealth we acquire, we will enjoy a sufficient measure of happiness if we possess some measure of Tamma in our hearts. Unsupported by Tamma and left to its own desires, the heart will be incapable of finding genuine happiness, even with a mountain of valuable possessions on hand. These are merely physical and emotional supports that intelligent people can use wisely for their own pleasure. If the heart is not intelligent in the way of Tamma, or Tamma is absent altogether, the place where we live will resemble a wasteland, no matter what our choice. The heart, and all its wealth, will then end up as just so much accumulated waste, stuff that is useless for our spiritual development. When it comes to being stoic in the face of adversity, nothing is as tough and resilient as the heart. Receiving proper assistance, it becomes something marvelous in which we can take pride and satisfaction under all circumstances. From the time of birth to the present moment, we have exploited our hearts and minds, mercilessly. Were we to treat a car like we treat our minds, it would be pointless to take it to a garage for repairs, for it would have become a pile of scrap metal long ago. 
Everything that we utilize must receive some sort of upkeep and repair to ensure that it continues providing useful service. The mind is no exception. It's an extremely important resource that should be well looked after and maintained, just as we do with all our other possessions. Meditation is a therapy designed exclusively for the mind. All of us who are truly interested in taking responsibility for our minds, which, after all, are our most priceless possessions, should care for them in the correct and proper way. This means training our minds with suitable meditation techniques. To use the car comparison, it means examining the mind's various component parts to see if anything is defective or damaged, and then taking it into the garage for a spiritual overhaul. This entails sitting in meditation, examining the mental components, or sankharas, that make up our thoughts, then determining whether the thoughts that surface are fundamentally good or harmful, adding fuel to the fires of pain and suffering. Thus, an investigation is undertaken to ascertain which thoughts have value and which are flawed. Then we should turn our attention to the physical components, that is, our bodies. Do our bodies keep improving with age, or are they deteriorating as time goes by? the old year inevitably turning into a new one, over and over again. Does the body continue regenerating, or does it inevitably wear down and grow older with each successive day? Should we be complacent about this by failing to mentally prepare ourselves while there is still time? Once we are dead, it will be too late to act. This is what meditation is all about, cautioning and instructing ourselves by examining our shortcomings to determine what areas need improvement. When we investigate continuously in this manner, when we investigate constantly in this manner, either while sitting in meditation or while going about our daily tasks, the mind will remain calm and unperturbed. We will learn not to be arrogantly overconfident about life, and thus avoid fueling the flames of discontent. And we will know how to exercise proper moderation in our thoughts and deeds, so that we don't forget ourselves and get caught up in things which may have disastrous consequences. The benefits of meditation are too numerous to address, so Acharyaman kept his explanations to the lay audience at a level appropriate to their practice. His explanations to monks and novices were of a very different caliber. I have written down just enough here to give the flavor of his teaching. Some people may find that I have included certain things that seem excessive, or even distasteful, but the account would be incomplete if I did not convey all aspects of his teaching. I have made the effort to compile these teachings in the hope that the readers will encourage me with the benefit of their criticism. So you are welcome to criticize me for whatever you find to be inappropriate. But please do not blame Acharyaman, because he had no part in writing the book. Acharyaman conducted higher Tamma teaching only within the circle of his close disciples. But the author has somewhat of an irrepressible nature and cannot sit still. So I have gone around collecting oral accounts from all the Acharyas today who lived with Acharyaman in the past and are his disciples. I have recorded this information so that the reader may know something of his practice, even though it is not a complete account. Acharyaman's mode of practice was so uniquely resolute and uncompromising that one could surely say that none of his disciples can match him in the austerities he performed, the noble virtues he perfected, and the inner knowledge he so skillfully mastered. To this day, he remains unexcelled. Acharyaman said that when he stayed in the forests and mountains of Udon Thani and Nongkai, they was from the upper realms and lower realms occasionally came to hear Tamma from him. Some groups came regularly every two weeks, others only once a month. They was from that area did not come to see him nearly as often as those from Chiang Mai province. I shall relate those experiences in due course. But for now, let me continue following the sequence of events so as not to confuse matters. Atsariyaman spoke of a huge city of Nagas, located under the mountain west of the Laotian city of Luang Prabang. While he lived there, the chief of those Nagas regularly brought his followers to hear Tamma, occasionally in large numbers. The Nagas tended to ask far fewer questions of him than the day was of the upper and lower realms, who always had many questions for him. All these groups, however, listened to what he had to say with equal respect. During the time Atariyaman lived at the base of that mountain, the chief Naga came almost every night to visit him. Only on special occasions did he bring a large following, and in that case... Acharyaman always knew of their arrival in advance. Due to the remote location, he had little contact with people at that time, so he was able to be of particular service to the Nagas and Devas. The Nagas did not visit very late at night. They came at maybe 10 or 11 p.m., which was probably due to his remote location. As a sign of their profound respect, 
The Nagas invited Acharya Man to remain living there out of compassion for them. They even arranged to protect him both day and night, taking turns to keep watch. They never came too close, maintaining a convenient distance always, yet close enough to observe anything that might happen. The Devas, on the other hand, usually came later than the Nagas, at about one or two a.m. If he was living in the mountains, far from a village, the Devas sometimes came earlier, say ten or eleven p.m. There was never a sure time, but normally the Devas came after midnight. During middle age, Acharya Man's normal daily routine was as follows. After the meal, he walked meditation until noon, and then took a short rest. Rested, he sat in meditation for an hour and a half, before continuing his walking meditation until 4 p.m. After that, he swept the area around his dwelling, bathed, and again practiced walking meditation until about 7 or 8 p.m., when he entered his hut to sit again. If it did not rain after seated meditation, he walked again until late at night. Or, if it was already very late, he retired for the night. He normally retired at 11 p.m. and woke at 3 a.m. Acharya Man usually knew in advance when the Devas would visit. If they were going to arrive later than midnight, he rested before receiving them. If they were expected to arrive between 11 p.m. and midnight, he first entered into Samadhi and waited there for them. This is the daily routine that he maintained throughout that period of his life. When both heavenly and terrestrial Devas wished to come on the same night, Acharya Man would receive the first group, give them a tamma talk, answer their questions, and then tell them that another group was soon coming. The first group then left in a timely manner, and the other day was entered from where they had been respectfully waiting at a distance. He then began speaking to the second group, discoursing on a tamma theme he deemed suitable for their temperament and level of understanding. Sometimes the chief of the Dewa group requested a certain topic. Acharya Man then focused his attention on that specific tamma theme. When he felt his heart in possession of the knowledge, he began his discourse. Sometimes the Dewa leader requested a discourse on a sutta, using an archaic title with which Acharya Man was unfamiliar. So Acharya Man asked and was told the present-day title. Usually Acharya Man could figure out for himself the suttas that were being requested, but occasionally he had to ask for clarification. At other times, the day was requested a sutta by a title of which he felt certain. But as soon as he began to elucidate it, they informed him that he had made a mistake, that it was not the one they requested. To refresh his memory, they recited some verses from the sutta. After one or two verses, he could usually remember it correctly. He began his discourse only when he was sure he had the right topic. On rare occasions, the devas from the upper and lower realms all came to listen to Tamma at the same time as the Nagas. This is not unlike various groups of humans all showing up to visit a teacher simultaneously. When this happened often, he scheduled their arrivals at different times for the convenience of all concerned. According to Acharya Man, even though he lived deep in the forests and mountains, he did not have much free time because he had to deal with so many groups of devas from different realms of existence. If on a particular night no devas from the celestial realms came to see him, then there were bound to be terrestrial devas from one location or another. So he had little free time at night. Fortunately, there were few human visitors in those remote places. If he stayed near a village or a town, however, then human inhabitants from the area came to see him. He received these people in the afternoon or early evening, teaching the monks and novices afterward. The Difference is in the Heart Having written about the Devas, I shall now write about the human visitors who came to see Acharya Man. Being human, I am also included in this matter, but I still wish to apologize to the reader if there is anything unappealing or inappropriate in what follows. In some ways I have an incurably roguish character, as you will no doubt notice. However, I feel it necessary to record truthfully what Acharya Man told his disciples privately. I ask for your forgiveness, but I include this so that you may compare humans and devas and learn something from it. Acharya Man said there was a great difference between humans and devas in the way they communicated with him and listened to his discourses on Tamma. Devas of every realm, from the highest to the lowest, are able to comprehend the meaning in a discussion of Tamma much more easily than their human counterparts, and when the discussion is over, their exclamations of approval, Satu, 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 echo throughout the spiritual universe. Devas of every realm have enormous respect for monks. Not one of them shows any sign of impropriety. When coming to listen to a monk discourse on Tamma, their comportment is always calm, orderly, and exquisitely graceful. Human beings, on the other hand, never really understand the meaning of a Tamma discourse. 
even after repeated explanations. Not only do they fail to grasp the meaning, but some are even critical of the speaker, thinking, What is he talking about? I can't understand a thing. He's not as good as that other monk. Some who themselves have previously ordained as monks cannot keep their gross quilleses from surfacing, boasting, When I was ordained, I could give a much better talk than this. I made those listening laugh a lot so they didn't get tired and sleepy. I had a special rapport with the audience which kept them howling with laughter. Still others think, It's rumored that this monk knows the thoughts of others. So whatever we think, he knows immediately. Why then doesn't he know what I'm thinking right now? If he knows, he should give some sign, at least indirectly, by saying that this or that person shouldn't think in such and such a way because it's wrong. Then we would know if he deserves his reputation. Some people come ready to find fault so they can show off their own cleverness. These types are not interested in tamma at all. Expounding tamma in their presence is like pouring water on a dog's back. They immediately shake it all off, leaving not a drop behind. Acharyaman would often laugh when talking about this type of person, probably because he was amused by his occasional encounters with such clever people. He said that some people who came to see him were so opinionated they could barely walk, the burden of their conceit being much heavier than that which an ordinary mortal could carry. Their conceit was so enormous that he was more inclined to feel trepidation than pity for them, which made him disinclined to talk to them about Tumma. Still, there were certain social occasions where this was unavoidable, so he struggled to say something. But as he was about to speak, the Tumma seemed to vanish, and he could think of nothing to say. It was as if Tamma could not compete with such overbearing conceit, and so it fled. All that remained was his body, sitting like a lifeless doll, being stuck with pins, and ignored by everyone as though he had no feelings. At such times no Tamma arose for discourse, and he simply sat like a tree stump. In cases like that, where would the Tamma come from? Acharyaman used to laugh as he described the situations to his disciples, but there were some in his audience who actually trembled. Since they weren't feverish and the weather wasn't cold, we can only assume that they were shuddering from feelings of trepidation. Acharyaman said that he would not teach very conceited individuals unless absolutely necessary, because his discourse could actually turn into something toxic for the heart of someone who listened without any feeling of respect. The tamma that Acharyaman possessed was truly of the highest order, and of enormous value to those who established their hearts in the principle of goodwill, not considering themselves superior to tamma in any way. This is a very important point to keep in mind. Every effect has its cause. When many people sit together listening to a tamma talk, there will be some who feel so uncomfortably hot they almost melt, and there will be others who are so cool they feel as if they are floating in the air. The difference, the cause, is right there in the heart. Everything else is inconsequential. There was simply no way he could help lighten the burden of someone whose heart refused to accept tamma, one might think that if teaching them doesn't actually do any good, it also would not do any harm. But that's not really the case, for such people will always persist in doing things which have harmful repercussions, regardless of what anyone says. So it's not easy to teach human beings. Even with a small group of people, inevitably there were just enough noxious characters among them to be a nuisance. But rather than feel annoyed like most people, Acharyaman would simply drop the matter and leave them to their fate. When no way could be found to help reform such people, Acharyaman regarded it simply as the nature of their kamma. There were those who came to him with the virtuous intention of searching for tamma, trusting in the good consequences of their actions, and these he greatly sympathized with, though they were far and few between. However, those who were not looking for anything useful, and had no restraint, were legion. So Acharyaman preferred to live in the forests and mountains, where the environment was pleasant and his heart was at ease. In those places he could practice to the limit without being concerned about external disturbances. Wherever he cast his glance, whatever he thought about, Tama was involved, bringing a clear sense of relief. Watching the forest animals, such as monkeys, languars, and gibbons, swinging and playing through the trees and listening to them call to one another across the forest, gave rise to a pleasant inner peacefulness. He need not be concerned with their attitude toward him as they ran about in search of food. In this deep solitude, he felt refreshed and cheerful in every aspect of his life. Had he died then, he would have been perfectly comfortable and contented. This is dying the truly natural way. Having come alone, he would depart alone. 
Invariably, all the Arahants pass into Nibbana in this way, as their hearts do not retain any confusion or agitation. They have only the one body, the one chitta, and a single focus of attention. They don't rush out looking for dukkha, and they don't accumulate emotional attachments to weigh them down. They live as noble ones, and they depart as noble ones. They never get entangled with things that cause anxiety and sorrow in the present. Being spotlessly pure, they maintain a detachment from all emotional objects, which stands in sharp contrast to the way people act in the world. The heavier their heart's burden, the more they add and increase their load. As for noble ones, the lighter their load, the more they relinquish, until there's nothing left to unload. They then dwell in that emptiness, even though the heart that knows that emptiness remains. There is simply no more loading and unloading to be done. This is known as attaining the status of someone who is out of work, meaning that the heart has no more work left to do in the sasana. Being out of work in this way is actually the highest form of happiness. This is quite different from worldly affairs, where unemployment for someone with no means of making a living signifies increased misery. Acharyaman related many differences between devas and humans, but I have recorded here only those which I remember, and those which I think would benefit the discerning reader. Perhaps these asides, such as the deva episodes, should all be presented together in one section according to the subject matter. But Acharyaman's encounters with such phenomena stretched over a long period of time, and I feel it necessary to follow his life story as sequentially as possible. There will be more accounts about devas later, but I dare not combine the different episodes, because the object is to have the parallel threads of the story converge at the same point. I ask forgiveness if the reader suffers any inconvenience. What Acharyaman said about Deivas and humans refers to these groups as they existed many years before, since Acharyaman, whose reflections are recorded here, died over twenty years ago. The Deivas and humans of that age have most probably changed following the universal laws of impermanence. There remains only the modern generation, who have probably received some mental training and improved their conduct accordingly. As for the contentious people whom Acharyaman encountered in his life, Probably such people no longer exist to clutter up the nation and the religion. Since then, there has been so much improvement in the education system, and well-educated people aren't likely to harbor such vulgar ambitions. This affords people today some relief. After living and teaching the monks and the local population in the Odontani and Nongkai areas for a considerable time, Acharyaman moved eastward to the province of Zagonnakorn. He travelled through the small villages in the forests and mountains of the Warchapum, Pangkorn, Sawangdandin, Wanonniwat, and the Kat Amnuay districts. He then wandered to Nakon Banom through the district of Sri Songkram, passing through the villages of Bansampong, Bandongdang, Bandongnoi, and Bangkam Nokkok. All these places were deep in the wilderness and infested with malaria, which, when caught, was very difficult to cure. A person could be infected the better part of a year, and still not fully recover. Assuming one did not die, living through it was still a torment. As I've already mentioned, malaria was called the fever the in-laws despise, because those who suffered chronically from this illness were still able to walk around and eat, but unable to do any work. Some became permanent invalids. The villagers in that area, as well as the monks and novices who lived in the same forests, were frequently victims of malaria. Some even died from it. For three years, Acharyaman spent successive rains retreats in the area around Bansampong village. During that time, quite a few monks died of the illness. Generally, those monks were from cultivated areas where there was little malaria, such as the provinces of Ubon, Royet, and Sarakam, so they were not used to the forests and mountains. They could not live easily in those forests with Acharyaman because they couldn't tolerate the malaria. They had to leave during the rainy season, spending their retreat near villages that were surrounded by fields. Acharyaman recounted that when he gave evening tamma talks to the monks and novices near the village of Sampong, a naga from the Songkran River came to listen almost every time. If he failed to arrive at the hour when the discourse took place, he would come later when Acharyaman sat in Samadhi. The devas from the upper and lower realms came only periodically, and not as often as they did when he stayed in the provinces of Udon Tani or Nongkai. They were always particular about coming on the three holiest observance days of the rains retreat, the first, the middle, and the last day. No matter where Acharyaman lived, whether in towns or cities, the devas always came from one realm or another to hear his tamma. 
This was true in the city of Chiang Mai, while he was staying at Wat Chedi Luang Monastery. The Well Digging Incident A strange incident occurred while he was staying near the village of Ban Sampong. It was the dry season. About sixty to seventy monks and novices were living there, and there was not enough clean water available. The monks held a meeting with the villagers, and decided that they would have to dig the existing well deeper in order to acquire a clean, adequate supply. After the decision was made, a senior monk requested permission from Acharyaman to proceed with the work. After listening to the request, Acharyaman remained quiet for a moment, before he answered sternly in a rough voice, No, it could be dangerous. That was all he said. The senior monk was puzzled by the words, It could be dangerous. After paying his respects to Acharyaman, he related the conversation to the monks and the lay people. Instead of agreeing with Acharyaman, they decided to proceed secretly with the plan. The well was some distance from the monastery. At noon, when they thought Acharyaman was resting, they quietly went out to dig. They had not dug very deep when the earth around the top edge gave way and collapsed into the well, leaving a gaping hole at ground level and ruining the well with loose earth. Everyone was terrified, having disrespectfully ignored Acharyaman's warning and showing a lack of mindfulness by failing to call off the project. They had caused the earth to cave in, almost killing someone in the process. They were afraid he would find out what they had done against his express wishes. They were extremely worried and felt chastened by their error. Together they quickly gathered wood to repair the mouth of the well, praying all the while for Acharyaman's assistance in their efforts to dig out the loose earth and restore the well for use again. Fortunately, once they appealed for Acharyaman's help, everything was put into good order with amazing ease, so that some of them even ended up smiling. As soon as the work was completed, everyone fled the scene, afraid that Acharyaman might suddenly show up. Back in the monastery, the monks and novices remained in a state of constant anxiety about what they had done. The closer it came to the evening meeting, the more apprehensive they became. They could all vividly remember Acharyaman's scoldings in the past when something of this nature had happened. Sometimes, when they did something inappropriate and then forgot, Acharyaman knew and eventually brought it up as a way of teaching a lesson. The well incident was a serious misdeed that was committed by the whole monastery behind his back. How could he possibly have not known about it? They were all certain that he knew, and that he was bound to mention it that evening, or, at the latest, the very next morning. They were preoccupied with these uncomfortable feelings for the rest of the day. As it turned out, when the time arrived, no meeting was called. Instead of scolding them, Acharyaman mentioned nothing about the incident. Acharyaman was very astute in teaching his disciples. He knew very well about the incident and about many other mistakes made by the monks and novices. But he also knew about their anxiety. Since they obviously realized their mistake, scolding them at this point would have needlessly increased their deep remorse. Acharyaman's early morning routine was to rise from seated meditation at dawn, then do walking meditation until it was time to put on his robes at the meeting hall before going for alms. The next morning... When Acharyaman left his walking path and entered the meeting hall, the monks were still worried about how he would deal with them. While they waited in anxious anticipation, Acharyaman turned the whole affair around by speaking gently and in a comforting manner designed to relieve their distress. We came here to study Tamma. We should not be unreasonably audacious, nor should we be excessively afraid. Anyone can make a mistake. The value lies in recognizing our mistakes. The Lord Buddha made mistakes before us. He realized where he had gone wrong and strove to correct his errors as soon as he became aware of them. This kind of intention is noble, but still, through ignorance, mistakes can happen. From now on, you should all take care to control yourselves under all circumstances. Using mindfulness at all times to watch out for oneself is the way of the wise. That was all he said. He just smiled broadly at the monks in a disarming way and took them on alms round as usual. There was no meeting later that evening. Acharyaman merely told everyone to be diligent in their practice. Three nights passed without a meeting. All during that time, the monks and novices were still scared he would scold them about the well-digging incident. On the fourth night, a meeting was called, but again no mention was made of the incident, as though he knew nothing about it. A long time later, after everyone had forgotten about the matter, it quite unexpectedly cropped up. No one had ever told them about the mishap, for the whole affair had been hushed up. 
Acharyaman himself never went to the well, which was quite a distance from the monastery. He began a tamma discourse as he usually did, speaking about various aspects of a monk's practice, about being reasonable and about having respect for the teacher in tamma. These, he said, led to the correct behavior of those coming to train and practice under a teacher. He stressed that they should especially take the issue of cause and effect very seriously, for this was the true tamma. Although you're constantly under pressure from your desires, you shouldn't allow them to surface and intrude into the sphere of practice. Otherwise, they will destroy tamma, the tried and true way to go beyond dukkha, gradually spoiling all of your hopes. Never should you go against tamma, the monastic discipline, or the word of a respected teacher, as this is the equivalent to destroying yourselves. Disobedience merely gives impetus to those bad habits which are destructive to you and others as well. The earth around that well was more than just clay. There was also sand underneath. Digging too deeply can cause the sand, then the clay, to collapse into the well, possibly burying and killing someone. That was why I forbade it. I thoroughly investigate everything before giving or refusing permission for any type of work. Those who are here for training should consider this. Some matters are exclusively internal, and I don't feel it necessary to reveal every aspect of them. What I did reveal was clear enough for you to understand, so why did you behave as if you didn't? When I forbid something, you go ahead and do it anyway. If I tell you to do something, you do the opposite. This was not a matter of misunderstanding. You understood perfectly well. Being contrary like this displays the stubborn side of your character, dating from the time you lived with your parents who tolerated it just to keep you happy. It has now become an ingrained characteristic, buried deep inside monks who are now adults. To make matters worse, you flaunt it in the face of your teacher and the spiritual life you lead. Stubbornness in a monk of your age is unforgivable and cannot be tolerated as mere childish behavior. It deserves a stern reprimand. If you persist in being stubborn, it will further entrench this unfortunate trait in you, so that you will be appropriately branded as obstinate Tutanga monks. Thus all your requisites should be labeled the belongings of an obstinate monk. This monk is stubborn. That monk is shameless. The monk over there is dazed, until the whole monastery ends up doggedly disobedient, and I end up with nothing but hard-headed students. Once obstinacy becomes the norm, the world will break up from the strain, and the sasana will surely be reduced to ruin. Which of you still want to be a hard-headed monk? Is there anyone here who wants me to be a teacher of hard-headed monks? If so, go back tomorrow and dig out that well again so the earth can collapse and bury you there. Then you will be reborn in a hard-headed heavenly paradise where the devas can all come and admire your true greatness. Surely no group of devas, including those in the Brahma realms, have ever seen or lived in such a peculiar paradise. After that, the tone of his voice became gentler, as did the theme of his talk, enabling his audience to wholeheartedly reflect on the error of their stubborn disobedience. During the talk, it seemed as if everyone had forgotten to breathe. Once the talk was over and the meeting adjourned, the monks excitedly questioned one another to find out who might have dared inform Acharyaman of the incident, prompting this severe scolding which nearly made them faint. Everyone denied informing him, as each dreaded a scolding as much as another. The incident passed without a definitive answer to how Acharyaman knew. Since his time at Sarika Cave, Acharyaman possessed a mastery of psychic skills concerning all sorts of phenomena. Over the years, his proficiency grew to such an extent that there seemed to be no limit to his abilities. As the monks living with him were well aware of these abilities, they took strict care to be mentally self-controlled at all times. They couldn't afford to let their minds wander carelessly because their errant thoughts could become the subject of a tamma talk they might receive at the evening meeting. They needed to be especially vigilant during the meeting when Acharyaman was actually speaking to them. In those brief moments when he stopped speaking, perhaps to catch his breath, perhaps to observe something, if he detected any stray thought among the monks, he immediately made an issue of it. The tone of his voice changed dramatically as he mimicked the unmindful thoughts of one of those present. Although Acharyaman did not mention anyone by name, his tone immediately startled that individual, who became quite frightened to ever dare think like that again. Another time to be careful was when they followed him on alms round. Those who were unmindful then were bound to hear about their wayward thoughts at the next meeting. Sometimes it was very embarrassing to have to listen to a talk on one's own wayward thoughts as other monks cast sidelong glances around the assembly, not knowing who among them was being reprimanded. But once discovered, all the monks and novices tended to react similarly in a positive manner. 
instead of feeling angry or disappointed after leaving the meeting, all would appear cheerful and content. Some even laughed as they inquired of each other, Who was it? Who got caught today? It's remarkable how honest they were with their fellow monks about their errant thoughts. Instead of trying to keep his indiscretion a secret, the guilty monk would confess as soon as someone asked, I'm really stubborn, and I couldn't help thinking about... Even though I knew I was bound to get told off for thinking like that. When those thoughts came up, I forgot all about my fear of Atsariyaman and just felt full of myself thinking such crazy thoughts. I deserved exactly what I got. It will teach me a good lesson about losing my self-control. I would like to apologize to the reader because I don't feel very comfortable about writing down some of these matters. But these stories are factual. They actually happened. The decision to include them was a difficult one to make. But if what I recount is the truth, it should be all right. It could be compared to a situation in which a monk confesses to a disciplinary offense as a means of eliminating any sense of guilt or anxiety about its recurrence in the future. Thus, I would like to relate a few incidents from the past to serve as food for thought for all of you whose thoughts may cause you similar problems. In most cases, practicing monks received a severe rebuke from Acharyaman because of affairs pertaining to external sense objects. For example, sights and sounds are the most likely sense impressions to cause trouble and the most likely occasion for monks to be scolded was the morning alms round. Walking to the village for alms is an essential duty of every monk. On these occasions, monks encounter sights and sounds and are bound to think about them. Some become so infatuated with what they encounter that their thoughts swirl into disarray without their actual knowledge. These are the primary causes of mental distraction, enticing the mind even when one has no desire to think about them. By the time a monk regained mindfulness, it was time for the evening meeting, and the tongue lashing he received would prompt him to try to be more controlled. After a time, he again encountered the same enticing objects and reopened the sore. Upon returning to the monastery, he would receive another dose of strong medicine, in the form of another scolding, to apply to his sore. A great many monks and novices lived with Atariyaman, and most of them had such festering sores. If one monk didn't get a dose of his medicine, then another did. They went to the village and were confronted by attractive sights and sounds until they were unable to stay out of trouble. Consequently, upon their return to the monastery, when the opportunity arose, Acharyaman would have another go at them. It's natural for someone with kilesis to have a mixture of good and bad thoughts. Acharyaman did not give a lecture for every bad thought. What he criticized was the tendency to think in harmful ways. He wanted them to think in terms of tamma, using mindfulness and wisdom, so that they could free themselves from dukkha. He found that, instead of easing their teacher's burden with rightful thinking, monks preferred to think in ways that troubled him. Since many such monks lived with him, there were scoldings nearly every evening. All this serves to illustrate that Atsariyaman's subtle ability to know the thoughts of others was very real. As for those reprehensible thoughts, they did not arise intentionally, but accidentally, due to occasional lapses in mindfulness. Nevertheless, as a teacher imparting knowledge and skill to his students, Acharyaman quickly sounded a warning when he noticed something inappropriate, so that the perpetrator could become conscious of his lapse and learn to be more self-controlled in the future. He did not want his students to get trapped into such thinking again, for it promotes habitual thought patterns that lead directly to misfortune. Acharyaman's teaching for the monks was thoroughly meticulous, showing great attention to detail. The rules of monastic discipline were taught in detail, and samadhi and wisdom, belonging to the higher tamma, were taught in even greater depth. During the time he lived in Sarika Cave, he had already begun to master all levels of samadhi and all intermediate levels of wisdom. As for the highest levels of wisdom, I shall write about them later in the story, when Atsariyaman's practice finally reached that stage. After continuing his training in the northeast region for a while longer, he became even more proficient. This enabled him to use his expertise to teach the monks about all levels of samadhi plus the intermediate levels of wisdom. They, in turn, listened intently to his expositions, which never deviated from the authentic principles of samadhi and wisdom. Acharyaman samadhi was strange and quite extraordinary, whether it was Karnika samadhi, Upachara samadhi, or Appana samadhi. When his chitta entered into Karnika samadhi, it remained for only a moment, and instead of returning to its normal state, it then withdrew and entered Upachara Samadhi. In that state, he came into contact with a countless variety of external phenomena. Sometimes he was involved with ghosts, sometimes devas, sometimes nagas. Innumerable worlds of existence were contacted by this type of Samadhi. 
It was this access level samadhi that Atsariyaman used to receive visitors whose forms were invisible to normal sight and whose voices were inaudible to normal hearing. Sometimes his chitta floated up out of his body and went off to look at the heavenly realms and the different levels of the Brahma world. Then it traveled down into the regions of hell to look at the multitude of beings tormented by the results of their own gamma. The terms going up and going down are relative, conventional figures of speech, referring to the behavior of gross physical bodies. They have very little in common with the behavior of the citta, which is something so subtle that it is beyond temporal comparison. In terms of the physical body, going up and going down require a degree of earnest effort, but in terms of the citta, they are merely figures of speech with no degree of effort involved. When we say that the heavens, the Brahma realms, and Nibbana are progressively higher and more refined levels of existence, or that the realms of hell consist of progressively lower levels of existence, we are in fact using a physical, material standard to measure that which exists in a spiritual, psychic dimension. We might say that hell and heaven, which are considered to be lower and higher respectively, are in some respects analogous to hardened criminals and petty offenders who live together in the same prison, which itself is located in a community of law-abiding citizens. There's no distinction in kind between the two types of prisoners, because they all live together in the same prison, and there's no distinction in kind between them and law-abiding citizens, because they are all human beings living on the same land in the same country. What distinguishes them is the fact that they've been kept separated. At least the prison inmates and the general public can use their normal sense faculties to be aware of each other, but beings in the different spheres of existence are unaware of each other. Those living in the hell realms are unable to perceive those who are in the heavenly realms, and vice versa. Both groups are unable to perceive the Brahma realms, and human beings, in turn, are unaware of all who are in these different realms of existence. Even though the flows of consciousness from each of these beings intermingle constantly as they pass through one another's sphere of existence, they are as oblivious of others as if theirs is the only group in existence. Ordinarily, our minds are unable to know the thoughts of others. Because of this inability, we might then reason that they do not really exist. No matter how persistent these denials might be, we would be wrong, because all living beings possess a mind. Even though we are not aware of the thoughts of other beings, we have no right to deny that they exist simply because we can't perceive them. We cannot afford to hold hostage within the limitations of our sense faculties the existence of things which are too subtle to see and hear. If we do, we are just fooling ourselves. When we say that the heavens and the Prama worlds are arranged vertically in a series of realms, one shouldn't understand this in the gross material sense, such as a house with many stories requiring the use of stairs or an elevator. These realms exist in a spiritual dimension, and they are ascended in the spiritual sense by spiritual means, that is, by the heart which has developed this sort of capability through the practice of virtue. When we say that hell is down below, this does not mean descending into an abyss. Rather, it refers to descent by spiritual means to a spiritual destination, and those who are able to observe the hell realms do so by virtue of their own internal psychic faculties. But those beings who fall into these realms do so through the power of their own evil gamma. They remain there, experiencing whatever torment and agony is imposed on them by their own misdeeds, until they have completed their punishment and are released, in the same way that prison inmates are released at the end of their sentences. From the very beginning of Atariyaman's practice, Upachara Samadhi and Karnika Samadhi were bound together because the nature of his citta was inherently active and adventurous. As soon as his citta entered Karnika Samadhi, it instantly began to roam and experience the different phenomena existing in the sphere of Upachara. So he trained himself in Samadhi until he was proficient enough to make his citta stay still or go out to experience various phenomena as he wished. From then on, it was easy for him to practice the Samadhi of his choice. For instance, he could enter momentarily into Karnika Samadhi and then move out to access Samadhi in order to experience various phenomena, or he could focus intensively and enter into the full absorption of Uppana Samadhi, where he could rest for as long as necessary. Uppana Samadhi is a state of perfect calm that's absolutely serene and peaceful. Because of this, meditators may become attached to it. Acharya Man said that he was attached to this type of Samadhi for a while, but not for long, since he was by nature inclined toward wisdom. So he was able to resolve this matter himself and find a way out before complacency set in. Anyone who is transfixed in Appana Samadhi will make slow progress if they do not try to apply wisdom to examine it. Because it fills one with such happiness, many meditators are held fast by this kind of Samadhi. A strong, lingering attachment forms, 
and the meditator yearns for more, overwhelming any inclination to examine things with wisdom, which is the way to eradicate all kilesas. Meditators who fail to receive timely advice from a wise person will be reluctant to disengage themselves and realize the path of wisdom. When the chitta remains attached for a long time in such samadhi, conceits of various kinds may develop, such as believing that this calm and happy state is none other than nibbana, the end of dukkha. In truth, when the chitta converges into the one-pointedness of appana samadhi so that its focal point is experienced with the utmost clarity, it dwells fully absorbed in serene happiness. But the kilesas that cause birth in all realms of existence simultaneously converge at the same focal point as well. If, if wisdom is not used to penetrate and destroy those kilesas, there is no doubt that future rebirths will take place. Therefore, regardless of the level of samadhi one practices, wisdom should be incorporated into the practice as well. This is especially true of appana samadhi. Otherwise, the citta will only experience tranquility without evincing a capacity for resourcefulness and discernment. By the time of his second trip to the northeast, Atsaryaman was well experienced in the intermediate level of wisdom, since sufficient wisdom is necessary for having advanced to the Anagami level of Tamma. He would not have been capable of effective investigation at that level. Before reaching that level, one must employ wisdom to successfully pass through body contemplation. This requires seeing the attractive as well as the repulsive aspects of the body without getting caught up in either extreme. The chitta uses wisdom to isolate the attractive and repulsive aspects and then passes through the midpoint where these two extremes meet, having resolved all doubt and attachment concerning the body. This passage, however, is nothing more than a transitional stage along the way. It is analogous to taking an examination and passing it with the minimum requirement, necessitating further study to achieve the maximum grade. Those who have penetrated to the anagami level of understanding must still train their wisdom until it reaches an even more refined degree of expertise before it can be said that they are full-fledged anagamis. Should such a person then die, he would immediately be reborn in the fifth or akanirka plane of the Brahma world without having to pass through the four lower Brahma planes. Acharyaman recounted how he was delayed at that level for quite some time because he had no one to advise him. As he struggled to familiarize himself with the anagami level of practice, he had to be very careful not to make any mistakes. He knew from his experience in analyzing subtle aspects of tamma that the kilesas might undermine his efforts, for they were as equally subtle as the mindfulness and wisdom he was using to counter them. This made it very difficult to penetrate each successive level of tamma. He said it was absolutely incredible how hard he struggled to negotiate that dense, thorny thicket. Before he made his way through to come and kindly teach the rest of us, he suffered great hardship, making the arduous journey all alone. When the occasion was right, he used to describe this part of his practice to us. I myself was moved to tears in two instances while listening to his description of the terrible ordeal he faced at that time, and the amazingly subtle and profound nature of the tamma he attained. I wondered whether I had enough inherent virtue to enable me to crawl along in his footsteps, or whether I was destined to go the way of the ordinary people in the world. But his words were very encouraging, and always helped to sustain my resolve to persevere. Acharya Man said that whenever he accelerated his efforts to apply wisdom, his chitta became weary of association with others, and he became even more committed to his meditation practice. He knew at that stage that his practice still needed strengthening, yet he felt obliged to stay and train his disciples, so that they might also develop some tamma principles in their hearts. Atsaryaman lived for three or four years in the area of Bansampong village in Sri Songkram district, Nakhon Banom province. He spent one year at Ban Hui Sai village in Kam Chai district of the same province, as well as the villages of Nong Song and Kok Lang. He particularly liked staying in those places since they were all very mountainous. Nearby in the Pakut mountains were many dewas, and tigers there were particularly abundant. When night descended, Tigers would wander around his living area while the Dewas came to rejoice in hearing the Tamma. In the middle of the night, the roars of huge tigers echoed through the forest close to where he lived. On some nights, a whole host of them roared together, much like a crowd of people yelling back and forth to one another. When the terrifying sounds of those enormous cats resounded through the darkness, the effect was indeed very frightening. There were nights when the monks and novices failed to get any sleep, fearing that the tigers would come to snatch and devour them. Acharyaman cleverly found ways to use their fear of tigers to spur the monks to practice diligently. Rather enigmatically, he would say, 
Anyone whose efforts are lazy, watch out. The tigers in this mountain range really love lazy monks. They find them especially tasty eating. So if you want to avoid becoming a tasty meal for a tiger, you had better be diligent. You see, tigers are actually afraid of anyone who's diligently striving, so they won't eat that person. After hearing this, all the monks redoubled their efforts, for their very lives depended on it. They forced themselves to go out and do walking meditation, despite the roar of tigers all around the vicinity. Although they remained afraid, they believed what Acharyaman told them, that lazy monks could expect to be a tiger's next meal. Their precarious situation was made even worse by the fact that they didn't have huts as they would in a monastery, only small platforms just big enough to sleep on which were very low to the ground. If a tiger became hungry, there'd be no contest. Acharyaman related that on some nights huge tigers wandered into the monks' area, but then simply walked harmlessly past. He knew that tigers normally would not dare do anything, for the devas were always on guard. When devas came for a tamma talk, they mentioned to him that they were protecting the area, and would not let anything trouble the monks or cause them harm. Those devas also invited Acharyaman to remain in the area for a long time. In truth, Acharyaman's admonition to the monks was simply a means of arousing fear, so that they would take an increased interest in their practice. As for the tigers, they seemed to know that the monks' living area was a safe haven. Various kinds of wild animals, too, felt no need to be wary of hunters entering the monks' vicinity, for when the villagers knew where Acharyaman was staying, they rarely dared to hunt the area. They were concerned about the dreadful moral consequences. They were terrified that if anyone shot a gun in that area, it would explode in his hands and kill him. Strangely enough, whenever he went to stay in an area teeming with tigers, those beasts would stop killing the domesticated cows and buffaloes around the local villages. Nobody knew where they went to obtain their food. These remarkable incidents were related by Acharyaman himself, and later confirmed by many villagers in those localities where he had stayed. An Impeccable Human Being Another mysterious incident happened when a gathering of Dewas visited Acharyaman. Their leader began a conversation with him, stating, Your stay here has caused much delight in all the Dewas. We all enjoy an extraordinary sense of happiness due to your all-embracing aura of compassionate love that permeates through the heavens and spreads across the earth. This aura that radiates from you is indescribable and wonderful beyond compare. Because of it, we always know where you are. This aura of Tamma emanates from you and streams out in all directions. When you are teaching Tamma to the monks, novices, and lay people, even the sound of your voice resonates unbounded through the higher and lower realms. Wherever Dewas live, they hear your voice. Only the dead are deaf to it. I would like to write a bit more about this conversation between Acharyaman and the Deva. Although I cannot vouch for its accuracy, I heard it from a reliable source. Acharyaman took up the conversation with this question. If my voice really resonates as you say, why don't human beings hear it as well? The leader of the Devas replied, What would human beings know about moral virtue? They couldn't care less. They use their six senses to make evil kamma and create the conditions for hell within themselves all the time. They do this from the day they are born until the day they die. They are not nearly as concerned about moral issues as they ought to be, given their status as human beings. There are very few indeed who are interested in using their senses in any morally beneficial way. The amount of moral virtue in their lives is really quite limited. By way of comparison, in the time that it takes one human being to die and be reborn, repeatedly ten or even one hundred times, the average Deva has yet to pass away even once, not to mention the Brahma Devas who have exceptionally long lives. The population of humankind is vast, and this in turn means a vast amount of negligence, for those who are heedful are few and far between. Mankind is supposed to safeguard the sasana, and yet people themselves know precious little about the sasana or moral excellence. Bad people know only evil. Their sole claim to being human comes from the fact that they are breathing. As soon as their breathing stops, they are immediately buried under the weight of their own wickedness. The day was no about this. Why shouldn't they? It's no secret. When a person dies, monks are invited to chant auspicious verses of Tamma for the deceased. Why would an evil person listen then? From the initial moment of death, his consciousness is completely bound up by his evil Kamma. So what chance would he have to come and listen to Tamma? Even while alive he wasn't interested. Only the living can hear Tamma, if they have the interest and desire. But it's obvious that they're not really interested. 
Haven't you noticed them? When have they ever shown an interest when the monks chant Tamma verses? Because they show no interest, it's obvious that the sasana is not truly embedded in their hearts. The things that they're most infatuated with are sordid and disliked even by some animals. These are just the kinds of things that immoral people have always enjoyed more than anything else, and they never, ever grow tired of them. Even when they are near death, they still hanker after such things. We dewas know much more about humans than humans know about dewas. You, venerable sir, are a very special monk. You are quite familiar with humans, dewas, creatures of hell, and beings of all sorts. That is why dewas everywhere pay homage to you. When the dewa had finished speaking, Acharyaman asked him for clarification. Dewas possess divine sight and divine hearing, enabling them to see and hear over great distances. They know about the good and bad of human affairs better than do humans themselves. Couldn't you find a way to make humans more aware of right and wrong? I feel that you are more capable of it than we human teachers are. Is there any way you could do this? The Dewa replied, We Dewas have seen many humans, but we have never seen one as impeccable as you, sir. You have always extended loving kindness to Devas and humans alike, while acquainting them simultaneously with the great variety of beings in existence, from the grossest to the most refined. You have tried to teach them to accept the fact that Devas and countless other spheres of existence really do exist in this world. But still, generation after generation, from birth to death, people have never actually seen these beings. So what interest would they have in Devas? At most, they may catch a glimpse of something strange, and without considering the matter carefully, claim they have seen a ghost. How could they possibly hope to receive any advice about matters of good and bad from us devas? Although devas are constantly aware of them, humans aren't the least interested in knowing anything about us. By what means would you have us teach people? It's really a hopeless situation. We just have to let Kamma and its results take their course. Even the devas themselves constantly receive the results of their Kamma. Were we free from it, we would all attain Nibbana. Then we wouldn't have to remain in this difficult situation so long. You say that one may attain Nibbana when one's kamma is exhausted. Do devas know about Nibbana? Do they experience pain and suffering like other beings? Why shouldn't we, venerable sir? All the Buddhas who have come to teach the world have taught, without exception, that we should transcend Dukkha. They never instructed us to remain mired in suffering. But worldly beings are far more interested in their favorite playthings than they are in Nibbana. Consequently, not one of them ever considers attaining Nibbana. All devas remember and are very impressed by the concept of Nibbana, as it was taught by each and every Buddha to living beings everywhere. But devas still have a dense web of gamma to work through before they can move clear of their celestial existence and go the way of Nibbana. Only then will all problems cease and this oppressive, repetitive cycle of birth death and rebirth finally come to a halt. But as long as some gamma remains in an individual, be it good gamma or bad gamma, regardless of his realm of existence, dukkha will be present as well. Are many monks able to communicate with devas? There are a few, but not many. Mostly they are monks who like to practice living in the forests and mountains, as you do. Are there any lay people with this ability? There are some, but very few. They must be people who desire the way of Tamma, and who have practiced the way until their hearts are bright and clear. Only then can they have knowledge of us. The bodily form of celestial beings appears relatively gross to those beings themselves, but it is far too subtle for the average human being to perceive. So only people whose hearts are bright and clear can perceive devas without difficulty. In the scriptures it says that devas do not like to be near humans because of the repugnant smell. What is this repugnant odor? If there is such an odor... Why do you all come to visit me so often? Human beings who have a high standard of morality are not repugnant to us. Such people have a fragrance which inspires us to venerate them. So we never tire of coming to hear you discourse on tamma. Those exuding a repulsive odor are people whose morality stinks, for they have developed an aversion to moral virtue even though it is considered to be something exceptionally good throughout the three worlds. Instead, they prefer things that are repugnant to everyone with high moral standards. We have no desire to approach such people. They are really offensive, and their stench spreads far and wide. It's not that Dewas dislike humans, but this is what Dewas encounter and have always experienced with humans. When Acharyaman told stories about Dewas and other kinds of spirits, the monks were mesmerized. They forgot all about themselves, the passing time, and their feelings of fatigue. 
they wished that some day they also would come to know about such things, and this hope made them happy to practice. This was also the case when Acharyaman thought it necessary to speak of his past lives, or the past lives of others. His audience became eager to know about their own past lives, and forgot about overcoming Dukkha and attaining Nibbana. Sometimes a monk was startled to find his mind wandering in this way, and admonished himself, Hey, I'm starting to get crazy. Instead of thinking about freedom from Dukkha, here I am chasing after shadows of a past that's long gone. In this way he regained his mindfulness for a while, but as soon as it slipped again, he would revisit those same thoughts. For this reason, many monks found it necessary to censure themselves on a regular basis. Acharya Man's stories about the Devas and other visiting spirits were quite fascinating. In particular, he spoke about how the ghost world has its share of hooligans, just like we do. Bad characters who cause disturbances are rounded up and imprisoned in a place which we humans would call a jail. Different types of offenders are imprisoned in different cell blocks, and all the cells are full. There are male hooligan ghosts and female hooligan ghosts, and then there are the very brutal types, again either male or female. Acharyaman said it was clear from the cruelty in their eyes that they would not respond to kindness and compassion. Ghosts live in cities, just as we humans do. They have huge cities with leaders who supervise and govern them. Quite a few ghosts are inclined to be virtuous, and thus earn high respect from both the ordinary ghosts and the hooligans. It's natural for all ghosts to stand in genuine awe of those among them who tend to possess great power and authority. This is not merely a matter of flattery. Acharyaman always claimed that the effects of evil are less powerful than the effects of goodness, and what he himself encountered in the ghost cities was further evidence of this. There are beings with accumulated merit who are nonetheless born into a ghost state as a result of their gamma, but their virtuous characters never change, so they exercise great authority. One such individual is even capable of governing a large community. These ghost communities do not segregate into groups or castes as humans do. Instead, they adhere strictly to the authority of tamma principles. The effects of their gamma make it impossible for them to hold the kind of prejudice that people do. The nature of their existence is governed by the nature of their gamma. This is a fixed principle. The way we use authority in this world cannot, therefore, be applied in the world hereafter. Atsariyaman explained this matter in great detail, but I am sorry to say I can remember only a little of it. Atsariyaman's visits to the ghosts were done psychically through samadhi meditation. As soon as they saw him, they hurried to tell everyone to come and pay their respects to him, just as we humans would do. The chief ghost, who was very respectful of Acharyaman and had great faith in him, guided him on a tour past the many places where the ghosts lived, including the jail where the male and female hooligans were kept. The chief ghost explained to Acharyaman the living conditions of the different types of ghosts, pointing out that the imprisoned ghosts were mean-hearted types who had unduly disturbed the peace of the others. They were sentenced and jailed according to the severity of their offense. The word ghost is a designation given to them by humans, but actually they are just one type of living being, among others in the universe, who exist according to their own natural conditions. Acharyaman invariably liked to remain in and around mountains and forests for long periods of time. After having been in Nakhon Banom for quite a while instructing the monks, he began to necessarily consider his own position. He often reflected on the nature of his own practice. He knew that he still lacked sufficient strength of purpose to finish the ultimate task before him. It became clear that as long as he continued to resist this call and remain teaching his disciples, his own personal striving would be delayed. He said that ever since he had returned from the central plains in order to instruct monks in the northeast, he felt that his chitta had not advanced as fast as when he was living alone. He felt that he had to accelerate his efforts once more before he could achieve the final goal and be free of all concerns about himself. At that time, Acharyaman's mother had been living with him for six years as Nupasika. His concern for her made it inconvenient for him to go anywhere. So, having secured her agreement, he decided to escort her to Ubon Rachatani. He then left Nakhon Banom with his mother and a large following of monks and novices, cutting straight across the Nong Sung Mountains, through Kamchai, and coming out at the district of Lang Nokta in the province of Ubon Rachatani. That year he spent the rains retreat at Ban Nong Khon in the Amnat Charoen district of Ubon Rachatani province. Many monks and novices stayed there with him, and he trained them vigorously. While he was there, the number of monks and lay devotees, who gained faith and came to train under him, steadily increased. Late one evening, Acharyaman sat in meditation, and as soon as his chitta dropped into calm, a vision appeared of many monks and novices walking respectfully behind him in a nice, orderly fashion which inspired devotion. 
Yet there were other monks who hurried past, walking ahead of him without respect or self-control. Others looked for an opportunity to pass him in a completely undisciplined manner. And finally, there were some who held pieces of split bamboo, using them to pinch his chest so that he could hardly breathe. When he saw these different monks display such disrespect, even cruelly tormenting him, he focused his chitta carefully to look into events of the future. Immediately he understood that those who walked respectfully behind him in a nice orderly fashion which inspired devotion were the monks who would conduct themselves properly, faithfully putting his teaching into practice. These were the monks who would revere him and uphold the sasana, assuring that it would flourish in the future. They would be able to make themselves useful to the sasana and to people everywhere by maintaining the continuity of traditional Buddhist customs and practices into the future. Honored and respected by people on earth and beings throughout the celestial realms, they would uphold the integrity of the sasana following the tradition of the noble ones, so that it did not decline and disappear. Walking past him carelessly, without respect, were the pretentious ones who thought they already knew it all. They considered their own meditation to be even superior to that of their teacher, disregarding the fact that he had previously guided them all in its proper practice. They were not the least bit interested in showing gratitude for his tutelage in matters of tamma, because they already considered themselves to be clever experts in everything. And thus they behaved accordingly, which was ruinous not only to themselves, but also to the entire sasana, including all the people who might come to them for guidance. Their minds poisoned by the errors of such monks, these people would in turn harm themselves and others, including future generations, without discovering whether they were on the right path or not. The next group consisted of those who waited for the chance to pass him, signaling the start of a bad attitude that would develop and have repercussions for the future sasana. Much like the previous group, they held a variety of erroneous views, causing harm to themselves and the religion as a whole. Together, they were a menace to the sasana, the spiritual focus of all Buddhists. Because they failed to rightly consider the consequences of their actions, the sasana was in danger of being utterly destroyed. The monks who pinched Acharya Mun's chest with pieces of split bamboo considered themselves to be astutely well-informed and acted accordingly. Despite their wrongful actions, they did not take right and wrong into consideration in thinking about their behavior. On top of that, they were bound to cause Buddhist circles and their teacher a great deal of discomfort. Acharya Mun said that he knew exactly who were among this last group of monks, and that they would cause him trouble before long. He was saddened that they would do such a thing, since they were his former disciples who had his consent and blessing to spend the rains retreat nearby. Rather than treating him with all the respect he deserved, they planned to return and bother him. A few days later, the provincial governor and a group of government officials came to visit his monastery. The delegation was accompanied by the very same disciples who had led the assault on him in his vision. Without revealing his vision to them, he carefully observed their actions. Together they requested his support in soliciting money from the local people in order to build several schools in the area. They explained that this would help the government. They had all agreed to approach Acharya Man for assistance since he was highly revered by the people. They felt that the project would surely be a success if he were involved. As soon as he knew the reason for their visit, Acharya Man immediately understood that these two monks were the principal instigators of this troublesome business. It was represented in his vision of the assault. Later, he asked both monks to come to him and instructed them in appropriate behavior for a practicing Buddhist monk, someone whose way of life is rooted in self-restraint and tranquility. This story is recounted here to help the reader understand the mysterious nature of the citta, how it is quite capable of knowing things both apparent and hidden, including knowledge of things past and future, as well as of the present. Acharya Man exemplified this ability on numerous occasions. He conducted himself with total detachment. His thoughts never concealed any ulterior worldly motives. Whatever he said stemmed from his knowledge and insights, and was purposefully spoken to make people think. His intention was never to fool credulous people or to cause harm. What is recorded here was told to his close inner circle of disciples, not just anyone. Thus the writer might be showing bad judgment in exposing Acharya Man's affairs. But I think this account offers those who are interested something useful to dwell upon. Among present-day Kammertana monks, Acharya Man's experiences stand out for being uniquely broad in scope and truly amazing, both in the sphere of his meditation practice and the insights derived from his psychic knowledge. Sometimes, when the circumstances were appropriate, he spoke directly and specifically about his intuitive knowledge. Yet at other times, he referred only indirectly to what he knew and used it for general teaching purposes. 
Following his experience with the elderly monk, whose thoughts he read during his stay at Sarika Cave, he was extremely cautious about disclosing his insights to others, despite his earnest desire to help his students see the errors in their thinking. When he pointed out candidly that this monk was thinking in the wrong way, or that that monk was thinking in the right way, his listeners were adversely affected by his frankness. They invariably misunderstood his charitable intent instead of benefiting from it, as was his purpose. Taking offense at his words could easily lead to harmful consequences. Thus, most of the time Acharyaman admonished monks indirectly, for he was concerned that the culprits would feel embarrassed and frightened in front of their fellows. Without identifying anyone by name, he merely gave a warning in order to foster self-awareness. Even so, the culprit sometimes became terribly distressed, finding himself rebuked amidst the assembled monks. Acharyaman was very well aware of this, as he was of the most expedient method to use in any given circumstance. Some readers may feel uncomfortable with some of the things that are written here. I apologize for this, but I have accurately recorded everything that Acharyaman related himself. Many senior disciples who lived under his tutelage have confirmed and elaborated on these accounts, leaving us with a vast array of stories. Generally speaking, external sense objects pose the greatest danger to practicing monks. They enjoy thinking about sights, sounds, smells, tastes, bodily contact, and mental images concerning the opposite sex. Though this is unintended, the tendency to do it is deeply ingrained in their personalities. Inevitably, these were the primary subjects of Acharya Man's admonitions, whether given directly or indirectly. Monks had other kinds of thoughts, of course, but unless they were particularly serious, he wouldn't take much notice. The evening meeting was the most important time by far. Acharya Man wanted the members of his audience to be both physically and mentally calm. He didn't want anything to disturb them or himself while he was speaking, ensuring that his disciples received maximum benefit from listening. If someone allowed wild, unwholesome thoughts to arise at that time, he was usually struck by a bolt of lightning, right in the middle of the meeting. This made the monk, who dared to think so recklessly, tremble and almost faint on the spot. Although no name was mentioned, Atsariyaman's disclosure of the content of the offensive thoughts was enough to send a shock through the guilty one. Other monks were also alarmed, fearing that in a moment of carelessness they themselves might fall prey to similar thoughts. When lightning struck continuously during the course of a tamatok, his audience succumbed to the pressure and sat very attentively on guard. Some monks actually entered into a meditative state of complete tranquility at that time. Those who did not attain such a state were still able to stay calm and cautious from fear that lightning might strike again if their thoughts strayed, or perhaps the hawk they feared was swooping down to snatch their heads. For this reason, those monks residing with Acharyaman gradually developed a solid foundation for centering their hearts. The longer they remained with him, the more their inner and outer demeanors harmonized with his. Those who committed to stay with him for a long time submitted willingly to his vigorous teaching methods. With patience, they came to understand all the skillful means he used, whether in the daily routine or during a discourse on Tamma. They observed him tirelessly, trying to thoroughly follow his example as best they could. Their tendency to desire Tamma and be serious about all aspects of daily practice increased their inner fortitude little by little each day, until they eventually stood on their own. Those monks who never achieved positive results from living with him usually paid more attention to external matters than to internal ones. For instance, they were afraid that Atsariyaman would berate them whenever their thoughts foolishly strayed. When he did rebuke them for this, they became too scared to think of solving the problem themselves, as would befit monks who were training under Acharyaman. It made no sense at all to go to an excellent teacher only to continue following the same old tendencies. They went there, lived there, and remained unchanged. They listened with the same prefixed attitudes, and indulged in the same old patterns of thought. Everything was done in an habitual manner, laden with gilesas, so that there was no room for Atariyaman's way to penetrate. When they left him, they went as they had come. They remained unchanged. You can be sure that there was little change in their personal virtue to warrant mentioning, and that the vices that engulfed them continued to accumulate unabated. Since they never tired of this, they simply remained as so many unfortunate people without effective means to oppose this tendency and reverse their course. No matter how long they lived with Atariyaman, they were no different than a ladle in a pot of delicious stew. Never knowing the taste of the stew, the ladle merely moves repeatedly out of one pot and into another. Similarly, the kilesas that amass immeasurable evil pick us up and throw us into this pot of pain, that pot of suffering. No doubt, I myself am one of those who gets picked up and thrown into one pot and then into another. 
I like to be diligent and apply myself, but something keeps whispering at me to be lazy. I like to follow Acharyaman's example, and I like to listen and think in the way of Tamma as he is taught. But again, that something whispers at me to go and live and think in my old habitual way. It doesn't want me to change in any way whatsoever. In the end, we trust the Kilesas until we fall fast asleep and submit to doing everything in the old habitual way. Thus, we remain just our old habitual selves, without changes or improvements to inspire self-esteem or admiration from others. Habitual tendencies are an extremely important issue for every one of us. Their roots are buried deep inside. If we don't really apply ourselves conscientiously, observing and questioning everything, then these roots are terribly difficult to pull out. Acharyaman departed from Bannon Khan with his mother at the beginning of the dry season. They stayed one or two nights at each village until they arrived at his home village, where Acharyaman resided for a time. He instructed his mother and the villagers until they all felt reassured. Then he took leave of his family to go wandering in the direction of the central plains region. He travelled leisurely, in the style of a Jutanga monk. He was in no particular hurry. If he came upon a village or a place with an adequate supply of water, he hung up his umbrella tent and peacefully practised, continuing his journey only when he regained strength of body and mind. Back then, everyone travelled by foot, since there were no cars. Still, he said that he wasn't pressed for time, that his main purpose was the practice of meditation. Wandering all day on foot was the same as walking meditation for the same duration of time. Leaving his disciples behind to walk alone to Bangkok was like a lead elephant withdrawing from its herd to search alone for food in the forest. He experienced a sense of physical and mental relief, as though he had removed a vexatious thorn from his chest that had severely oppressed him for a long time. Light in body and light in heart, he walked through broad, sectioned paddy fields, absorbed in meditation. There was very little shade, but he paid no attention to the sun's searing heat. The environment truly seemed to make the long journey easier for him. On his shoulders he carried his bowl and umbrella tent, the personal requisites of a Tutanga monk. Although they appeared cumbersome, he didn't feel them to be burdensome in any way. In truth, he felt as though he were floating on air, having relieved himself of all concern about the monks he left behind. His sense of detachment was complete. His mother was no longer a concern for him, for he had taught her to the best of his ability until she developed a reliable inner stability. From then on, he was responsible for himself alone. He walked on as he pondered over these thoughts, reminding himself not to be heedless. He walked meditation in this manner along paths free of human traffic. By midday the sun was extremely hot, so he would look for a pleasant, shady tree at the edge of a forest to rest for a while. He would sit there peacefully, doing his meditation practice under the shade of a tree. When late afternoon came and the heat had relented somewhat, he moved on with the composure of one who realized the dangers inherent within all conditioned things, thus cultivating a clear, comprehending mind. All he needed were small villages, with just enough houses to support his daily alms round, and, at intervals along his journey, suitable places for him to conveniently stay to practice that were far enough from the villages. He resided in one of the more suitable places for quite some time before moving along. Acharyaman said that, upon reaching Dong Payayen Forest between the Saraburi and the Khon Rajasima provinces, he discovered many forested mountain ranges that brought special joy to his heart. He felt inclined to extend his stay in the area in order to strengthen his heart, for it had long been thirsting to live again in the solitude of the mountains and forests. Upon coming across a suitable location, he would decide to remain a while and practice meditation until the time came to move on again. Steadily he wandered through the area in this way. He would tell of the region's forests and mountains abounding in many different kinds of animals, and of his delight in watching the barking deer, wild pigs, sambur deer, flying lemurs, gibbons, tigers, elephants, monkeys, languars, civets, jungle fowl, pheasants, bear, porcupine, tree shrews, ground squirrels, and the many other small species of animals. The animals showed little fear of him when he crossed paths with them during the day when they were out searching for food. Those days the forested terrain didn't really contain any villages. What few there were consisted of isolated settlements of three or four houses bunched together for livelihood. The inhabitants hunted the many wild animals and planted rice and other crops along the edge of the mountains where Atariaman passed. Villagers there had great faith in Tutanga monks, and so he could depend on them for alms food. When he stayed among them, his practice went very smoothly. They never bothered him or wasted his time. They kept to themselves and worked on their own, so his journey progressed trouble-free, both physically and mentally, until he arrived safely in Bangkok. 
Chapter 3 A Heart Released Venerable Aatsariyaman said that he often traveled back and forth from the northeast to Bangkok, sometimes taking the train to the end of the line, which extended only part of the distance in those days. All other times he walked to Tunga. Upon arriving in Bangkok on this trip, he went to Wat Patumwan Monastery and stayed there through the rains retreat. During the rains, he frequently studied Tamma texts with the Venerable Chao Kun Upale Gurnu Pamatsariya at his monastery, Wat Baramaniwat. Chao Kun Upale invited Atsariya Man to accompany him to Chiang Mai after the rains. So, during the dry season, they went to Chiang Mai by train. On the train, Atsariya Man remained in Samati almost the whole time. Between Bangkok and Lopburi, he laid down to rest. But after the train departed Lopuri and reached the foothills of Uttaradit, he entered Samadhi and remained there for the duration of the trip to Chiang Mai. At the start of his meditation, he made a decision to withdraw from it only upon arrival in Chiang Mai, and then focused exclusively on his meditation. After approximately twenty minutes, his citta completely converged into the very base of Samadhi. From that moment on, he was no longer aware of whether the train was moving or not. Absolute stillness was all that his heart knew. All awareness of external phenomena, including his body, completely ceased. Any perception that might have disturbed it vanished from the chitta, as though the world no longer existed, having disappeared along with all thoughts and inner sensations. The noise of the train, the other passengers, and all the things that were associated with the chitta earlier were extinguished from his awareness. All that remained was his state of samadhi. The external environment faded out of consciousness from the moment his chitta first converged until he arrived in Chiang Mai, where his previous determination restored him to his normal state of consciousness. When he opened his eyes to look around, he saw the surrounding buildings and houses of the city. As he began collecting his things in preparation for leaving the train, he noticed that the passengers and railway officials around him were staring at him in astonishment. When it was time to disembark, the railway officials approached him and, smiling cheerfully, helped him with his things, while everyone else in the passenger carriage stared curiously at him. Even before he had stepped off the train, he was asked what monastery he was from and where he was going. He replied that he was a forest-dwelling monk without a fixed residence, and that he intended to go wandering alone in the remote mountains of the north. Inspired by faith in him, some of them asked where he would stay, and whether anyone had agreed to take him there. He thanked them, replying that there was someone to receive him since his traveling companion was Chao Kun Upali, a very senior monk and one who was highly respected by all in Chiang Mai, from the governor to the merchants and the general public. So it happened that a crowd of monks, novices, and lay supporters awaited to receive Chao Kun Upali. There were even automobiles in waiting, which were quite rare in those days. Official government cars as well as private ones were there to escort them to Wat Che Di Luang Monastery. Once people learned that Chao Kun Upali had returned to reside at Wat Che Di Luang, they came to pay their respects and hear him expound the Dhamma. Chao Kun Upali took advantage of the many people present to invite Aatsariya Man to give a discourse on Dhamma. Speaking eloquently, Aatsariya Man enthralled the large audience so much that they wished it would not end. Starting from the basics, he gradually climbed step by step to the higher levels of Dhamma, where he ended his discourse to the sincere regret of all who were absorbed in his presentation. He then paid his respects to Chao Kun Upali before he left center stage to find a place to relax by himself. Meanwhile, Chao Kun Upali praised his talk before the whole assembly. Atsariyaman expounds Tamma so eloquently that it is difficult to find anyone to equal him. He clarifies Muttodaya, the heart released, the land of absolute freedom, in a way that leaves no room for doubt. Everything is so precisely illustrated that I myself couldn't possibly match his unique, engrossing style. The rhetorical fluency of this Tutanga monk is most extraordinary. Listening to him is a pleasurable, learning experience. His discourses never become stale or boring. He speaks of common, everyday things things we see and hear all the time but never pay attention to utilize. We recall their significance only after he mentions them. 
Atsari Aman is an important Gammatana monk who uses mindfulness and wisdom to faithfully follow the path taught by the Buddha. He never tramples upon it in an unseemly, worldly manner. His talks employ a full range of expression, sometimes casual, sometimes serious, sometimes emphatic, stressing specific points. He elaborates the profound complexities of Tamma in a way the rest of us are hard-pressed to do so candidly. He is quite capable of analyzing the disparate aspects of Tamma and articulates them in a way that deeply affects our hearts. His commentary is so brilliant that it's hard to keep up with him. I myself have needed to ask him questions about problems I couldn't solve on my own, and he quickly and adeptly solved those problems with his wisdom. I have benefited in innumerable ways from his counsel. Since I was coming to Chiang Mai, I wanted Atsari Aman to accompany me, and he readily agreed. Although he did not specifically mention this to me, he probably agreed to come here because he knows Chiang Mai abounds in mountains and forests suitable for the spiritual life. Monks like Atsari Aman are extremely hard to find. Even though I am his senior, I wholly revere the Tamma within him, and yet he is still so humble and gracious towards me that I sometimes feel embarrassed. He is intended to stay here for only a short while before going off in search of seclusion. I must allow my friend to follow his inclinations, as I dare not contradict them, for it is rare indeed to find such a monk. With his intentions being solely focused on Tamma, we should wish him the best as he strives to improve himself. He can then be of greater benefit to us all in the near future. Those of you who have problems with your meditation practice, please go to him and seek his advice. You certainly won't be disappointed, but please don't ask him for powerful amulets, magic spells, or lucky charms to ward off danger, for they are all outside the way of practice. You will just make yourself a nuisance to him for no good reason. You may well receive a reprimand. Don't say I never warned you. al Tsariyaman is not that kind of monk. He is a genuine monk, sincerely teaching people to know the difference between right and wrong, good and bad, virtue and evil. His teaching never deviates from the path of Tamma. His way of practice and knowledge of Tamma are true to the teachings of the Lord Buddha. No one else nowadays can convey such incredible ideas as he has presented me from our discussions on Tamma. That has been my experience. I hold an immense respect for him in my heart, but I have never told him this. Nevertheless, he may already know of it from his powers of intuition. Atsariyaman is a monk truly worthy of the highest respect and is unquestionably an incomparable field of merit for the world. He himself never makes claims of noble attainments, though they are apparent to me when we discuss Tamma in private. I am wholly convinced that he is firmly established in the third level of the noble Tamma. It is obvious from the way he expresses himself. Although he has never made statements of his specific level of attainment, I know for certain what it is, for the knowledge of Tamma he has conveyed to me is absolutely consistent with that level as described in the Buddhist texts. He has shown me nothing but loyalty and respect, and I have never known him to be in any way stubborn or disdainful. He conducts himself with such humility that I cannot help but admire him from the bottom of my heart. These were the words of praise that Chao Kun Upali addressed to the lay followers, monks, and novices after Atsariyaman gave his Tamma talk and returned to his hut. Afterwards, monks who were present reported this speech to Atsariyaman, who later recounted the story to his disciples when a good opportunity arose. The term Muttodaya means a heart released. Its mention in the short biographical sketch distributed at Atsariyaman's cremation stems from that occasion in Chiang Mai when Chao Kun Upali praised his noble virtues. The name stuck and was then passed down to future generations by word of mouth. According to Chao Kun Tammachedi of Wat Bodhisompon Monastery in Udon Thani, Atsariyaman remained practicing in Chiang Mai from 1929 to 1940 when he left for the province of Udon Thani. More will be written later concerning his stay in Udon Thani. Having lived at Wat Chedi Luang Monastery for some time, Atsariyaman paid his respects to Chao Kun Upale and took leave to wander in search of solitude in the remote wilderness areas of the north. Chao Kun Upale readily gave his permission, and so Atsariyaman departed alone from Chiang Mai, beginning another journey. He had eagerly awaited the ideal seclusion he needed for a long time, and the perfect opportunity finally arose. Having been long involved in teaching others, 
It was the first time in many years that he had time alone. Initially, he wandered through the Meirim district in Changdao, staying in the forested mountains there throughout the dry and rainy seasons. His efforts had reached the crucial final stage. He exhorted himself to strive earnestly to reach the final goal, whatever happened, live or die. Nothing whatsoever would be allowed to interfere. Out of compassion, he had taught his fellow monks to the best of his ability. Of this, he had no doubt. The results of his guidance had already begun to show in some of his disciples. Now it was time to have compassion for himself, to educate and lift himself above and beyond those obscuring inner factors which still needed to be overcome. The life of someone with social obligations and responsibilities is a life of distraction and of almost unbearable stress, never allowing adequate time for being alone. One must admit that this kind of life is a perpetual struggle to be endured. Even though a person may have enough mindfulness and wisdom to avoid this burden somewhat and alleviate the stress so that it doesn't overwhelm him, the opportunities to practice meditation are limited. The results are likely to be minimal and not worth all the disappointments and difficulties. This solitary excursion into the untamed wilderness was an ideal opportunity for him to disengage and live alone, aloof from all entanglements. Wild, remote forests are just the right kinds of places to live and practice for someone aiming to sever all residual attachments, both internal and external, from his heart. He can discard all the remaining concerns that might form the seeds of future existence, the source of all forms of dukkha that brings menace in its wake and causes endless suffering. Remote forests are the right environment in which a persistent and diligent person can zero in on the fundamental causes of existence, the great internal masters of deception leading us astray, and excise them quickly from his heart. While one is still far from reaching the shores of Nibbana, little benefit can be gained from involvement in other people's affairs, for that is comparable to overloading a barge that is ready to sink even before it starts going. When the coveted goal of the holy life seemed within reach, Atsariya Mun's compassionate concern for others dropped away, replaced by motivations of a more personal nature. He was no longer considering the suffering of others. His resolve was focused firmly on the realm of purity, and he was concerned, lest he not reach it this time. Thus he reflected, Now I must worry about myself, pity myself, so that as a diligent disciple of the Tathagata, I can live up to his exalted virtue of unwavering perseverance. Am I fully aware that I have come here striving to cross beyond the world of samsara and attain the goal of Nibbana, the freedom from all anxiety and dukkha? If so, what methods should be used by someone attempting to cross beyond the conventional world? The Lord Buddha first led the way and then taught us the Tamma. What kind of guidance did he give? Did he teach us to forget our purpose? and start worrying about this and that as soon as we have gained a modest understanding of Tamma? In the beginning, the Lord Buddha publicly proclaimed the sasana with the help of a small number of arahants, getting his message rapidly spread far and wide. Most properly so. But I am not in the same exalted position, so I must view my own development as paramount right now. When I have perfected myself, then benefits to others will inevitably follow. This view befits one who is circumspect and reluctant to waste time. I must reflect on this carefully so I can learn a lesson from it. Right now, I am striving for victory in a battle between the Kilesas and Magga, the way of Tamma, in order to win freedom for the Chitta. Until now, its loyalties have been divided between these two rivals, but I aim to make Tamma its undisputed master. If my persistence slackens and my powers of discernment are inadequate, the chitta will slip from my grasp and fall under the ignoble influence of the gilesas, and they will ensure that the chitta keeps turning in a never-ending cycle of birth and despair. 
But if I can keep up my persistence and keep my wisdom sharp, the chitta will come under my control and be my own priceless treasure for the taking. The time has come for me to put my life on the line and engage the kilesas in a fierce all-out assault, showing no hesitation or weakness. If I lose, then let me die while battling it out. I will not allow myself to retreat in disarray so that the kilesas can ridicule me. That will be a lasting disgrace. If I am victorious, I shall remain perfectly free for all eternity. So now... There is only one path for me to take. I must fight to the death with all my might for the sake of this victory. There is no other choice. This is the kind of exhortation that Atari Aman used to embolden himself for the impending realization of the goal he had set for himself. It reflected his uncompromising decision to accept the obligation of striving for Nibbana steadfastly, both day and night, whether standing, walking, sitting, or lying down. Except when he rested to sleep, his time was wholly devoted to diligent effort. His mindfulness and wisdom circled around all external sensations and all internal thought processes, meticulously investigating everything without leaving any aspect unexplored. At this level of practice, mindfulness and wisdom act in unison like a wheel of tamma, turning continuously in motion, irrespective of the body's action. Later... When Atsari Aman described his tremendous efforts during that time, his audience was so awestruck by his tamma exploits that they sat motionless with bated breath. It was as though Atsari Aman had opened the door to Nibbana, allowing them a glimpse inside, without their having ever experienced Nibbana before. In truth, Atsari Aman was then in the process of accelerating his efforts toward the realization of Nibbana. Although only a stage in the course of his development, it nevertheless moved those who had never before heard of such a thing, and they were always carried away by the awesome power of his achievement. Atsari Aman said that his chitta had long attained the third area level of Anagami, but, because of his continual obligations to his followers, he had no time to speed up his efforts as he wished. Only when he had the opportunity to go to Chiang Mai was he able to maximize his practice and accomplish his objective. Chiang Mai's environment was conducive, and his chitta was well prepared. Physically, he was in excellent shape, fit to exert himself in every activity. His fervent hope was like the radiant sun, streaming forth continuously to reach the shore free of dukkha in the shortest possible time. He compared his inner struggle between Tamma and the Kilesas to a hunting dog, which, at full run, corners its prey, and it is only a matter of time before the prey is torn to shreds in the jaws of the chasing hound. There could be no other ending, for the chitta was armed with mahasati and mahapanya, supreme mindfulness and supreme wisdom. They never lapse for a single moment, even when one has no intent to be vigilant. At this level, mindfulness and wisdom are fully present, reacting automatically to all matters arising within oneself. As soon as their cause is known and their true nature is clearly understood, one simply lets go of them. It is not necessary then to be in command, giving orders, as is the case in the initial stages of practice. When equipped with habitual mindfulness and wisdom, there is no need for specific directions and calculated decisions to practice this or investigate that, while having to simultaneously guard against lapses in attention. Reason and result are integrated into the nature of automatic mindfulness and automatic wisdom. So it is unnecessary to search on one's own for reasons and skillful methods to encourage their operation. With the exception of sleep, all daily activities are the working arenas for this level of Mahasati and Mahapanya. Just like spring water that flows readily out of the ground all year round, they work ceaselessly. The thinking process is taken as the focal point of the investigation in order to find the true source of these thoughts. The four namakantas, Vedana, Sanya, Sankara, and Vinyana, are the appropriate background for this superior degree of mindfulness and wisdom. As for the rupakanta, the physical body, it ceased to be a problem when one achieved the intermediate level of wisdom. This form of wisdom performs the tasks necessary for realizing the anagami stage of the noble path. To attain this exalted level, one must focus on the physical body 
investigating it scrupulously in every detail until all misunderstandings and concerns about the body are forever banished. When one comes to the final stage, the path to arahantship, it is absolutely essential to investigate the Namakantas so that one gains a deep and clear understanding about how all phenomena arise, briefly exist, and then vanish. These three aspects of the investigation converge in the truth of anatta. This means examining all phenomena as being empty of a permanent self, empty of being a man or woman, empty of being me or them. No self entity.